It was designed to move Long Street by rail from Chattanooga to Sweetwater, Tennessee, within 40 miles of Knoxville. This, it was hoped, could be easily done by the 7th or 8th. The artillery and McClose's division were marched to Tyner's Station on November 4, and Hood's division to the tunnel through Missionary Ridge on the night of the 5th. Trains, however, could only be furnished to carry them to Sweetwater by the 12th, and it was the night of the 14th before a pontoon bridge could be thrown across the river at Huff's Ferry near London, and the advance upon Knoxville, 29 miles off, actively undertaken. The men and guns of my own battalion were carried on a train of flat cars on the 10th, the train taking over 12 hours to make the 60 miles. The cannoneers were required to pump water for the engine and to cut up fence rails for fuel along the route, and the horses were driven by the roads. The forces of Burnside at Knoxville consisted of four small divisions, two of the 9th Corps, and two of the 23d about 12,000 infantry and artillery and 8,500 cavalry. The cavalry, during the coming siege, for the most part held the south side of the river, where they erected strong works on the commanding hills and were little molested, as our own cavalry was generally kept on the north bank on our left flank. Burnside was ordered not to oppose Longstreet's advance, but to retreat before him and draw him on, as far as possible from Chattanooga. On Sunday, November 15, Longstreet crossed and advanced as far as Lenoyers, Burnside falling back, skirmishing. On the 16th, an effort was made to bring him to battle at Campbell's Station, but only a skirmish resulted, in which the Federal loss was 31 killed, 211 wounded, and 76 missing, and the Confederates 22 killed, 152 wounded. Burnside withdrew into Knoxville that night and Longstreet followed and drew up before it on November 17. On the 18th, the outposts were driven in and close reconnaissances made, in which the Federal Gen. Sanders was killed. He had been recently promoted, was an officer of much promise, and a relative of President Davis. The reconnaissances developed the enemy holding a very strong defensive line with but a single weak point. This was the northwest salient angle where their north and south line, running perpendicular to the river below the town, made a right angle and turning to the east ran parallel with the river to the northeast of the town. There it rested, behind an extensive inundation of First Creek, upon a strong enclosed work on Temperance Hill, mounting twelve guns, with outlying works upon Bries and Flint Hills. These had been built, with several other works, during the prior Confederate occupation, and one, enclosing three sides of a rectangle about 125 by 95 feet with bastion fronts, the rear being open, had been nearly completed at the northwest salient tangle above referred to. This was now called Fort Sanders, after the general killed on the 18th, and every exertion was used to complete and strengthen it, all able bodied inhabitants of the town being impressed both white and black, to aid in labor upon the fortifications. The Confederate engineer who laid out this work had injudiciously turned the salient angle of its northwest bastion directly toward the valley of Third Creek, just at the point where this valley allowed an approach, within 120 yards, completely covered from the fire of the fort. A convex crest of the valley curved from this point to the east and south, and sheltered a large territory, affording space for many brigades to be held completely under cover, within distances of from 150 to 400 yards of the enemy's entrenchments. These conditions made it the most favorable point for attack, and, indeed, the only one at all favorable north of the river. A third of the enemy's northern front was protected by inundations of first and second creeks, across which his guns had open sweep for a mile. To make a large circuit, and turn it, would be to abandon our communications with our base of supplies. An attack upon either of his short flanks running back to the river would be enfiladed from the south bank. Two strong enclosed works, Fort Comstock and Battery Wiltsey, covered the only approach between the inundations. The theory of Longstreet's expedition was that he should take a much superior force and make short work of it. In fact, 
we had an inferior force of infantry and artillery, until after the arrival of Johnson's and Grade's brigades, which will be referred to presently. The cavalry on neither side took any part in the siege operations. We had now to take the offensive which made the task harder, but yet we seem to have stood a fair chance to carry Fort Sanders had we made an attack with all our force soon after our arrival. But every day of delay added to the strength of the enemy's breastworks, and in a very few days he had an interior line which might have successfully resisted, even had Fort Sanders been captured. It is now to tell how the ten days were consumed which were allowed to intervene before the attack. By that time a second line had been constructed which might or might not have survived the loss of the first. Dot the 20th saw our own line finished with batteries erected to repel any offensive movements of the enemy, and, incidentally, enfilade some of the lines of Fort Sanders, which was already recognized as the most feasible point of attack. Had the advantage of an early attack been fully realized, it might have been organized and delivered on the 21st or at latest by the 22d. But on that day one of our staff officers, who had crossed the Holston River on our right flank and reconnoitred the country, had found it possible to locate a battery upon a high hill close to the river, giving an advantageous line of fire upon Fort Sanders at a distance of 2,400 yards. Longstreet directed this to be done, and the attack postponed for it. A flatboat and some wire were procured, a ferry fixed up. Laws and Robertson's brigades of infantry and Parker's rifle battery was crossed, and, by working all night of the 24th, it was possible by noon of the 25th to report as ready to open an enfilade fire on Fort Sanders. But the loss of this time and the transfer of this infantry and artillery to the south side of the river were both ill-advised. Our rifle ammunition was defective in quality, our supply of it was quite limited and the range was too great for effective work under such conditions. Longstreet felt to the need of the two brigades sent across the river, and, hearing of the coming of Bushra Johnson's and Gracie's brigades, he decided to await their arrival expected the night of the 26th. They brought an effective force of about 2,600 men, but they did not actually arrive until the night of the 28th and were not able to render any service. That night Longstreet was joined by Gen. Ledbetter, Bragg's chief engineer, who had been at Knoxville during the Confederate occupation, and being the oldest military engineer in the Confederate service, was supposed to be the most efficient. He was a graduate of West Point of 1836, the class ahead of Bragg's. Coming to Longstreet, as he did, with the prestige of being on the staff of the commanding general, and especially charged with the decision of all questions of military engineering, it is perhaps not strange that Longstreet was quick to adopt his suggestions, and these, it will be seen, robbed him of most of his few remaining chances of victory. On Thursday, the 26th, the attack having already been postponed to await the arrival of Johnson's brigades, Ledbetter and Longstreet rode on a reconnaissance around the enemy's entire position. Ledbetter pronounced Fort Sanders to be assailable, but expressed a preference for an attack upon Breeze Hill. This was the enemy's extreme right flank, and was undoubtedly the strongest portion of his whole line, besides being the farthest removed and the most inaccessible. In fact our own pickets had been advanced but little beyond Second Creek, and Ledbetter's opinion was based upon very imperfect and distant views. It was therefore determined to drive in the enemy's pickets and make a bet reconnaissance on Friday, the 27th. Meanwhile, so certain was led better of the advantage of a change in the point of attack, that Parker's battery was ordered to be withdrawn from the south side of the Holston on Thursday night. On Friday the cavalry was called on to drive in the enemy's pickets, and Longstreet and led better, accompanied by the leading generals, made a thorough reconnaissance of our left flank. The attack upon Breeze Hill was unanimously pronounced impossible, Ledbetter himself concurring. On the way back the party stopped opposite Fort Sanders, and while watching it with glasses, saw a man cross the ditch in front of the northwest salient, showing the depth of it at that point is less than five feet. This encouraged a hope that the ditch of the fort would not be found a formidable obstacle, and as there was now no alternative, and Ledbetter was urgent against further delay, 
the attack was ordered at noon on the 28th, this time being necessary to return Parker's battery to its enfilading position on the south side, whence Ledbetter had had it withdrawn the night before. At noon the next day all was ready, but the day was rainy, and very unfavorable for artillery practice, so Longstreet again decided to postpone the attack until the next morning, the 29th. Some howitzers had been raised upon skids, so as to permit fire with small charges at high elevations, as mortars, in order to pro behind the parapets of the fort. It had been ordered that the opening of these mortars should be the signal for the advance of a large number of skirmishers, who should occupy the enemy's rifle pits within 120 to 250 yards of the fort, enveloping completely its north and west fronts and keeping down the fire, either from its embrasures or parapets. After some practice by the mortars and the sharpshooters, the mortars would suspend, and allow the rifled guns and others to fire to get their ranges. When all had gotten ranges, a rapid fire by both guns and mortars, 34 in all, would begin, concentrated upon the fort as long as seemed necessary. Its cessation would be the signal for the advance of the storming force of two brigades, in columns of regiments, supported by adjacent brigades upon the flanks. If the passage of the ditch was found difficult, the pioneers with spade and picks were expected to rapidly cut small steps in the slopes which would enable the men to swarm over. The sharpshooters and the storming column itself could be relied upon to keep down the fire of the fort on the men in the ditches while this was being done. The garrison of the fort, as afterward shown, did not exceed 220, including the artillery, and could be overpowered as quickly as they could be reached. It is now to show how all preparations were thrown away and all advantages sacrificed for the elusive merits of a night attack, decided upon by Longstreet after dark on the 28th. Ledbetter was spending the night with him, but whether he suggested or acquiesced was never disclosed. Dot about 9 p.m. that night I received notice that the plan of attack would be changed and that neither the rifles across the river, the howitzers rigged as mortars nor any other of the 34 guns arranged to fire on the fort would be used, except to fire a signal. Several days had been spent in preparation for a cannonade, with all our guns concentrated on the small area enclosed by the fort, and now it was all to be given up as well as all to be hoped for from the fire by daylight of a half mile of sharpshooters within from 120 to 250 yards. The fort had no embrasure on its west front and its fire would have to be over the parapets and much exposed. The advance was intended to be a surprise, and the signal guns were ordered to be fired just before dawn, that the approach of the column might not be visible. There was little time for consultation for it was ordered that at moonrise, about 10 p.m., the enemy's picket line should be taken and occupied by our sharpshooters and the troops should be under arms. Soon after 10 p.m., there was a general advance by our picket lines on both sides of Fort Sanders, and after some two hours of sharp fighting, 50 or 60 prisoners had been taken, the enemy's pit occupied, and they did not have out a picket 20 yards from the fort. Lieutenant Benjamin, commanding, feeling sure that the attack would be at daylight, required every man to sleep at his post and one in every four to keep awake as a sentry. During the night an occasional gun was fired with canister or shell at random from the fort. Federal accounts state that our own artillery was also fired during the night, but this is a mistake. Our own troops were being moved and would have been endangered by such a fire dot at the earliest sign of light in eastern sky. Three successive guns fired from different batteries gave the signal to the sharpshooters to open fire and for the storming columns to advance. Their shells were visible like meteors in the air and they exploded high above the fort. For a few minutes about a dozen guns poured a hot fear on the fort and into the angle of the lines behind it. This was intended only to encourage the storming columns, and was discontinued in a few minutes. At once the sharpshooters opened their fire upon the parapet, and orders were given the storming columns to move. It had been intended that these should be formed close behind the sharpshooters, within 150 to 200 yards of the fort, but in the darkness this had not been done. 
the columns each had several hundred yards to go and Johnson's and Grade's brigades, ordered up in support, had from 800 to 1000. The storming column was composed of Wofford's Georgia Brigade, four regiments, under Col. Ruff on the left, and of two regiments of Humphreys's Miss, and three of Bryan's Georgia Brigade on the right. Anderson's Georgia Brigade was ordered to support the storming column on the left by an attack on the lines beyond the fort on that side. As the two columns advanced on converging lines, they presently ran into an entanglement of telegraph wires stretched between stumps which threw down the leading files and caused a little delay. But these were soon torn away and with very little loss. Two or three shots each were fired from a barbet gun in the salient and from an embrasure in the northeast bastion, but with the arrival of the men at the ditch the artillery fire was silenced. The two columns were soon found to have converged in the darkness too much, and being already deep columns, one of four lines and one of five, they simply coalesced in the darkness into a mass whose officers could no longer separate or distinguish their own men. To this mass was presently added Anderson's brigade, ordered to carry the breastworks east of the fort. Through some mistake, some minutes later, they came in from the left, in two lines, where already nine lines were crowding each other. The ditch was found to be from four to eight feet deep, and about twelve feet in width, without any berm at the top of the counter scarp, and with steep sides rendered slippery by freezing weather and the rain of the previous day. Yet many officers and men were able to cross the ditch and scale the parapet, but not in such numbers as to overcome the 150 infantry defending the fort with fine tenacity. A few shells were lighted by Lieutenant Benjamin and thrown by hand into the ditch's hand grenades, and axes and billets of wood were thrown over the parapets. Lieutenant Cumming, adjective of the 16th Georgia, made his way through an embrasure with a dozen men, but the party was captured inside. Col. Thomas of the same regiment was killed in the ditch as was also Col. McElroy of the 13th Miss. Lieutenant Col. Pfizer of the 17th lost his arm on the parapet and Col. Ruff, commanding Wofford's brigade, was killed on the county scarp. Meanwhile fully twenty minutes elapsed and daylight began to make things dimly visible. Nearly two hundred men had gotten into the ditch and not finding it easy to advance now preferred to surrender. The fire from the fort had ceased except an occasional musket fired over the parapet exposing only a hand of the man holding it. But at a point five hundred yards to the south of the fort, an offset two hundred yards long, running nearly west from the federal breastworks, gave a fair enfilade fire upon the crowd of men along the counter scarp of the west front of the fort and from this point the increasing daylight was bringing a fire which rapidly multiplied the casualties. Longstreet, about this time, was advancing with the brigades of Johnson and Gracie, with those of Jenkins and Benning upon the left, when he received an exaggerated report of the wire entanglement which had been first encountered. Without a second thought Longstreet ordered the recall. Johnson begged to be allowed to go on, as also did Jenkins, but Longstreet, giving full faith to the report, for bad dot it is certain that after a little delay the attack would have been renewed, being preceded by a cannonade, and with a storming column provided with tools to cut steps in the scarp and parapet. But within a half hour a staff officer of Ransom's arrived with a telegram from President Davis, by way of Bristol, the telling of Bragg's defeat on Missionary Ridge on the 25th, and ordering Longstreet to march to join Bragg at Dalton. Vague rumors of this had reached Longstreet the night before, but had not been credited, and had rather confirmed his intention to attack. Very soon after this, Burnside sent out a flag and offered us a truce to remove our dead and wounded, which Longstreet accepted, all thought of renewal of the attack being abandoned. The truce was later extended until dark, Longstreet at first proposing to retreat southward at night to join Bragg but during the day messages arrived from that direction, and we learned of the approach of a force under Sherman to relieve Burnside, and that our road to Dalton was closed. The roads through Upper Georgia were deemed impracticable for an army and destitute of supplies, so it was determined to retreat toward Southwest Va. 
But, in order to relieve the pressure upon Bragg as far as we could, Longstreet determined to maintain a threatening position before Knoxville until the approaching Federal reinforcements were within a day's march. This was done and on the night of December 4, in a severe rainstorm, the retreat began. During the night and next morning we made 18 miles and encamped at Blaine's Crossroads, where we met Ransom's artillery and infantry coming to help us in the attack upon Knoxville, but nearly three weeks late. Having retreated nearly to Rogersville, 65 miles, by the 9th, on the 14th we returned to Bean Station to attack a force under Park which had followed us from Knoxville. Sending two brigades of cavalry on the flanks to cut off the enemy's retreat, Longstreet advanced his whole force directly on Bean Station. The enemy's skirmishers were met about three miles in front with artillery, but were driven in by Gracie's brigade. Gracie was wounded in the skirmish. The Federal line was formed just in rear of the town, with a large hotel building on the edge of the town strongly held by sharpshooters, firing from loopholes in the second and third stories. Parker's battery was advanced within 350 yards of the hotel, which was soon charged by Gracie's brigade and taken possession of. Meanwhile Kershaw's brigade had turned the left flank of the enemy's line and four more batteries had been advanced to close ranges when it was found that the enemy was withdrawing in the dusk which was now rapidly obscuring the field. The day was a short one and cloudy, the infantry had marched 16 miles over bad roads, and Longstreet feared that in the darkness his troops might fire into each other. The enemy were mainly cavalry, under Shaq Elford, and pursuit at night by our infantry would be bootless. So the artillery held its fire and the infantry went into bivouac. The affair had been bloody for its duration and our side had the worst of it. It is needless to give further details of the retreat. The campaign had been one of much hardship. Some facts may be given showing how poorly we were provided, even with prime necessities, though we were in our own country. We were so deficient in horseshoes that on the advance to Knoxville we stripped the shoes and saved the nails from all dead horses, killing for the purpose all wounded and broken down animals both our own and those left behind by the enemy. During the siege, the river brought down a number of dead animals thrown in within the town. We watched for these, took them out, and stripped their feet of shoes and nails. Our men were nearly as badly off for footgear as our animals. I have seen bloody stains left on frozen ground where our infantry had passed. In the artillery we took the shoes from the feet of the drivers to give to the cannoneers who had to march. Our rations were also frequently not even the reduced rations now issued to the whole army. Corn, unground, was often the only ration. Longstreet's retreat was now continued without serious engagement to Morristown and later to Greenville, where he wintered, and rejoined Lee at Gordonsville. Va, in the spring. The following table gives the Confederate casualties of the campaign. Those of the unfortunate assault on Fort Sanders, badly begun, suspended by mistake, and never concluded, are shown separately below. Return of casualties, Longstreet's Corps, November 14 to December 4, 1863. Loss in the assault on Fort Sanders, November 29, killed, 129. Wounded, 458, missing, 226, total, 813, included in the above. Dot return of casualties, Longstreet's Corps, November 14 to December 4, 18,631. Livermore's numbers and losses in Civil War, p. 105.1 names in italics arrived too late for the battle. Dot one, it was about this time that Gen. W. F. Smith, known in the U.S. Army as Baldy Smith, was assigned to the Federal Army, as Chief Engineer. He devised and superintended the execution, not only of the skillful strategic moves by which the blockade of Chattanooga was broken, but those by which Grant on November 25th so easily, and with such little loss, routed Bragg at Chattanooga. Chapter X Battle of the Wilderness Review. Lee's Force. Situation. Longstreet's position. Longstreet's march. Ewell's advance. 
Yule's fight. Leonidas returned to his command with the review. It was the only one ever held, after the one in the Shenandoah Valley, in October, 1862. He was not given to parades merely for show. Now, doubtless, he felt and reciprocated the stirrings of affection in the hearts of his men, inseparable from our return from bloody Chickamauga, upon the eve of what all felt must be the struggle to a finish, and no one who was present can ever forget the occasion. It took place in a cleared valley with broad pastures, in which our two divisions of infantry, with my old battalion of artillery, could be deployed not far from Mechanicsburg, where we were encamped some six or eight miles south of Gordonsville. It is now over forty years, but in imagination I can see today the large square gate posts, without gate or fence, for troops had been everywhere in that vicinity, marking where a country road led out of a tall oak wood upon an open knoll in front of the center of our long double lines. And as the well-remembered figure of Leopold Traveller, at the head of his staff, rides between the posts and comes out upon the ground, the bugle sounds a signal, the guns thunder out a salute, Lee reins up Traveller and bears his good grey head and looks at us, and we give the rebel yell and shout and cry and wave our flags and look at him once more. Dot for a wave of sentiment, something like what came a year later at Appomattox when he rode back from his meeting with Grant seemed to sweep over the field. All felt the bond which held them together. There was no speaking, but the effect was as of a military sacrament. Dr. Boggs, U.S.C. chaplain riding with the staff, said to Cole. Venable, Lee's aide, does not it make the general proud to see how these men love him? Venable answered, not proud. It awes him. He rode along our lines close enough to look into our faces and then we marched in review and went back to our camps. Army of the Potomac, May 4, 1864 Army of Northern Virginia, May, 1864 Our narrative may pause for a bird's eye view of the situation. In all previous campaigns there had been intermission for refreshment between our battles in which the armies would replenish and recruit before initiating new strategy leading up to a new collision, usually under a new federal leader. Now from May 5, when battle was joined in the wilderness until April 9, 1865, when Lee surrendered at Appomattox, there was scarcely a day when the armies were not under each other's fire. Grant decided beforehand not to exchange prisoners. This added much to the suffering to be endured on both sides. It may be condoned as tending to shorten the war, but the way in which it was done savoured more of the sharp trick than of Grant's usual dignity and frankness of character. We had, perhaps unwisely, outlawed Butler, and Grant's trick consisted in making him commissioner for exchange of prisoners in hopes that we would decline to hold communication with him. When we swallowed our pride and offered exchanges, pretenses were found to still refuse. The campaign against us was practically to be one of extermination, and it was to be conducted by four separate armies and as much of the navy as could be used in the James River. First, granted four corps, the 2d, 5th, 6th, and 9th, and a large force of cavalry. His returns show 102,869 present for duty with 242 guns. Besides, there was a siege train being prepared of 106 guns and mortars, among which were six 100 PR. Rifles. This train came into service in May and June. The cavalry were all armed with Spencer carbines, the first magazine guns ever used by the army. They fully doubled the efficiency of the cavalry against towers with only muzzle loaders. Wilder's mounted infantry had had them at Chickamauga and their value on that occasion has been told. Brigades of them soon began to appear among the Federal infantry, as will appear hereafter. It was useless to capture these guns, as we could not supply the brass cartridges required. Second, In the Shenandoah Valley, Sigel was preparing a force of about 15,000 men with 40 guns, which was to move upon Staunton. Third, From W. Va Crook also was to move upon Staunton with about 9,000 men and 24 guns. 
When Crook and Sigel had united, they were to move upon Lynchburg and thence upon Richmond. Fourth, Butler, at Fortress Monroe, was organizing the Army of the James to move upon Richmond by its south bank. It would be escorted by four monitors, a fleet of gunboats, and a large collection of ferryboats and river craft of every description. These would facilitate all movements by water. His force comprised the 10th and 18th Corps and Coutts's cavalry, 30,000 men with 79 guns, of which about 5,000 were cavalry. Besides these four armies, there were, near Washington, about 40,000 troops which were used for reinforcements during the next two months, besides a constant stream of recruits from all over the North, stimulated by bounties now being paid of a thousand dollars per man, and, early in July, Grant also brought around from New Orleans the 19th Corps, about 12,000 men. There were no returns of Longstreet's Corps after his return from E. Tennessee, but he gives us a liberal estimate. 10,000 men. The return of the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia, on April 20, was as follows colon adding 10,000 for Longstreet, Lee's total force was about 64,000 and he had about 274 guns. Against the armies of Sigel and Crook, Breckenridge was able to muster in the valley and in the SW Va, about 9,000 men and 24 guns. To meet Butler, Bregard brought to Petersburg, from various points in the south, troops which he organized into four divisions, comprising about 22,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and about 50 guns. These included Pickett's division of Longstreet's corps, say 5,000 men, which rejoined Longstreet about June 1st, and Johnson's brigade of Early's division, which was returned to the division on May 6th. To recapitulate, the forces under Grant's command were about 150,000 men and those under Lee's were about 95,000. Grant had been urged by some of his advisers to transfer his army to the James, and to make his advance upon Richmond by that line, by which he could approach within 20 miles without the loss of man. But he wisely held that his objective was Lee's army, and that it could most easily be reached in a half day's march from his camps at Culpeper. A word about our position, where Longstreet's corps was to await Grant's opening the campaign. It was at Mechanicsburg, about six miles south of Gordonsville. Lee was fully aware that Grant's first move would be an attempt to turn his right flank, which would bring him through the wilderness, and had decided to attack him en route. Ewell's corps from its camps in winter quarters, could reach Grant's probable route by a march of 18 miles. Hill's corps was farther to the left and would have about 28 miles to go. Long streets, from Mechanicsburg, would have a somewhat later start and 30 miles in an airline, which proved to be 42 by the country roads, used to avoid interference with Hill's route. The first day would offer us the best chances, as Grant would have no breastworks, and could use little artillery in the wilderness. What proved a drawn battle, begun by three divisions, reinforced by two after six hours, and by three more after eighteen hours, might have had a different result if begun by five and reinforced by two after six hours, and only one left, Anderson's, to come in after eighteen hours. This might have been the history, if Longstreet's corps had been located a few miles north of Louisa C. H instead of at Mechanicsburg. Major Gen. Field had now been assigned to the command of Hood's division and Gershaw had been promoted to the command of McClellan's. I had been made chief of artillery of the corps, and the two battalions, Cabell's and Henry's, now Haskell's, which had been left in Va. When we went to Chickamauga, rejoined us. Colonel Frank Huger succeeded to the command of my old battalion. It was near midday on May 4th. When the news came that Grant was crossing the Rapid at Ely's and Germana Fords, with orders from Lee to march to Todd's Tavern on the Brock Road, the road by which Jackson on May 2, 1863, had turned Hooker's position. At 4 p.m., we were on the way, with orders to march all night, only stopping to feed and water. We kept it up until near sundown the next day, when the two divisions went into bivouac near Craig's Meeting House 
On the Carthipin Road, having travelled about 36 miles, we were ordered to cook, eat, and rest until 1 a.m., and then start for Todd's Tavern. Before starting, orders came from Lee to come across to the Plank Road at Parker's store, about six miles. There was a good moon, about eleven days old. At a fork in the road, our leading division took the wrong road and lost about its length in distance, while the other lost none. It resulted that at Parker's store, where we took the broad, straight Plank Road, the heads of the two sets of fours came together, and the two columns, eight abreast, filled the road. The story may now pause, to tell what had already taken place. Grant's effort was to pass our flank and get between us and Richmond. He had started after thorough preparation at midnight on the 3D, and in 18 hours had put most of his force with its artillery and fighting trains across the river, using five pontoon bridges. He had made about 12 miles, and might have made a few miles more but preferred to encamp on the night of the 4th in close order and wait for the 9th Corps, which, with the great bulk of the ordnance and subsistence trains, was still behind. This had been the most critical day, and, to Grant's relief, it closed without Lee's having made an appearance. The swiftness of a concentration is only that of its most distant part, and Ewell had been ordered to march slowly down the turnpike, and let Hill coming down the plank road, get abreast of him, and both were directed not to bring on a general engagement until Longstreet's arrival. So you'll encamp the night of the 4th at Locust Grove, five miles from Wilderness Tavern, the centre of Grant's line. Hill's advanced division, Heth, encamped at Mine Run, about 13 miles from his battlefield of the next day. On the 5th, Grant moved early intending to take a line from Locust Grove to Parker's store. But at 7 a.m., the 5th Corps met Ewell's corps within two miles of Wilderness Tavern. Ewell had his whole corps with him, about 17,000 men. Grant, guessing that the rest of our army was not up, thought to whip it in detail and concentrated upon it the whole of the 5th Corps, about 24,000 and over half of the 6th, say 12,000. It did, indeed, seen that Ewell had ventured rashly and had put his head in the lion's mouth, for the ground around Lacey's, where Grant made his headquarters, a half mile southwest from Wilderness Tavern, was open, affording opportunity for artillery and free communication for movement of troops, and Ewell had no entrenchments and was strung out upon the road. It is not surprising that as Grant's different divisions deployed, and attacked from different directions, in the early part of the fighting, some of the Confederate brigades were thrown into temporary confusion. But by eleven o'clock, Ewell was all up and had taken the line in the forest which he was able to maintain all day and until darkness ended the fighting. He had even captured 224 PR. Howitzers in a counter charge, and, during the night, he managed to entrench himself. Gens. J. M. Jones and Stafford had both been killed and Pegram severely wounded. Hill, on the 5th, had met the enemy's cavalry at Parker's store, and, driving them before him, had pushed down the plank road. Meanwhile, when Grant had discovered Ewell in his front and attacked with the 5th, and part of the 6th, Corps, he had halted the 2D Corps on the Brock Road, on which it had been marching and had ordered the remainder of the 6th to advance up the plank road that they might come upon the flank of Ewell. As the latter already had enough to occupy him, it was well that Hill, about noon, encountered the skirmishers of the 6th. Having orders not to bring on an action until the arrival of Longstreet, and having only Heth's division present, Hill halted and formed line of battle, but did not attack. Grant, however, was promptly notified of Heth's arrival, and, knowing that Longstreet, haying to come from beyond Gordonsville, could not arrive that day, he redoubled his efforts to destroy both Hill and Ewell before night. So Hancock with the whole of the 2D Corps, 28,000, and the smaller half of the 6th, say 10,000 men, was ordered to attack Hill's two divisions, Heth and Wilcox, of about 7,000 each. Hancock, Though ordered to lose no time, 
delayed for an hour or two in order to complete some entrenchments already started along the Brock Road, so as to have something to fall back upon in case of disaster. This delay was of great value to Hill, enabling him to partially select and prepare his ground. This day, May 5th, was Grant's day, full of golden opportunities. May 4th would have been Lee's day, had he prearranged his camps so as to enable him to concentrate his army more promptly where he knew that Grant would cross. The 6th, after Longstreet's arrival, would belong to the chapter of accidents. Grant seems to have himself appreciated this, and to have continually urged his battle faster than his army could make the speed. Hill's line of battle was square across the plank road, with one brigade on the left and three on the right. On the left, the line ran through a clearing now grown up in broom grass and small pines, and containing a house known as the Widow Tabs. Some artillery, under Poag, was stationed here, and Lee and Hill made the clearing their headquarters. Wilcox's division, soon arriving, was posted on Hill's left flank, extending back obliquely in the direction of Ewell's battle, but with a gap of at least a mile between. At last, at 4.15 p.m., the sun setting at 7, Hancock, having built strong breastworks for his whole line along the Brock Road, joined Getty's division of the 6th Corps, already skirmishing for an hour with Hill, and put the whole weight of his corps into an attack upon Heth. Hill soon found that Wilcox's liner was not assailed, and that it was necessary to bring it to the support of Heth. At first Wilcox passed to the front and made some charges, but finally fell back, and the two divisions were practically merged into one line, which fought lying down. There was never more desperate fighting than now ensued, and continued until about 8 p.m., when darkness terminated the battle. Fortunately for Hill, the dense forest prevented his men from realizing the enormous odds against him, or, like Bragg's men on Missionary Ridge, they might have become demoralized by the sight. Night did not terminate the fighting any sooner than Hill wished. His ammunition was low, his lines disarranged, often disconnected, and some even facing in different directions. Besides the danger impending from Hancock on his front and right, a greater one threatened Hill on his left. Warren, while fighting Yule, had seen Wilcox in his temporary location and had seen his withdrawal to go to Heth's aid. He sent Wadsworth's division and Baxter's brigade, about 8,000 men, to move in that direction and attack Hill's flank. Darkness overtook Wadsworth at Hill's skirmish line and he halted and bivouacked, ready to attack in the morning. During the night, Grant had been joined by Burnside's 9th Corps, 24,000 strong comprised in four divisions, one of which was of Negroes. This was left to guard the trains. Two of the white divisions, Potter and Wilcox, supported by the 3D, Stevensons, were sent to penetrate the gap between Hill and Ewell, now over a mile in extent. Long before day, Hill could hear the enemy forming in the woods near at hand. Nothing was done in the way of preparation or of entrenchment during the night, as the men expected to be relieved by Longstreet's two divisions in the morning. Meanwhile, Grant had been misled into a serious blunder by false information, curiously like what had been imposed upon Hooker in the Chancellorsville campaign. By the stories of prisoners he was led to believe, just as Hooker had been, that Pickett's division had arrived, and he ordered Hancock to withdraw Barlow's division from the force about to attack Heth, and post it on his left, on the Brock Road, in anticipation of Pickett's expected appearance. They happened to be near that point the grading of an unfinished railroad, designed to run from Fredericksburg to Orange Sea. H, and here passing through the wilderness a little south of it, and nearly parallel to the Plank Road. It offered a great opportunity to turn the flank of either of the lines about to be engaged near that road. Fortunately for us, Barlow did not utilize it, but left the opportunity to Longstreet. Punctually at 5 a.m. on the 6th, Warren and Sedgwick attacked Tule and Hancock, with Wadsworth and Getty, attacked Hill. A short story can be made of the attack upon Yule. He had strengthened his lines during the night and gotten in more of his artillery. The attacks upon him were fierce and bloody, 
but were all repulsed. For six hours they were renewed frequently, but by 11 am the fight was all out of the assailants, and for the rest of the day they were satisfied to lie behind their breastworks and keep up a more or less noisy, but harmless, fire upon the Confederates in theirs. Late in the afternoon, however, an attack was made upon an exposed flank of the 6th Corps by Gordon, of Early's division, which will be described later. But, of all the chapter of accidents affecting the Confederate fortunes, scarcely one was more unfortunate for them than what was then disclosed. The opportunity for this attack, which might have been fatal to Grant's campaign, had lain open all day, uninvestigated by Ewell and Early, although both were notified of it, and begged to verify it. Hancock's attack upon Hill opened with every promise of success. Burney's, Mott, and Getty's divisions advanced simultaneously upon Heth and Wilcox, who made a strong resistance until Wadsworth's division and Baxter's brigade struck them upon the left flank, and Hancock's left overlapped and turned their right. With both flanks broken, they were rapidly rolled up toward the center, and the men, appreciating that their position was no longer tenable, fell back from both flanks into the plank road, and came pouring down the road past the open field near the Dab House, where Lee stood among the small and scattered pines. Seeing McGowan pass, Lee rode up and said, My God! Jen! McGowan, is this splendid brigade of yours running like a flock of geese? McGowan answered, General, the men are not whipped. They only want a place to form, and they will fight as well as ever they did. Meanwhile, as already told, Longstreet's double column had turned into the plank road, at Parker's store, about five o'clock with about three miles to go. Longstreet and Staff rode at the head of the column, which filled the whole road. As we drew near the Tab House, we met what seemed to be an orderly body of troops marching in the opposite direction, who parted, taking the woods on each side and giving us the road. Presently an excited staff officer appeared, trying to stop them, who, being asked why, answered, they are running, d, n them. Soon bullets began to whistle down the road, and Longstreet ordered the leading brigades forward into line on each side. Greg, Benning, and Law, Underfield, took the left. Kennedy, Humphreys, and Bryan, under Gershaw, took the right. Some of the bullets were coming across the road from the right, their direction showing that the enemy was about to pass around our flank. Poag's guns opened fire, and Lee, seeing the Texas Brigade passing, rode to place himself at its head. The men, recognizing him and his intention, shouted, Go back! Lee to the rear, and a Texan major caught his horse by the bridle and stopped him. He was assured that the men did not need any leading and would soon restore the battle. Someone, about that time, pointed out Longstreet, and Lee was taken to him. The Federals had now advanced over a mile through the tangled forest and were necessarily in much disorder. Both sides were fighting without entrenchments, and the Federals were everywhere being pushed slowly back with severe loss. Gregg and Benning, on the left, bore the brunt of the action. Both were small brigades and their casualties were heavy. Benning was severely wounded. The losses of the brigades cannot be given. But few reports were made after the commencement of this campaign, and there are only a small number of these which state the casualties. The news of Longstreet's presence was soon conveyed to Meade and Grant, and reinforcements were sent Hancock, while Sedgwick and Warren were ordered to press their attacks. Getty was wounded and his division was withdrawn. Stevenson's division, the reserve of the Ninth Corps, was ordered to the left, and Barlow, on the extreme left, was directed to attack Hill's right. Barlow, however, only sent one brigade, Franks, having been misled by the approach from his left of a body of Federal convalescents who were at first taken for Pickett's division. He also attributed to Pickett some very rapid fire heard on the left where Sheridan, with his Spencer carbines, had attacked Stuart, by Grant's orders, but had been repulsed. Wilcox's and Potter's divisions of Burnside's corps, sent to penetrate the gap between Hill and Ewell, were urged forward, and a staff officer sent to guide them, 
but they did not come into action until two o'clock, before which time the ground had been occupied by Heth and Wilcox, who were able to repel their assault when it was made. With the aid of these reinforcements, the Confederate advance was brought to a standstill and the firing gradually ceased. Engineer troops were brought up, and the Federals began improving and extending their lines. Meanwhile, about 8 a.m., Anderson's division of Hill's Corps had arrived on the field, and also Lee's chief engineer, Gen. M. L. Smith. He had been sent to search for an opportunity to turn the enemy's left. Of course, he soon found the unfinished railroad, and about 10 a.m., he reported it to Longstreet. Four brigades were promptly formed for a flank attack to be conducted by Col. Sorrell, Longstreet's adjective Gen. They were G.B. Anderson of Field's division, Wofford of Gershaw's, Muon of Anderson's, R. H., and Davis of Heth's. This attack was to be at once followed by a general advance of all Longstreet's force, which included Jenkins's large brigade and four others of Anderson's division, which had not yet fired a shot. Sorrel moved the four brigades by the flank to the unfinished railroad, where they faced to the left, and, about 11 a.m., they advanced upon the Federal line, striking it in flank and rear. The success of the movement was complete. Brigade after brigade was routed and rolled up. Hancock, noted for his power and influence with his men on such occasions, endeavored in vain to stay the panic, but was unable to do so, and, consulting with Burney, he decided to abandon all in front and endeavor to re-establish his line upon the Brock Road. Here he had, the day before, sacrificed valuable time to entrench a line which might now serve him as a refuge. The panic had extended even across the plank road where Wadsworth had been killed and Baxter wounded, when their troops were routed. This was Longstreet's great opportunity. Nearly the whole of Grant's army had been first fought to a standstill, and now four brigades, with little loss by a lucky movement, had utterly routed about two full corps in the wilderness, where it was almost impossible to rally broken troops. Longstreet, with five more fresh brigades, was close at hand, fully prepared to join the victorious four and to be aided by the brigades which had relieved Heth and Wilcox in the morning in a supreme effort to follow up the fugitives, and to drive them into the Rapidan. When Smith had directed Sorrell's column on its turning expedition, he had been given a small party and directed to find a way across the Brock Road which would turn Hancock's extreme left. He had now returned and reported one found. He was asked to conduct the flanking brigades and handle them as the ranking officer. He was a fine tactician, a skillful engineer, and had been noted for gallantry in the defense of Vicksburg, where he had been chief engineer. He was a native of NY and a graduate of West Point of the class of 1838. When Sorrell's flanking brigades reached the plank road, some crossing in the attack in pursuit of Wadsworth, and some in line a little ways in the woods on the right, whence they fired on the fugitives down the road, he rode back to where Longstreet, Smith, Field, Gershaw, and others stood at the head of Jenkins's brigade, in column in the road, ready to be launched in the pursuit. He made his report, which was of an ideal success, as had already been made known by the progress of the musketry. It may be imagined how rapidly the news was spread down the ranks and with what alacrity was heard the order to advance. Meanwhile, the 12th V. of Muon's brigade, had crossed the plank road in the pursuit of Wadsworth and gotten ahead of the other regiments, detained by a fire in the woods across their path. It was now returning to find its brigade, which was in line near the road, and had, only a short while before, been firing at Wadsworth fugitives. The 12th on the left of the road, was mistaken in the woods for an advance of the enemy, and fire was opened on it by the other regiments, just as the head of the column was about to pass, and it rode into the fire. Jenkins had just before ridden close to Long Street to offer congratulations, and had said, I feel happy. I had felt despair of our cause for some months, but am relieved. I feel assured we will put the enemy back across the rapid and before night. Jenkins and Longstreet were both struck, the former mortally, dying within two hours, the latter in the throat, 
passing out behind the right shoulder. Captain Doby, and Bowen, an orderly of Gershaw's staff, were killed. Jenkins's brigade leveled to return the fire, but Kershaw shouted F-R-I-E-N-D-S. And arms were recovered, and the men lay down without firing a shot. The 12th V. had also lain down. Long Street at once summoned Field, the senior officer present, to take the command and to press the pursuit, one column the direct attack, the other to turn the position along the Brock Road. Before Field, however, had taken command, Gen. R. H. Anderson, his senior, arrived, and Lee soon after came up. Long Street writes that the plans, orders, and opportunity were explained to Lee, but the woods concealed everything except the troops along the road, and Lee did not care to handle broken lines, and ordered a formation for parallel battle. This consumed so much time that it was 4.15 pm when the attack was renewed by Fields and Anderson's divisions, excepting Law's and Perry's brigades. Gen. Humphreys, in his account of this campaign, says of this attack. Could it have been made early in the day and followed up, it would have had important consequences. Earlier in the day, it might have been made by three divisions, and would have found the enemy already retreating. Now he had had four hours to reform in entrenchments and strengthen them. Grant had himself given orders to renew his attack upon us at 6 p.m. Our attack at 4.15 so reduced the Federal ammunition, and their ordnance wagons were so far in the rear that the attack was given up. As it was, Jenkins's brigade, under Bratton, after a half-hour's attack, drove off Ward's brigade and a portion of Mott's division, and planted their colors upon the entrenchments. But there were no reinforcements and the enemy had a second fortified line full of troops, so Bratton was at last forced to withdraw with severe loss. His attack, and his final repulse by Carroll, were both highly complimented by Hancock. Under all the circumstances, the renewal of the attack at the late hour, and without Gershaw's division, was unwise. It was certain to cost many lives. The chances of success were not good, and, even had they been, the lateness of the hour would have interfered with gathering the fruit of victory. The fire in the woods, which had started during Muon's attack, had continued to burn and some of the wounded perished in it. It had reached Hancock's log breastworks, and a part of them were on fire at the time of our afternoon assault, with which it materially interfered. It only remains to complete the record of the day's misfortunes with a brief account of Gordon's attack upon the right of the Sixth Corps, commenced a little before sundown, although the existence of the opportunity for it, as already mentioned, had been discovered by scouts and reported to Gordon by 9 a.m. Gordon had verified it by personal observation and reported it to his division commander, Early, and urged an attack. Early had adopted a theory that Grant would have Burnside's 9th Corps in support of the right of the 6th. In vain Gordon answered that observation showed it was not there, and in vain he appealed to Ewell, the corps commander, to verify it. Early's personality dominated Ewell's to such an extent that Ewell not only sustained him in his theory, but would neither go and see or refer the important question to Lee. And so the matter remained during all the hours and all the vicissitudes of the day, until about 5.30 p.m., when Lee, who had been occupied until then on the right, and wondered at the strange silence on his left, rode up and asked, Cannot something be done on this flank to relieve the pressure on our right? Ewell, Early, and Gordon all happened to be present. Gordon's proposal was mentioned, and Early vigorously combated it. Lee listened in grim silence to his reasons for non-action, and answered only with direct orders to Gordon to proceed immediately to make the attack, taking one other brigade, Johnson's, to support his attack. Strange to say, the situation had not changed. The attack took place just as the sun sank in the west. It was as immediately and brilliantly successful as Longstreet's flank attack with four brigades at eleven o'clock had been, but now darkness intervened to save Grant's army as effectually as had the bullet which disabled Longstreet. Two brigades, Seymour's and Shaler's, were completely routed, 
the brigadiers and several hundred men being captured. Gordon's casualties were very small and a large proportion of them were from a crossfire of our own men upon the flanking party, as it swept down the Federal line in front of the Confederate line of battle in the twilight. Darkness, of course, soon put an end to the possibility of fighting, and the Federals, during the night, fell back and occupied an entirely new line in the rear. Early, during the war, never admitted that the Ninth Corps was not on the right and rear of the Sixth, but the publication of the official records shows that it was employed entirely in other parts of the field. There are no Confederate returns to 112, out of 183, regiments. The Federal casualties for the two days were colon killed, 2,246, wounded, 12,037, missing. 3,383, total, 18,360. Livermore estimates that in proportion to the numbers engaged, the Confederate losses could not have been any less than the Federal, which, estimating only the killed and wounded, were 14,283 or 127 per 1,000 men engaged. The numbers engaged. Livermore estimates as colon and the corresponding Confederate loss would be 7,750. The Confederates had killed Gens, J. M. Jones and L. A. Stafford, and wounded Longstreet, Begram, Benning, and Berry. The Federals had wounded Gens, Carroll, and Baxter. Gen. Humphreys writes of this battle, I have gone into more detail because it may serve to show what difficulties were encountered by the forces engaged in it, owing to the character of the field on which it took place. So far as I know, no great battle ever took place before on such ground. But little of the combatants could be seen, and its progress was known to the senses chiefly by the rising and falling sounds of a vast musketry fire that continually swept along the lines of battle many miles in length sounds which at times approached the sublime. Spotsylvania May Command had not been engaged in the wilderness. When the battle began, on the 6th, I was ordered to halt all the artillery at Parker's store, and it remained there until in the afternoon of the 7th, when it was started for Spotsylvania CH when Grant made no attack on the morning of the 7th, and, in the afternoon, his trains were seen moving toward our right. Lee correctly guessed that his design was to turn our right. Late in the afternoon, Lee ordered Anderson, who had succeeded Longstreet in command of the First Corps, to march at night for Spotsylvania. It was to be a foot-race to see who could first occupy the ground, and the advantages seemed to be with Grant, who had ordered Meade to start his trains at 3 p.m., so as to clear the roads, and to establish one corps at the courthouse one at the crossroads known as the Block House, and one at Todd's Tavern. The troops were to march at 8.30 p.m., and they had about 12 miles to go. It was in the dark of the moon. We had about 15 miles to go, and, on arrival, only two divisions to oppose to the three corps. Fitzlee's cavalry, however, was on the road in front of Spotsylvania, and Hampton's defended Corbin's Bridge on the Catharpin Road, by which the enemy might have interfered with our march. Our cavalry had cut down trees to blockade the roads, and they defended their blockades so well that the enemy's cavalry could not force them in the night, but had to wait for daylight. The enemy enjoyed a great advantage in having the initiative. Lee could not know until after daylight in the morning whether Grant's entire army had left his front or not. In any event, our two divisions could have no reinforcements during the greater part of the day. Thanks to the good work of Hampton's division at Corbin's Bridge, we passed that danger point safely. Our artillery, from Parker's store, came by the Shady Grove Road, and about daylight we joined the two divisions of infantry near the Po River, where the column halted for an hour to rest and eat breakfast, expecting this to be a busy day for already we could hear the beginning of some fighting two miles to our left, indicating that the Federal columns were finding our cavalry in their way. The Federals, however, were sure that they had won the race. Mr. Dana, a Secretary of War, who was with Grant at the time, 
wrote of it afterward, as follows, I remember distinctly the sensation in the ranks when the rumor first went around that our position was south of Lees. It was the morning of May 8. The night before, the army had made a forced march on Spotsylvania ch. There was no indication the next morning that Lee had moved in any direction. As the army began to realize that we were moving south, and, at that moment were probably much nearer Richmond than was our enemy, the spirits of both officers and men rose to the highest pitch of animation. On every hand I heard the cry on to Richmond. Our little halt for breakfast, greatly needed by both men and animals after the night march, about exhausted all the margin by which we had won the race. About 7 a.m., we reached a crossroad, where stood the peculiar looking house, called the Block House built of squared logs. Here we met pressing appeals for help from two directions. From Spotsylvania C. H., one and a half miles in front, Ross's brigade reported itself as being driven by Wilson's division of cavalry, coming from the direction of Fredericksburg. From the road to the left, which crossed the Brock Road on the Spindler Farm one mile away. Fitzley reported himself as heavily pressed by Warren's corps of infantry, and the increasing musketry fire told that the situation was fast growing critical. The two leading brigades, Kennedy and Humphreys of Gershaw's division, were at once filed to the left and hurried to the relief of Fitzley's cavalry. The other brigades of the same division, Wofford and Bryan, went on ahead to the aid of Ross. Haskell's battalion of artillery went with Kershaw and Humphreys. Fitzley was defending some slight rail breastworks on the edge of a dense pine thicket, overlooking a large open area, and the infantry quickly relieved the men with carbines behind the rails. The latter, unobserved, were withdrawn to the rear through the thicket, mounted and taken by Lee to the aid of Rossa. Kennedy and Humphreys had hardly gotten into position when they were charged by the three brigades of Robinson's division of the V Corps. Each brigade was formed in column of regiments, four lines deep. Two brigades formed the first line, and the third brigade the second line. Warren had told them, the prisoners afterwards stated, that there was only cavalry behind the rail breastworks, who had no bayonets and could not stand close quarters. They actually did charge home to the rails, and a bayonet fight took place across them, but though superior in numbers, the Federals were repulsed, leaving the ground strewn with dead and wounded, Robinson being among the latter. Haskell's guns took part in the repulse and did fine service, losing a captain. Potts. Killed. Fields Division now came up to Kershaw's support and extended his line to the left. Huger's battalion took position in the edge of the pine thicket where the cavalry had stood, and Cabell's battalion was held in reserve. Wilson's cavalry, having held Spotsylvania C. H. for two hours, was withdrawn by Sheridan, as Rosser, reinforced by Fitz Lee, was moving upon him. Wofford and Bryan now rejoined Field. Meanwhile, after the repulse of Robinson's division, Griffin's division made two assaults. The first met about the same fate as Robinson. The second did not come so far, but secured positions to our right, where they could find cover from 300 to 400 yards away, and began to entrench. Crawford's division next came up to Griffin's left and extended his entrenchment, only exchanging rather distant fire with ours. Wadsworth's, the last division, now under Cutler, next made an attack upon our left, driving in our pickets and establishing a line prolonging Griffin's to his right. It was now about midday, and Warren's corps had been fought to a standstill. About this time, Meade ordered Sedgwick to reinforce Warren with his whole corps and join him in an attack upon our two divisions, which was to be immediate and vigorous. It was scarcely done as ordered, for it was not made until five o'clock, it was but a partial attack and it was nowhere successful. The time required to form troops for an attack can seldom be exactly fixed, and here it was said that the ground was new to everyone and the troops were tired with an all-night march. The attack was made, however, by so large a force, that it overlapped our line on its right, which might have proved a very serious matter. As luck would have it, however, Crawford's division, 
the overlapping pot which entered the woods beyond our extreme right about dusk, ran into Rhodes's division of Ewell's corps, just arriving on the field, after an all-day march from the wilderness, nearly exhausted by the heat, dust, and the smoke of the fires still burning there. Rhodes promptly drove Crawford back to his place in the Federal line, and then forming his division on the right of Gershaw, he proceeded to entrench. Johnson's division formed on his right and Early's division, now under Gordon, in reserve. The fighting along the lines lasted until dark. During it, nearly every gun in our corps had been engaged, and was now assigned to some position, either on the line or behind, where it could fear over. Now at night, all were entrenching themselves, and we made our bivouac near the blockhouse. Hill's corps, now under early, Hill being sick, had remained all day of the 8th guarding the movement of our trains from the wilderness. On the 9th, it followed the other corps to Spotsylvania and took position on Ewell's right, except Moon's division, formerly Anderson's, which was formed on the left of field, overlooking the Po. The day was taken as a much needed day of rest by the Federals, in which we cheerfully acquiesced. The sharpshooting, however, was active upon both sides. One of our sharpshooters killed Jen. Sedgwick at a range of about 700 yards from the pine thicket on the Brock Road. He was succeeded by Wright in the command of the 6th Corps. The day was largely devoted to improving our breastworks, an art in which we were much behind our adversaries. Our equipment with entrenching tools was always far below our requirements, and in emergencies the men habitually loosened the ground with bayonets, and scooped it up with tin cups. The line was laid out generally by those who built it. The Federals had a large force, perhaps 2,500 men, of engineer troops and heavy artillery regiments, habitually employed in building and improving their entrenchments under the direction of engineer officers. They were more valuable than an equal number of regular troops, and should be a part of the equipment of every army. Sheridan, on the 8th, had been ordered to concentrate his cavalry, move against Stuart, and then upon our communications, and when his supplies were exhausted, to proceed to the James River, renew his supplies, and return to the army. Burnside's corps arrived on the 9th by the Fredericksburg Road and began entrenching opposite Hill whose lines covered the courthouse on our right. He had encountered some dismounted cavalry whom he mistook for a brigade of Longstreet's infantry, and so reported it to Grant. This misled Grant into the belief that Lee was moving in the direction of Fredericksburg, and he ordered Hancock immediately to cross the Po, move down it and recross by the Shady Grove Road, thus turning our left flank. Hancock at once put three divisions to cross simultaneously at three different points. The farthest upstream met a stubborn resistance from dismounted cavalry, but it was presently driven off by those who had crossed below, where the second effort had met little resistance, and the third none. Pontoon bridges were immediately thrown at all three places, and the troops were pushed downstream, hoping to secure Shady Grove Road Bridge. Darkness, however, soon forced a halt, but some of the men reached the river and found it not fordable. At early dawn, Hancock reconnoitred, but found Muon's brigade on the opposite bank too strongly posted to be attacked. Further reconnaissances were being made, when, about 10 a.m., Hancock was ordered to send two divisions of his three back across the Po to take part in an assault ordered in the afternoon at five. Gibbon and Burney were accordingly withdrawn, leaving Barlow's division alone on the south side. Meanwhile, when Hancock crossed the Po on the afternoon of the 9th, Lee had ordered Heth's division from his extreme right to the extreme left, with orders to cross below our lines, and, coming up, to strike Hancock's three divisions on the flank. Heth had crossed the Po, some distance below our left flank, on the morning of the 10th, and turned to the right, hunting for Hancock's flank. It was fortunate for him that he had made so wide a circuit that he did not find it until after Hancock, with his two divisions, had been withdrawn to the north side, for Barlow's four brigades alone largely outnumbered him with only three, and Barlow could have been quickly reinforced. Heth would otherwise have lost much of his division, 
as its retreat across the Po would have been difficult. As it was, Heth made two spirited charges upon two of Barlow's brigades drawn up behind the crest of a ridge, with the others supporting in the rear. Both charges were repulsed with severe loss, but meanwhile, a fire breaking out in the woods in rear, Meade ordered Barlow withdrawn. This was done with the loss of one gun, wedged between trees by the horses, who were stampeded by the fire. In withdrawing, Barlow suffered severely from the artillery across the Po, which swept the plain over which he reached the bridge. Some of the wounded perished in the fire. Gen. H. H. Walker of Heth's division was severely wounded. It had been a mistake to send Hancock across the Po at such a late hour in the afternoon. Night intervened before he could accomplish anything, and it disclosed his plan. Next day he abandoned it before discovering that Heth was in his power. At night Heth was returned to the right flank. Heavy shelling of the first corps lines had been kept up all the morning, and in the afternoon three assaults were made at different points. One against Fields Division had been ordered at 5 p.m., but at 3.30 Warren thought the opportunity for attack so favorable that he made it without further delay. In full uniform, he attacked the lines held by Fields Division with Cutler's and Crawford's divisions and Webb's and Carroll's brigades, approaching through dense thickets which hid him from view until at quite close quarters but our guns had been placed to flank these thickets and riddled them with canister as the enemy passed through. They emerged in bad order and unable to form under close musketry, and were repulsed with severe losses, among them Jen, Rice, mortally wounded. A few only succeeded in gaining our works, where their covered approach had been closest, but they were killed or captured. Not satisfied with this effort, Hancock tried a second assault at 7 p.m with Bernie's and Gibbon's divisions, supported by part of the 5th Corps, but it was also repulsed with severe loss to the enemy and with very trifling loss to us. Glancing back over the sequence of events, it appears that Burnside's mistaking dismounted cavalry for Longstreet's infantry on the 9th, was a most fortunate one for Lee. For it led to Grant's prematurely sending Hancock across the Po and then withdrawing him. Had he continued on that flank and perhaps been reinforced by Warren, it is hard to see how he could have failed to defeat Heth and completely turn Lee's flank, and get upon his communications which now ran to Louisa C. H. While those affairs were going on upon our left, a carefully planned and partially successful effort was being made near our center. In the hasty extension of our line to the eastward in the afternoon of the 8th, Yule, to keep on high ground had changed direction and gone a mile north, then, making a right-angled salient, had returned within three-fourths of a mile of the point of departure before resuming his eastward course. There resulted a great salient a mile long, reaching out toward the enemy and ending in the point afterward known as the Bloody Angle. It was a piece of bad engineering and certain to invite an attack as soon as the enemy understood it. This it required a few days for them to do for our sharpshooters prevented any close reconnaissance. Meanwhile, however, our men found that the sides of the sail and tangle were enfiladed by the musketry fire of the enemy's sharpshooters coming over the parapets, and, for protection, traverses were erected every few yards along them. On the 10th, all the features of this salient had not been understood but on its western face the enemy had found a place where a large force could approach within 200 yards of our entrenchments, entirely unobserved, and would have but that distance under fire to enter them. It was here that the carefully planned effort was made at 5 p.m. The assault was made under Col. Upton commanding a brigade in Russell's division of the 6th Corps. He was a graduate of West Point of the class of 61, and had already shown himself distinguished as a tactician and a leader of troops. His command included three brigades, comprising twelve regiments which were formed in four lines. No commands were given while moving into position. All had bayonets fixed and guns loaded, but only the front line had them capped. On reaching our works, the first line would divide, half going to the right and half to the left, to sweep in each direction. The 2D line would halt at the works and open fire to the front. The 3D would lie down behind the 2D, 
and the fourth would lie down at the edge of the wood, whence they charged, and awaited the result. In the charge, all officers would constantly repeat the shout forward, and the men would rush forward with eyes on the ground they were traversing. The attack fell upon Doles's Georgia Brigade of Rhodes's division, and Upton thus describes how the charge was met, here occurred a deadly hand-to-hand -hand conflict. The enemy sitting in their pits with pieces upright, loaded, and with bayonets fixed ready to impale the first who should leap over, absolutely refused to yield the ground. The first of our men who tried to surmount the works fell pierced through the head by musket balls. Others, seeing the fate of their comrades, held their pieces at arm's length and fired downward, while others, poising their pieces vertically, hurled them down upon their enemy, pinning them to the ground. Numbers prevailed and like a resistless wave the column poured over the works, quickly putting hors de combat those who resisted, and sending to the rear those who surrendered. Mott's division was to have supported Upton on the left, but it did not appear. It seems that this division was formed for the attack where our batteries had a view of it, and that when it attempted to advance, at the signal for the charge, it found itself the target of a severe artillery fire, under which the brigades broke and fell back to the foot of the hill. Meanwhile, the Confederate brigades on the right and left had promptly attacked Upton upon both flanks, and Battle's brigade, brought up from the rear, attacked him in front. He brought up his fourth line in vain in a hard fight, and was finally driven back with loss, which he states as about 1,000 in killed, wounded, and prisoners, probably about 20% of his command. Ewell's official report of the affair, dated Richmond, March 20, 1865, says, the enemy was driven from our works, leaving 100 dead within them and a large number in front. Our loss, as near as I can tell, was 650, of whom 350 war prisoners. The total losses of the Federals for the day were estimated at 4,100, and included Gen. Stevenson of Burnside's corps killed by a sharpshooter. Grant believed that the failure of Mott's division to advance had caused Upton's defeat upon the 10th. and on the 11th he planned a much more powerful attack to be made by the whole of the 2d and the 9th corps. In preparation for this, the corps commanders were ordered to ascertain the least force which could hold their lines, and leave the remainder available for service elsewhere. They were also directed to press their skirmishers forward so as to allow close reconnaissance of our works. Later, he determined upon the salient already described and afterward known as the bloody angle, as the point of attack. On our lines the day was one of bitter sharpshooting and angry artillery practice. Meanwhile, all movements of the enemy were carefully watched for indications of his plans, and one was reported from which Lee derived the impression that he was preparing to make a flank march to our left. Hancock had sent miles to reconnoiter across the Po in the direction of Todd's Tavern. Only two regiments were sent and they returned in the evening, but our report had exaggerated the numbers and undue importance was attached to the incident. Early had also reported indications of movements to the left. Lee believed that Grant was preparing for another flank march to be attempted during the night, and orders were sent to each chief of artillery to withdraw at sundown all of his guns which were in lines close to the enemy, so that if it became necessary to move during the night, the withdrawal of the guns would not be heard. Muon's division was still upon Fields' left, and Lee also ordered it, with two brigades of Wilcox, to make a night march and occupy Shady Grove before daylight. During the night, it was discovered that the movement to the left had been unimportant, it was supposed to have been a feint, but it was not, so that Muon was recalled, and now he, with Wilcox's two brigades, war returned to Hill's corps. The order to the chiefs of artillery, however, was not recalled, and consequently 22 guns of Page's and Cutshaw's battalions were, about sundown, withdrawn from the position about to be attacked. It was a fatal mistake, as will presently appear. On the line of Longstreet's corps, I had ventured to accomplish the intent of the order without literal compliance with its terms. 
I had visited every battery and had its ammunition chests mounted, they were usually dismounted, and the chests placed under cover in the pits, and the carriages so placed and the roads so prepared that we could withdraw easily and without noise. Our guns all remained in position on the lines. It was in the dark of the moon, and heavy rain was falling as the Federals began to move soon after nightfall. It was after midnight when they reached the ground where they were to form. Hancock's formation is interesting, but it failed from an over concentration of force. Hancock's formation for charge, May 12, 1864, at Gettysburg, our formation for Pickett's charge, which was too light was in two lines supported at a little distance by a part of a third. Upton's charge, on the 10th, was in four lines, and was at first successful, but was finally repulsed. Hancock seemed anxious to make sure, and formed Barlow's division in two lines of two brigades each, closed in mass. This gave a column at least ten ranks, or twenty men, deep. Barlow had open ground to advance over. On his right, Bernie had a marsh and then a thick wood of low pines, until quite near the enemy. He was in two lines followed by Mott in one. In rear of all stood Gibbon's division deployed. All officers were dismounted, and the division and brigade commanders and their staffs marched in the center between the lines. The intervals between the ranks in Barlow's division were all so small that, soon after the advance began, the intervals were lost and the division became a solid mass. Grant had ordered the charge at 4 a.m., but, owing to fog, Hancock delayed until 4.35. As it began to grow light, the order was given to charge. The men moved at first quietly and slowly, but about the time when the Confederate pickets fired, they broke into a run and there was some cheering. The distance to our works was about 1,200 yards. The Confederates had heard the noise of the column being formed, and urgent calls had been sent for the return of the 22 guns which had garnished our parapets the day before, but had been withdrawn about sundown, as already told. They were now coming back through the woods in two long lines under Page and Cutshaw. The two leading guns were in time to unlimber, and, between them, fired three rounds into the Federal masses before they were surrounded. All the column, except the two rear guns, was captured. Had they been in their places, it is quite certain that the charge would not have been successful. Nowhere else, in the whole history of the war, was such a target, so large, so dense, so vulnerable, ever presented to so large a force of artillery. Ranks had already been lost in the crowd and officers could neither show example or exercise authority. A few discharges would have made of it a mob which could not have been rallied. There was a thick abatis of felt trees in front and Shivox de Fries which, Barlow says, would have been very difficult to get through under a cool fire. For the mob, which his division would have soon formed, there would have been no escape but flight, with phenomenal loss for the time exposed to fire. As it was, our infantry had time to fire only two or three hurried rounds, when the enemy were upon them. Perhaps one third escaped, but about two thirds were captured, among them being Major Gen. Johnston and Brig. Gen. Stewart. Of the 22 guns, 18 were captured at once. Two more were abandoned between the lines, where our men were able to use them against the enemy during the day, but the enemy got them during the night. Thus, the first Federal operation of the day was a great success so far as guns and prisoners were concerned, but the tactics used were so faulty that they practically so embarrassed all the future operations, as to prevent any further fruit from the victory, although the whole force of the army was brought to bear. The enemy, in possession of the salient and the captured guns, pursued the fugitives and turned some of the captured guns upon them. But the fugitives, falling back, soon met reinforcements coming from the brigades of Johnston and Gordon on the right, and from Daniel and Ramser on the left, who attacked them with great spirit. The pursuers were utterly disorganized, as, indeed, was almost the whole of Hancock's corps, 
and there was scarcely room within the salient to organize and reform the lines. Efforts were being made by Barlow when the well organized Confederate brigades began to push back the disorganized pursuers and recover some of the ground which had been lost. It was reported to Grant that Hancock was being checked and eight brigades of the 6th Corps were ordered to reinforce him. They charged in with cheers and were added to the troops already much too crowded in the confined space. This was about 8 a.m. Meanwhile, Burnside had been ordered at 5 a.m. to assault A.P. Hill's lines on our right. He had sent Potter's division against Lane's, our extreme brigade on that flank. Potter carried the line and captured two guns. Lane reformed his brigade in some old breastworks, which enfiladed those pots he had taken, drove him out, and recaptured the guns. Wilcox sent two brigades to Lane's help, but they were not needed and were sent back. About 8 a.m., Burnside was ordered to move to his left and connect with Hancock's Lynn, which he did by 9.15. Wilcox's division of the 9th was now ordered to attack Heth's line, at a favorable point where a pine thicket allowed a close approach under cover. While his attack was in progress, he was struck on his left flank by Lane's and Wise Iger's brigades of Hill's corps, who had been sent out by Early to endeavor to relieve the pressure at the salient. Lane claimed to have captured a battery, but was unable to take it off. Wilcox was helped by Cretendon's division, and skirmishing and heavy artillery firing was kept up all day without material result. To return now to the angle where eight brigades of the 6th Corps had arrived about 8 a.m. The determined counterattacks of Ewell's brigades had cleared the space within the breastworks and compelled the enemy to confine themselves to the outside slopes of the parapet or the interior of a few enclosures along its inside slopes made by joining the ends of the traverses which were only 10 or 12 feet apart, and built up of logs. Every available foot of cover was occupied, and outside of the parapets the men stood from 20 to 40 deep. Those in rear would pass guns to some in front, who would fire almost as rapidly as if they had breech loaders. Fortunately, much of the fire was without aim or nothing could have lived before it. The entire forest in its front was killed, logs were whipped into basket stuff. An oak tree, 22 inches in diameter, whose trunk is still preserved in Washington, was cut down entirely by musketry fire, disabling several men in the 1st SC Regiment, by its fall. Ammunition was supplied liberally from the rear and many men fired over 300 rounds. The bodies of the wounded and slain of both sides who had fallen in the earlier attacks were shot to pieces and mangled beyond any recognition. In the meantime, Lee had brought up three brigades of Hill's corps, Perrin's, and Harris's of Muon's division and McGowan of Wilcox's, and Grant added two brigades of Ricketts's division and three of Cutler's to the nineteen brigades already engaged. He also brought up artillery on the two flanks outside the salient to rake the prolongations of the parapet held by the Federals. In their reserve artillery were eight 24 PR. Cockhorn mortars, and these, Two, were brought and effectively used to drop shells behind the Confederate parapets. Across the throat of the angle, our line was covered from view by the wood. Lee's only opportunity for attack was along the west parapet, where the traverses were close together, as already told. Here the Confederates never relaxed their efforts and succeeded in getting possession of nearly all of them up to the salient. Many were shot and stabbed through the crevices of their logs. Perrin was killed and McGowan severely wounded. In his report, the latter writes as follows, In getting into this trench, we had to pass through a terrific fire. We found in the trenches Gen. Harris, and what remained of his gallant brigade, and they, Mississippians and Carolinians, mingled together, made one of the most gallant and stubborn defenses recorded in history. These two brigades remained there, holding our line without reinforcements without food, water, or rest, under a storm of balls, which did not intermit one instant of time, for eighteen hours. The trenches on the right of the bloody angle ran with blood and had to be cleared of the dead bodies more than once. The loss in my brigade was very heavy, being in the aggregate 451. Our men lay on one side of the breastwork and the enemy on the other, 
and in many cases men were pulled over. It is believed we captured as many prisoners as we lost. We pass now to the left, to Long Street's front opposite Warren. At dawn, Warren had opened all his guns and pressed forward his skirmishers, hoping soon to see us sending forces to our right, to meet Hancock's victorious advance. But Hancock had overdone his effort, as has been seen, and his advance had been brief. Our guns were all behind their parapets and firing slowly in reply to the enemy. Warren saw no encouragement to attempt an attack, so he waited. At 9.15, Grant ordered him to attack at once, at all hazards and with his whole force if necessary. At 10 a.m., we saw Warren's men advance over the open ground where they had first assaulted us on the 8th. By common consent, infantry and artillery reserved their fire until his line was within 100 yards. Then both opened, and the line was quickly driven back with heavy loss to them, and but little to ourselves. They fell back to their right out of our sight in a hollow. We followed their disappearance with a random fire of artillery down the hollow, which Broughton's skirmishers reported enfiladed them and caused much loss. But, being random fire, it was presently discontinued to save ammunition. Soon there broke out in the hollow a furious fusillade for which we could find no explanation, unless they were firing on each other by mistake. This seemed unlikely when it was kept up for over two hours, a great roar of musketry. Bratton, in his report, says, it seemed a heavy battle and we had nothing to do with it. Skirmishers from the 1st and 5th, S.C. Regiments were ordered up to the crest to discover what it meant. They found them lying behind the crest, firing at what did not clearly appear, but they, the skirmishers, with great gallantry, charged them with a yell, rooted, and put the whole mass to flight most precipitate and headlong, capturing some forty prisoners. In their haste and panic a multitude of them ran across an open space and gave our battery and my line of battle on the right a shot at them. The skirmishers, too. We kept up a most effective fire on them, and that field also was thickly dotted with their dead and wounded. I can find no mention of this episode in any federal report beyond statements in the itineraries of Griffin's and Cutler's divisions that they were engaged, Griffin 3 and Cutler 4 hours, on the morning of the 12th. Can it be that two federal divisions fought each other for nearly that time and that every reference to it in the official reports has been carefully suppressed? It seems so. Warren's account of the attack gives suspiciously few details, not even noting the divisions engaged. Here is the whole of it, I also again assailed the enemy's entrenchments, suffering heavy loss but failing to get in. The enemy's direct and flank fire was too destructive lost very heavily. It hardly seems likely that so much loss could have been incurred from their very brief exposure to our fire. Longstreet's official diary describes the action only as two violent assaults between 9 and 10, on a part of Field's line. Gen. B. G. Humphreys's book throws no light on the subject beyond the following footnote, I was overlooking the right of the army and gave the order for the assaults that to cease as soon as I was satisfied they could not succeed, and directed the transfer of the troops to the center for the attack there. What, then, prolonged the engagements of Griffin and Cutler between three and four hours, of which no one gives any details? Immediately after this failure of Warren to break our line, his whole force was transferred to the angle, except Crawford's division of two brigades, and Kitching's and Denison's brigades. This added eight brigades to the twenty-four already massed there, and artillery was also brought to bore from every spot, near and far, which offered a location. It had been intended to use Warren's corps in a fresh attack upon the angle, but after some preparation it was wisely abandoned. Lee had brought up Humphreys's brigade from Gershaw's, and Bratton's from Field's division. We had also contributed Cabell's arty baton to strengthen the force holding the line across the gorge, and it was practically impregnable. As night approached, several Federal brigades were designated to keep up the fire upon our lines all night. It was faithfully done, at least until 1 a.m., about which time, under cover of the darkness, we withdrew to the gorge line, 
leaving to the enemy the entrenchments which had been so well defended all day. It had been necessary in the morning to retake them from Hancock's first assault, and to hold them until Lee could close the gorge. Afterward, he could not withdraw the force with which he had done it until nightfall, though there was no longer any value in the lines they held. The military lesson to be learned from the failure of Hancock's assault, for it was a failure to get only twenty guns and perhaps four thousand prisoners for such a gigantic effort, is, that there is a maximum limit to the force which can be advantageously used in any locality, and a superfluity may paralyze all efforts. Here there was a great superfluity. The federal losses for the 12th are given by Humphreys as coal on the federal gens. Wright, Webb, and Carroll were wounded. The Confederate losses, Humphreys estimates as between 4,000 and 5,000 killed and wounded and 4,000 prisoners. We had, gens. Daniel and Perrin killed, James A. Walker, R. D. Johnston, McGowan, and Rams were severely wounded, Edward Johnson and George A. Stewart captured. One feature of the occasion which added to the hardship and suffering on both sides was the rain which fell almost incessantly for two nights and a day. Mr. Dana gives the following account of a visit to the Angle on the 13th. All around us the underbrush and trees had been riddled and burned. The ground was thick with dead and wounded men, among whom the relief corps was at work. The earth, which was soft from the heavy rains we had been having both before and during the battle, had been trampled by the fighting thousands of men until it was soft like hasty pudding. As we stood there looking silently down at it, of a sudden the leg of a man was lifted up from the pool and the mud dripped off his boot. It was so unexpected, so horrible, that for a moment we were stunned. Then we pulled ourselves together and called to some soldiers nearby to rescue the owner of the leg. They pulled him out with but little trouble and discovered that he was not dead, only wounded. He was taken to the hospital where he will get well, I believe. As might have been expected, May 13th was comparatively a day of rest. The only record in my notebook is of the Federal wounded in front of our lines, who had been left on the ground since the 8th. Some were still alive, and we had noticed one who had occasionally raised himself to nearly a sitting posture. Today he was trying to knock himself in the head with the butt of his musket, making several feeble efforts. Grant only consented to ask a flag of truce for the wounded some days after Cold Harbor on June 3rd. On more than one occasion, the wounded Federals had been burnt by fires in the woods. On the 14th, we found the enemy gone from our front, but none of the wounded were now found alive. The man who had tried the day before to kill himself was found to belong to the Maryland Brigade. He had been partially stripped and was most elaborately tattooed. At night, Field's division was transferred from our left flank to the extreme right where we found Warren's corps already in front of us, having been transferred the night before. We did not know it at the time, but it afterward appeared that Grant had designed another great battle for us this morning. Only the fearful roads, due to the recent rains, and the exhaustion of his men had forced him to abandon the effort. On the 11th, he had sent his famous dispatch that he would fight it out on this line if it takes all the summer. On the night of the 13th, the moon was young, the night foggy, rainy, and intensely dark. The 5th and 6th Corps were ordered to march by farm roads, passing in rear of the 2d and 9th, cross the NY, move through fields to the Fredericksburg Road, on a tree cross the NY, form on Burnside's left, and attack our right flank at 4 a.m. on the 14th. The 2d Corps and the 9th were to be ready, and, when ordered, to join in the attack upon our whole line. Though every precaution had been taken to mark the way with bonfires and men posted along the route, Warren only arrived on time with about 4,000 men. The rain had put out the fires and the men had lost their way and floundered in the mud, until they were so broken and scattered that they could not be gotten into condition for operations that day, and the proposed attack was abandoned. We had doubtless had a narrow escape from serious trouble. With ordinary weather the distance was not great, and both the 5th and 6th Corps could have surprised our flank at dawn in the morning. 
our entrenchments on that flank did not then extend much beyond the courthouse. At 10 o'clock at night of the 14th came orders for our headquarters and Kershaw's division to follow field to the right flank. There we extended our line to the right, covering Snell's bridge over the Po. The enemy occupied himself with building defensive lines which did not follow ours toward the Po, but turned eastward and bent back toward the northeast, designed to be held by a reduced force, while he concentrated for another effort to break our line in the gorge of the salient, where he had been checked on the 12th. It had been suggested to Grant by Wright and Humphreys that, after the lapse of a few days, his movements to the left and concentration there would have caused Lee to weaken his left, and afford a favorable opportunity to surprise our bloody angle position again. By the 17th, his works were strong enough to be held by Warren with the 5th Corps, and the 2d and 6th were ordered to pass around the 9th during the night, and the 3 Corps to attack in conjunction at dawn, while Warren's corps cooperated with the artillery from the Federal left. The attack seemed to promise well. Three corps of infantry were to make it, and the artillery of four were to support it. It would fall wholly on Ewell's corps, reduced by capture of Johnson's division on the 12th, its artillery only supplemented by a few guns of Hill's corps. It proved, however, a utter failure. The infantry was so slow in finding its way through the woods behind which the line lay, that it was nearly 8 a.m. when it found itself in sight of our line through an opening in the woods. Twenty-nine guns opened upon it. Gibbons and Barlow's division, which had been in the assaulting column on the 12th, again led the assault in lines of brigades, a much more effective formation than the column closed in mass, which presented itself on the 12th. They advanced over the same ground they had then traversed, and it is reported that the stench, which rose from the unburied dead, was so sickening and terrible that many of the officers and men were made deathly sick from it. But our guns, which had been absent before, were now in position. Already, before they emerged from the wood, they were much shaken, and some of the brigades were driven back entirely by the artillery fire, our guns giving little attention to their artillery but confining their fire to the infantry. Only a few of these approached our abattis none penetrated it, and the first attack was never renewed. About 10 a.m., Meade ordered the attack discontinued, and the troops withdrawn. Few of our infantry were engaged and none of them heavily for any length of time, the whole affair being decided by the artillery of the 2d and 3d corps. McPullin, medical director, reports of this affair, 552 wounded were the result and the character of the wounds were unusually severe, a large proportion being caused by shell and canister. Our own loss was very trifling. Grant, on the 19th, was preparing to move Hancock at night on the road to Richmond and had issued the order about noon. In the afternoon, he was interrupted in his preparations by the appearance of Ewell with his corps, about 6,000 men, in his rear. Lee had suspected that Grant was beginning a flanking movement, and had directed Ewell to demonstrate against him to find out. Ewell obtained leave, instead, to move around his right, hoping to accomplish the result with less loss, as Grant's position in our front was strongly entrenched. By a circuitous route and roads impassable for artillery, he took his infantry far around the enemy and crossed the NY in their rear near the camp of Tyler's large division and Kitching's larger brigade. Here Ewell occupied a very critical position. He was so slow in realizing this and beginning his retreat that Rams, fearing that further delay would cause disaster, charged the enemy. Having driven them a short distance, he retreated, and, taking a position in rear with Begram, the two were able to delay the enemy until darkness covered a withdrawal. Hancock and Warren both hurried reinforcements to Tyler, and Ewell made a lucky escape. His loss in this venture was severe for the time engaged. Being about 900 killed, wounded, and missing, or 15% of his whole force, it would have cost less and have risked much less to have made a demonstration in front. 
the federal loss was estimated at 1,100. The two battles of the wilderness and Spotsylvania may be considered as parts of the one great battle of Grant and Lee, begun in the wilderness on May 5, 1864 and terminated only at Appomattox on April 9, 1865. During all this time the two armies were locked as if in a mortal embrace. Only by night could they shift positions. Firing by day was almost incessant. The consumption of men was far in excess of anything ever known before. The killed and wounded of the Federals in the Wilderness and Spotsylvania had been 28,202, and with 4,225 missing, the total loss had been 33,110. The Confederate losses can never be accurately known for any of the battles, from now until the close of the war, as few reports could be made in such active campaigns. Livermore's estimates give 17,250 for the same battles. The missing not included. Dot the North Anna and Cold Harbor after the signal failure on the 18th of his second venture at the Bloody Angle, Grant seems to have exhausted the possibilities on the Spotsylvania lines, and for his next effort he decided to lay a snare for Lee. It was thought that if Hancock's corps was sent off about 20 miles on the line of the Fredericksburg RR, that Lee would be tempted to attack it and endeavor to crush it while isolated. Grant having every preparation made for a rapid march, might follow and attack Lee before he could entrench himself. Hancock, accordingly, marched at nightfall on the 20th, and, by midday of the 21st, Barlow had crossed the Mattapony and began to entrench at Milford Station, the rest of the 2D Corps following. Next morning, the 5th Corps marched about 10 a.m and the 6th and 9th followed later in the day. Lee never knew of the trap set for him. When he was informed of Hancock's appearance at Milford by signal stations and cavalry detachments, he supposed it to be an effort to pass him on the flank. Little time was wasted. Wilcox drove in the 6th Corps skirmishes in an effort to find out what was going on, and Ewell was moved at once across the Po, on the right and about noon was started to Hanover Junction. Longstreet followed him at night, and Hill moved at the same time by a parallel road. Longstreet marched all night and until about noon on the 22d, when we bivouacked on the south side of the North Hanover about 30 miles from the camps we had left, and within a mile of the junction. Hill, who had now returned to duty, crossed the North Anna about 10 miles above us on the 22d, and moved down next morning. The Leo set for Lee had failed of its object. To make the effort, Hancock had been sent by a route about nine miles longer than the most direct from Grant's left to Hanover Junction, which was only 25 miles, and three miles shorter than Lee's shortest. Having the additional advantage of the initiative, it was doubtless an error on Grant's part to undertake it. On the 22d, it was learned that all three of Lee's corps had passed the night before, and the Federal Corps were now all directed to follow. At Hanover Junction, Lee received his first reinforcements, about 9,000 men. On May 15, Breckenridge had severely defeated Sigel at New Market, in the valley, and driven him south of Cedar Creek, allowing Lee to bring down Breckenridge with two brigades of infantry, about 2,500 men. Bregard, on May 16, had also defeated Butler at Drury's Bluff, allowing Lee to send for Pickett's division, about 5,000 men. Hoke's brigade, about 1,200 strong, was also brought from Petersburg and assigned to Early's division. Gordon was promoted and assigned to the remnant of Johnson's division, to which also his own brigade under Evans was now transferred from Early. We had taken position behind the North Anna but had not yet selected a line of battle or started any entrenchments, when early in the afternoon, the enemy appeared north of the river, and opened fire with artillery upon two slight bridgehead works at the north ends of the railroad bridge and the telegraph road bridge, which had been constructed to repel raiders a year before. We brought up guns and replied, but ravines on the north side allowed covered approaches to both bridgeheads, and both were captured with some prisoners. We held, however, the south end of the railroad bridge, until after dark, 
and Bernard Dot Hancock's corps had approached along the railroad and the telegraph road. Burnside's corps, next on his right, was directed on the Oxford, a crossing about two miles above the railroad. The Fifth Corps came to the river at Jericho Mills, four miles above the railroad, and, finding no enemy opposing, a pontoon bridge was laid and the whole corps was crossed by 4.30 p.m. Meanwhile, at Oxford, Burnside had found the south bank held in such force that it was not deemed prudent to attack. The Sixth Corps was held in reserve on the north bank. Finding himself at Jericho Mills in the vicinity of Hill's Corps, Warren had formed line of battle in very favorable position. He was able to cover his front with the edge of a wood concealing his actual line. His left rested on the river, which made a large concave bend in his rear and again drew near his right, with open ground upon that flank commanded by the artillery. But the rare opportunity of an isolated corps unentrenched was here offered, and Hill hastened to attack it. About 6 p.m., he fell upon Griffin in the center, and Cutler on the right, who had not fully formed their lines. Cutler was broken and pursued, but the artillery on that flank was able to save the situation and Hill was finally repulsed. The casualties were about equal, perhaps 1,500 on each side. During the night, Lee had selected and entrenched an excellent line, in fact, it was too good, for it defeated its object, as the enemy never dared to attack. It rested on the river from a half mile above the bridge to the Oxford, and thence, leaving the North Anna, it ran across the narrow peninsula one and a half miles to Little River, where its left rested. Returning to the center, on the North Anna above the bridge, the line ran southeast across a large bend of the river and rested on its right three miles below, near the site of Morris's bridge. In front of us, the enemy formed with the 5th and 6th Corps before our left flank, and with the 2D and part of the 9th before our right flank. Their two wings, both south of the river, were unable to communicate without crossing the river twice. This peculiar situation could not fail to suggest unusual opportunities to each commander. Burnside was first ordered to attack and carry Ox Ford, which would at once unite their wings and divide ours. But Burnside pronounced the task impossible, and did not attempt it. Hancock on his left, and Warren on his right, each advanced skirmishes and felt our lines, but both reported against any attack. Lee, at this time, happened to be very much indisposed and confined to his tent. But he was exceedingly anxious, with the reinforcements which he had received, to improve the slightest opportunity to give Grant a severe blow. This seemed rare occasion where he might fall upon Hancock's and Potter's division of the 9th before they could be assisted by the other corps. He said to his staff, We must strike them. We must never let them pass us again. But it happened that the country occupied by the Federal lines upon both flanks, and especially on their left, was flat and open, allowing full use of their artillery, and their entrenchments were very strong. Probably it was wisely held by our subordinates that no successful attack could be made, and at night on May 26, Grant removed the temptation. Here Lee had recovered from his illness, by moving for the Power Monkey. Dot on May 24, Sheridan had rejoined from his expedition to the James, on which he had done some damage to the two railroads, entering Richmond from the north, and burned some rolling stock and stores, but had made no impression on the campaign. I think it quite probable, however, that had Sheridan's cavalry been with the army, Grant would not have tried his vain stratagem of placing Hancock as a lure at Milford, but, with his aid, have endeavored to anticipate us at Hanover Junction. So I think this raid should be classed as a blunder, like Pleasanton's at Chancellorsville and Stuart's at Gettysburg. Our most serious loss in connection with it had been the death of our brilliant cavalry leader, Major Gen. J. E. B. Stuart, who was killed at Yellow Tavern near Richmond, on May 11. As before said, I have always believed that Lee should have made him the successor of Stonewall Jackson when the latter was killed at Chancellorsville. Grant's total casualties in the North Anna lines, 
May 23 to R given as colon killed 22, wounded 1460, missing 290, total 1973. The Confederate losses were probably about the same. On the 26th, Grant, at noon, started Sheridan and the pontoon trains to cross the Pamunkey River at Hanover Town. After dark the infantry moved, and by next morning his whole army had vanished, except cavalry pickets at the sites where the bridges had stood. The movement of the enemy was not discovered until the morning of the 27th. The rough sketch map represents the essentials of the position. The army was put in motion without delay, crossing the South Anna on the railroad bridges and, after a march of 15 miles, we encamped that night near Half Sink. The next morning, we moved about 13 miles and found ourselves near the Totopotomoy, with Grant just arriving on the opposite side. Sheridan's cavalry was in his front, and under orders to make a demonstration toward Richmond. Hampton, with his own and Fitzley's divisions, and Butler's brigade of cavalry, recently arrived from S.C., were attacked by Gregg's and Torbert's divisions, with Merritt's reserve brigade at Hall's shop. The battle was fiercely contested all day, but the enemy had the great advantage of the Spencer magazine carbine, and, late in the afternoon, they drove Hampton back. Ewell's health at this time required him to surrender the command of his corps permanently to Early, who was succeeded by Rams promoted. On Sunday, the 29th, Grant ordered the 6th, 2d, and 5th Corps, in that order from his right to left to reconnoiter in their fronts and locate our lines, the 9th Corps being held in reserve. The 6th Corps found only the cavalry on our left flank. The other two found our pickets on the Totopotomoy, and, at an average distance of a thousand yards behind, our line was rapidly entrenching. Some sharp skirmishing occurred during the next three days the enemy crossing the Totopotomoy and entrenching opposite to us. In many of the federal accounts, it is assumed that Lee's attitude at this period was strictly the defensive. Perhaps it should have been, but all who were near him recognized that never in the war was he so ready to attack upon the slightest opportunity. An instance occurred on May 30, of which I was a spectator. A half mile in front of our line we could see Bethesda Church, an important junction point, well within the enemy's territory, and sure to be included within his lines, rapidly being extended to his left. Down a long, straight road, we had seen their cavalry all the morning, and, about noon, a brigade of infantry appeared. Immediately, Lee ordered Early to send a brigade to attack it. Early selected Pegram's brigade, commanded by General Edward Willis, a brilliant young officer, just promoted from the 12th Georgia, who had been a cadet at West Point at the beginning of the war. He had been a personal friend and I saw his brigade start on its errand with apprehension of disaster, for it was evident that a hornet's nest would be stirred up. The Federal Brigade was quickly routed and pursued, but the pursuers soon encountered a division with its artillery and were repulsed with severe loss. It had made a resolute attack, as stated by Humphreys, and lost Willis and two of his colonels. Killed. Meanwhile, Butler having been defeated, and, as said by Grant, bottled at Bermuda Hundreds, Grant decided to draw from him two divisions of the 10th and one of the 18th Corps, under command of W. H. Smith, with which to give Lee a surprise. The orders had been given on May 22, the troops to be brought by Walter down the James and up the York. On May 30, the transports bearing them began to arrive at the White House and to disembark about 16,000 infantry, whose coming was not known to Lee. But he, having the reinforcements which joined him at Hanover Junction, about 9,000, and receiving now Hook's division, which had come over from Drury's Bluff, about 6,000, and being disappointed at Grant's failure to attack his lines on the Totopotomoy, had himself planned a grand stroke for June 1st. The cavalry of the two armies had been heavily engaged for two days near Cold Harbor, and Hoke's division was in that neighborhood. Lee proposed to extend Longstreet's corps to join it, and, attacking early, to sweep to his left behind Grant's lines, taking them in flank, while Hill and Ewell pressed them in front. 
he did not even yet suspect the presence of Smith's troops, and it was with high hopes of a great victory on the first that Longstreet's corps, under Anderson, with all its artillery, marched to the vicinity of Cold Harbor. During the night of May 31, Grant had, meanwhile, determined to send two corps to seize Cold Harbor on the first. Talbot, the evening before, with his dismounted troopers and magazine carbines, had repulsed a severe attack by Fitz Lee, but, anticipating attack by Hook's infantry in the morning, he had begun to withdraw during the night. He received orders, however, to hold the position at all hazards, on which he returned, and devoted the night to entrenching his position. The Sixth Corps, from the extreme Federal right, was put in motion that night for Cold Harbor, having about fifteen miles to go. Smith, with ten thousand men and sixteen guns, already on the march from White House to join Grant, had also been ordered during the night to Cold Harbor. A mistake in the order took him first to Newcastle Ferry on the Panmunkey, and it was only at 4 p.m. of the first that he joined at Cold Harbor the Sixth Corps the head of which had reached the ground about 10 a.m. after a fatiguing all-night march. It is plain, then, that here a rare opportunity had been offered the Confederates. With Hoke's large division on its right flank, Longstreet's corps should have been able to quickly clear the way of three brigades of cavalry. It would have had then the opportunity to meet the 6th Corps scattered along the road for many miles and in an exhausted condition. Unfortunately, Hoke's brigade had not been put under Anderson's command, so neither felt full responsibility. It only formed in line, but did not attack the cavalry breastworks, reporting them as too strong. Kershaw made an attack about 6 a.m., but only put into it two brigades. The enemy, with their magazine carbines behind entrenchments, repulsed two assaults with severe loss, and then the turning enterprise was abandoned. Lee was not upon the ground in the early hours of the day, and Longstreet was absent, wounded. No effort worthy the name was used to carry out Lee's plan of attack, nor were the favorable conditions appreciated, although they might have been, as only cavalry was found in our front. Hook's division should have been used to turn their flank and get among their dismounts. While Kershaw made his attack, the remainder of the long column halted in the road expecting the march to be presently resumed. But when the delay was prolonged, and a few random bullets from the front began to reach the line, without any general instructions, the men here and there began to dig dirt with their bayonets and pile it with their tin cups to get a little cover. Others followed suit, and gradually the whole column was at work entrenching the line along which they had halted. Gradually it became known that the enemy were accumulating in our front, and then, as the country was generally flat, orders were given to close up the column and adopt its line as the line of battle, distributing our guns upon it at suitable points. Our entrenchments were scarcely more than a good beginning, a line of knee-deep trench with the earth thrown in front. It was entirely without a battus or obstruction in front except at a point on our picket line where a small entanglement had been left by our cavalry. Meanwhile, Grant, under the mistaken idea that Lee was afraid to fight in the open, was urging an early attack before Lee had time to fortify. But it was 1 p.m. before the whole of the 6th Corps was up, and it was 6 p.m. before Smith's command was in position. In the 6th Corps, each brigade was formed in column of regiments with the brigade on the extreme left refused. The 18th Corps was formed in columns of brigades, with the extreme right refused. So the columns of the 18th were three ranks deep, and those of the 6th averaged four. The Confederate formation was but a single rank behind their breastwork, which, as has been described, was the work of but a few hours, almost without entrenching tools. There was also in it a gap of something over fifty yards, where a wooded and tangled ravine and small stream separated Hooks and Gershaw's divisions. A rough sketch will illustrate colon the distance between the lines was about 1,400 yards, and our pickets were about 300 yards in our front. About 6 p.m., we had ceased to expect an attack that evening when a sudden increase of fear on the picket line and the opening of artillery stopped our digging and called call to arms. 
Soon a perfect tornado of feeks broke out in front of Hoke and Gershaw, and extended, but not heavily, to Pickett's front. It soon appeared that at all points but one the enemy's advance had been checked by our fire, without its reaching our line of battle. This was at the fifty-yard gap which had been carelessly left between Hoke and Kershaw. Here a body of wood, fronting on our line for about two hundred yards, extended quite a distance toward the enemy, allowing their approach free from observation, until they had actually passed through the gap and were in our rear. This they did in such numbers that they were able to turn to the right and left and possess themselves of a small portion on each flank, capturing a few hundred prisoners. As there were no reserves, Hunton's brigade from Pickett's division, and Gregg's from Fields, war hurried to the spot and checked the enemy, recovered the portion taken from Hoke, and connected the broken ends by a horseshoe some two hundred yards in length. At all other points the enemy stopped at what was practically our picket line and entrenched themselves. Darkness put an end to the fighting. The Federal loss was about 2,650. The Confederate was evidently less, as the enemy only came to close quarters near the gap in the line. Grant felt encouraged by his partial success, and, believing that he had inserted the small end of a wedge, prepared to drive it home. Lee was practically fighting with a river at his back. It was only the Chickahominy, but could his army be routed, Grant could surely inflict severe losses upon it before Lee could retreat over the few available roads. The 2D Corps, on Grant's right, was ordered during the night to march around 9th and 5th and reinforce the 6th, which was ordered to the attack at dawn. But it was the dark of the moon, and the night march proved slow and exhausting, the 18th Corps was also short of ammunition, so the attack was postponed, at first until 5 p.m. The 5th Corps, on June 2nd, was ordered to draw in its right flank, and extend its left past the front, of fields and pickets, to unite, with Smith, and the 9th Corps was ordered to be massed in rear of the 5th and to support it in the general attack. This was now again postponed until 4.30 a.m on the 3d, to allow a full night's rest and ample preparation. Lee, meanwhile, was no less busy. When he found in the morning that the 2d corps had gone from his front, he had no doubt of its destination, and marching Breckenridge's, Wilcox's, and Muon's divisions past our rear, he extended Hoke's line to the Chickahominy. He also sent Fitz Lee's division of cavalry across the river to observe and picket the south side. Early, he directed to cross the lines which had been deserted by the 2d corps and to sweep down to the right on the flank of the 5th. This movement captured the skirmish line of the 9th corps which had marched off not long before, and some of that of the 5th which was being shifted to its left, but by that time Warren had changed front to oppose it and received assistance from the 9th corps, and Early's advance was checked. The fighting lasted until night, and Gen. Doles of Rhodes's division, a very valuable officer, was killed. Had Early had enough men to give his movement force, it might have had important results. On our front, the sharpshooting and artillery practice were incessant. In fact, as a diversion in favor of Early, I was ordered to be aggressive with the artillery, and on Field's line, Huger's battalion was put out in front of the works to get enfilading fires. In front of Pickett and Gershaw, the enemy's entrenchments were within good range and their accuracy of fire was such as to disable gun carriages through the embrasures by cutting their spokes. A Napoleon gun of Cabell's was placed in a pit at the end of Kershaw's line, where it was broken the night before, ammunition for it being passed up by hand along the line for several hundred yards. The country was so flat that at few points could the line be safely approached from the rear. A better horseshoe connection around the gap between Kershaw and Hook was built to replace the temporary one of the night before, and our entrenchments everywhere got all the work we were able to put upon them, but were still quite imperfect. Grant received today a reinforcement of 3,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry under Gen. Cezan Ola, from Port Royal. They were sent to join Wilson's cavalry upon our left, and were ordered to join in the attack upon early next morning in flank and rear, 
while Warren and Burnside attacked in front. No long description of this carefully planned battle is necessary. Of course, it came off punctually to the minute. For among Grant's great and rare qualities was his ability to make his battles keep their scheduled times. One may almost say also, of course, we repulsed him everywhere. For it was still true, as Stonewall Jackson had said of the Army of Northern Virginia, we sometimes fail to drive the enemy from positions. They always failed to drive us. In that respect our army singularly resembled the famous one horse shay. We held together wonderfully until all our parts, worn out together, failed together at Appomattox. Naturally, as the attack had been on the largest possible scale, the repulse was unusually severe and bloody, and the roar of the battle, while it lasted, probably exceeded even that of the combats in the wilderness, which Humphreys described as often approaching the sublime. It broke forth, mingled with vast cheering, in the stillness of early dawn, but it was no surprise. For over an hour the men in the trenches had been alert at hearing in front muffled commands and smothered movements. The Napoleon of Cabells in the pit at the end of Kershaw's broken line, which had been supplied with ammunition the day before by passing it from hand to hand along the line, was to be withdrawn to the angle where the new horseshoe joined our old line, and the trench in front of its new position was abandoned. The necessary work was only finished at the approach of dawn, and, in whispers, the gunners and infantry supports rolled it back by hand, leaving the trench empty behind them. It was safely located at the embrasure prepared for it, enfilading the deserted trench, and double-shotted with canister, but a few minutes before the cheering enemy, who here had not one hundred yards to advance through thin woods, swarmed over the parapet to find the trench deserted, into which they leapt and to receive the double canister and the musketry and artillery of the new line as they paused wondering at our disappearance. The sound of the battle reached Richmond, and men came out on the streets to listen to it. Some houses were prepared for an unusual influx of wounded, but few came. Richmond listened calmly for it had confidence in the one horse shade. The brunt of the action lasted about an hour, though at isolated places attacks were renewed, or more or less distant fire was kept up until afternoon. As a general thing, the assaults were checked at about fifty yards from our lines, but at two or three points leading officers were killed on or very near our parapets. At one point only was our parapet carried. There a hurried location in front of Barlow's division permitted him to approach, under complete shelter from fire of our line of battle, within seventy-five yards. Here a rush captured three guns and some few hundred prisoners, but Finnegan's brigade soon recaptured the guns and drove out the enemy. Grant had authorized Meade, about 7 a.m., to discontinue all assaults which seemed unpromising but Meade continued to urge renewed efforts until 1.30 p.m. Each of the principal corps complained repeatedly of crossfires of artillery which swept through the ranks from the right of Smith to the left of Hancock, as reported by Humphreys. Again he states, the assault of the 2D corps could not be renewed unless the enemy's enfilading artillery fire could be silenced. Of the 6th Corps he writes, during all this time, besides the direct fire, there was an enfilade artillery fire that swept through the ranks from the right to the left. And of the 18th Corps, the fire from the right came from a part of the enemy's works against which no part of our attack was directed, and Gen. Smith was unable to keep it down with his artillery. The artillery so complained of was mostly Huger's battalion of 24 guns, which held the line between pickets and fields divisions and was, some of it, used in front of the breastworks. Swinton narrates that some hours after the failure of the first assault, Meade sent instructions to each corps commander to renew the attack without reference to the troops on his right or left, that the order descended through the wonted channels, but was not obeyed. The immobile lines pronounced a verdict against further slaughter. As so told, an entirely erroneous impression is here created. No such silent defiance of orders occurred or anything like it. But there were, doubtless, in the situation described above, 
occasions when there was delay in obedience until artillery could be sent to suppress the hostile guns. This might be distorted in the telling and so originate such stories. At dusk, heavy firing of musketry and artillery broke out at two or three points, and presently died away. Each side believed it had been attacked and had repulsed an assault. The actual fact was that each was putting out pickets for the night and had drawn the others fear in false alarm. I have not mentioned them before, but, throughout the campaign, whenever the lines were close together, there was likely to be heavy firing of musketry and artillery breaking out in the night, which was afterward reported to be a night attack repulsed. Every one of them upon both sides was but a false alarm. The only actual night attack of the war of which I know was the Battle of Warhatchee near Chattanooga, October 28, 63. The federal casualties are given for June the 1st to the 3rd as 9,948. As the losses on the 1st were approximately estimated at 2,650, those on the 3D were approximately 7,300. The loss of officers killed and wounded was particularly heavy. The total casualties of the campaign since crossing the Pamunkey were 14,129. The Confederate losses on the 3D were never reported, but are known to have been small. The Confederate medical and surgical history of the war gives 1,200 wounded and 500 missing from June 1st to 12. This, Humphrey's estimates, represents about 1,500 killed and wounded, which may be taken as a maximum. Besides the general officers already mentioned as having been killed and wounded during the campaign, there were also wounded Gen. Kirkland of Heth's division and Lane of Wilcox's. Also, on the 3d of June, were wounded Law of Fields Division and Finnegan of Muon apostrophe s. The now ensued on Grant's part several days of indecision, while he debated what to do next. Meanwhile, to keep up appearances, regular approaches were suggested in the orders, and, at one point in our front, they broke ground at night a short distance in front of their line of battle and attempted the construction of a battery. Having no Cohorn mortars, we improvised mortar fire with howitzers, and the battery was never completed. But, during this whole interval, a terrible fire of sharpshooters was maintained upon both sides, which made life in our cramped and insufficient trenches almost unsupportable. Scarcely anywhere in them could one stand erect without being exposed to a sharpshooter. Headlogs and loopholes built up of sandbags on the parapets gave accuracy to the fire. By watching, all the low points on the enemy's line, where men would be exposed in moving about, soon became known. The sharpshooters would then lie with guns already aimed, ready to draw the trigger at the slightest glimpse. To shield themselves from the midsummer sun, our men were accustomed to invert their muskets, sticking the bayonets in the ground, and letting the hammers of four guns pinch the four corners of a blanket, under which the four men might crowd and get some shelter from the direct midday blaze. To visit the guns scattered all along the lines, one must crouch under the blankets and step over the men, who, in the summer of 1864, were far from being free of insect pests. Points where one could get out to the rear were fully a half mile apart, and between brigades and regiments there would often be a gap of a few feet or a few yards which the enemy's sharpshooters were usually watching with their fingers on the triggers. In the Federal lines their entrenchments were deeper and broader, and with abundant zigzag approaches from the rear. Their force was ample to permit frequent reliefs, while we had none. Yet they suffered proportionately. Gibbon's single division reported 280 officers and men killed and wounded by sharpshooters between the 3d of June and the 12th. Humphreys thus describes the conditions in the Federal Army, which had both men and supplies in profusion, the labor in making the approaches and strengthening the entrenchments was hard. The men in the advance part of the lines, which were some miles in length, had to lie close in narrow trenches, with no water, except a little to drink, and that of the worst kind, being from surface drainage. They were exposed to great heat during the day, they had but little sleep, their cooking was of the rudest character. For over a month the army had had no vegetables. 
dead mules and horses and offal were scattered all over the country, and between the lines were dead bodies of both parties lying unburied in a burning sun. The country was low and marshy in character. The exhausting effect of all this began to show itself, and sickness of malarial character increased largely. Every effort was made to correct this. Large quantities of vegetables were brought up to the army, and a more stringent police enforced. Meanwhile, Lee made two efforts to take the offensive against Grant's right flank and rear. On the 6th, he sent early on the north of Matadkin Creek, and on the 7th he made an attempt south of the same. In each case swamps were found intervening, which prevented anything being accomplished. A few days after the battle, while Grant was still in his state of indecision and the make-believe of siege operations was going on, Halleck suggested to him the investment of Richmond on the north bank of the James. It was seriously considered, as offering greater security to Washington, but finally rejected. On June 5, Hunter, in the valley, who had succeeded Milroy, defeated Jones, who had succeeded Breckenridge. As soon as Lee learned of this, he ordered Breckenridge to return and take with him the troops he had brought to Lee at Hanover Junction. On June 12, he took the bold move of detaching Early's whole corps and sending it to the valley, by way of Charlottesville. It was ordered to attack Hunter in rear, and, having disposed of him and united with Breckenridge, to move down the valley, cross the Potomac, and threaten Washington. It is probable that in deciding upon this line of strategy, Lee was influenced by hopes that strong demonstrations against Washington might recall Grant's army for its protection, as had so often happened before. If so, however, the hope now proved vain. Grant's force proved ample to detach enough to protect Washington and still prosecute his campaign before Petersburg. If Early could be spared. It might have been wiser to have sent him to Johnston's army in Gadot Chaptik's movement against Petersburg the crisis of the war. High price of gold. Difficulty of recruiting in the north. Grant crosses the James and moves on Petersburg. Hancock's corps delayed. Movements of Lee. Brigade's defense. Fighting of June 16th and 18th. Success of Grant's strategy. It is now time to describe Grant's movement against Petersburg, which, I think, more than any battle or other incident, constituted what may be called the crisis of the war. Possibly the South never had any real chance of success from the first, and the actual crisis was passed when she fired the first gun. But, though the North was immensely her superior in all the resources of war, the South was able to win many hard-fought battles, and her armies to cherish the hope, as year after year elapsed, that the desperation of her resistance might exact such a price in blood and treasure as would exhaust the enthusiasm of her adversary. Certainly, at no other period was there such depression among the people at home, in the army, in the field, or among the officials of the government in Washington. The expenses of the war were nearly $4 million a day. Gold was at a high premium and advancing rapidly. It went from 168 in May to 285 in July. The following table shows the fluctuations for each month of 1864. Colon enlisting had almost ceased, although stimulated by enormous bounties. $1,000 per man was the ordinary price, and single regiments would sometimes take from their counties 1,000 men and draw a million dollars in bounties the day of their muster. There was growing bitterness in political circles in view of the approaching presidential election. The terrible lists of casualties in battle were daily bringing mourning and distress to every hamlet in the country. Swinton, p. 494, writes of this period as follows, War is sustained quite as much by the moral energy of a people as by its material resources and the former must be active to bring out and make available the latter. For armies are things visible and formal, circumscribed by time and space, but the soul of war is a power unseen, bound up with the interests, convictions, passions of men. Now so gloomy was the outlook after the action on the Chickahominy, and to such a degree, by consequence, had the public mind become relaxed, 
that there was at this time great danger of a collapse of the war. One had not success come elsewhere to brighten the horizon, it would have been difficult to have raised new forces to recruit the Army of the Potomac, which, shaken in its structure, its valor quenched in blood, and thousands of its ablest officers killed and wounded, was the Army of the Potomac no more. It was under these circumstances that Grant made his first move after the week of indecision which followed the Battle of Cold Harbor. The most natural movement, and the one which Lee expected, was that he would merely cross the Chickahominy and take position on the north bank of the James at Malvern Hill, adjoining Butler on the south bank at Bermuda Hundreds. This would unite the two armies at the nearest point to Richmond, and they would have the aid of the monitors on the river in a direct advance. But Grant determined to cross the James at Wilcox's Landing, ten miles below City Point, and entirely out of Lee's observation, and to move thence directly upon Petersburg with his whole army. He would thus pass in rear of Butler and attack the extreme right flank of the Confederate line, which, it was certain, would now be held by only a small force. It involved the performance of a feat in transportation which had never been equaled, and might well be considered impossible, without days of delay. It was all accomplished, as will be seen, without mishap, and in such an incredibly short time that Lee refused for three days to believe it. During these three days, June 15th, 16th, and 17th, Grant's whole army was arriving at and attacking Petersburg which was defended at first only by Brigade with about 2,500 men. Lee, with long streets and hills corps, for the same three days, lay idle in the woods on the north side, only replacing some of Brigade's troops taken to Petersburg from in front of Butler. But for this, Longstreet's corps might have manned the entrenchments of Petersburg, when Grant's troops first appeared before them and it is not too much to claim that his defeat would have been not less bloody and disastrous than was the one at Cold Harbor. For, while the entrenchments at Cold Harbor were the poorest and slightest in which we ever fought, the Petersburg lines had been built a year before, and were of the best character, with some guns at position mounted and all the forest in front cleared away to give range to the artillery. This, then, was really the nearest approach to a crisis which occurred during the war, as will more fully appear as we follow the details. Instead of success elsewhere, Grant here escaped a second defeat more bloody and more overwhelming than any preceding. Thus the last, and perhaps the best, chances of Confederate success were not lost in the repulse at Gettysburg, nor in any combat of arms. They were lost during three days of lying in camp, believing that Grant was hemmed in by the broad part of the James below City Point and had nowhere to go but to come and attack us. The entire credit for the strategy belongs, I believe, to Grant, though possibly it may be shared by Meade's chief of staff, Humphreys, whose modest narrative makes no reference to the subject. On Saturday, June 11, the V Corps was moved down the Chickahominy, about ten miles to the vicinity of Bottoms Bridge. The next night it crossed on two pontoon bridges, and, Inclining to the right, it took position east of Riddle's shop, where it entrenched to cover the passage of the other corps. All of the other corps moved at the same time. The 2D corps crossed at the same bridge and marched to Wilcox Landing on the James. The 6th and 9th corps crossed the Chickahominy at Jones's bridge and marched to the same place. The 18th corps, under Smith, was sent back to the White House, where it took transports for City Point and was landed the night of the 14th. Here it was joined by Coutts's cavalry, about 2,400 strong, and by Hink's colored division, 3,700, making in all about 16,000 men, who were ordered to march at dawn on the 15th for Petersburg, about 8 miles, which they were to attack. Here we may leave them for a while. Hancock's 2D Corps reached Wilcox's landing at 6 p.m. on Monday, the 13th, after an all-night march of about 30 miles. The 5th Corps, under Warren, held its position covering the passage of other corps until night of the 13th, when it followed Hancock and reached Wilcox's landing the next noon. The cavalry and infantry had had some sharp skirmishing, 
and reported their casualties as 300 killed and wounded. The 6th and 9th Corps, whose marches had been from 5 to 10 miles longer than Hancock's, arrived in the afternoon of the 14th. During the 14th, the transports, which had brought the 18th Corps around from the White House to City Point, were employed in ferrying Hancock across the James. By the morning of the 15th, his whole corps was across, with most of its artillery, and at 10.30 a.m., it set out for Petersburg, following Smith who had gone from City Point for the same destination about sunrise. Hancock had about 20,000 men, and about 16 miles to go. All the complicated movements involved in this maneuver, and in the capture of Petersburg at which it was aimed, had been as usual well thought out and covered in the orders and instructions to the different commanders, with a single exception. This exception was very serious in its results, as it postponed the capture of Petersburg for over nine months. It had its rise in the division of command and responsibility between the cooperating armies. This, in its turn, had arisen from the political necessity of placing Butler in command of the Army of the James. Smith's corps was a part of that army, and Grant, feeling that secrecy was essential to success, visited Butler on the 14th, and at his quarters prepared the orders for Smith's advance and attack on Petersburg the next day. When he returned to the Army of the Potomac, he failed to notify Meade of the hour of Smith's march, and other details, and Meade, of course, did not inform Hancock. It resulted that Hancock was not ordered to march until 10.30 a.m., when he might just as easily have marched at sunrise, and he was directed by a route an hour or two longer than one he might have used. Finally, he came upon the field at Petersburg after dark, when he might have arrived in time to unite in Smith's assault. Meanwhile, the 5th, 6th, and 9th Corps on the banks of the James, awaited the construction of the greatest bridge which the world has seen since the days of Xerxes. At the point selected, the river was 2,100 feet wide, 90 feet deep, and had a rise and fall of tide of 4 feet, giving very strong currents. A draw was necessary for the passage of vessels. The approaches having been prepared on each side, construction was begun at 4 p.m. on the 14th, by Major Dween simultaneously at both ends. In eight hours the bridge was finished, and the artillery and trains of the 9th, 5th, and 6th Corps began to cross in the order named, that being the order in which the Corps would follow. For 48 hours, without cessation, the column poured across, and at midnight on the 16th Grant's entire army was south of the James. Let us now turn to Lee. On the morning of the 13th, finding the enemy gone, he at once put his army in motion, crossed the Chickahominy, and that afternoon took position between White Oak Swamp and Malvern Hill. Hoke's division went on to Drury's Bluff. His cavalry came in contact with Wilson's cavalry, and also with Warren's infantry, which had entrenched itself on the Long Bridge Road not far in front of his position. Some sharp skirmishing took place, as shown by Warren's report of 300 casualties. The presence of Warren was taken as assurance that Grant's army was about to advance on the north side of the James, and Warren's withdrawal at dark, discovered the next day, was supposed to mean only a drawing nearer to Butler's position, where the narrowness of the river would permit the easy establishment of pontoon bridges. On the 14th, a staff officer of Bregard's came over from Petersburg to lay before Lee the defenseless position of that city, and to beg for reinforcements. Lee consented that Bregard should take Hoke's division, which had already gone to Drury's Bluff, but would not consent to weaken Longstreet or Hill, who were near Riddle's shop. Hoke was accordingly started for Petersburg early on the 15th, with 18 miles to go. His leading brigade, Hagoods, was picked up by railroad trains and reached Petersburg about sunset, the rest of the division arriving about 9 p.m. until Hoke came. The whole force at Petersburg consisted of Wise's brigade of infantry not more than 1,200 strong, two small regiments of cavalry under Deering. Some light artillery with 22 pieces. 
besides a few men manning three or four heavy guns in position. One besides these, there were some old men and boys, called local reserves, who on June 9th under Col. F. 2. Archer, a veteran of Mexico, and Gen. R. E. Colston, disabled at Chaneylesville, had acted with great gallantry in repelling a raid by Count's cavalry. The total gross of all arms is given as 2,738. After Bregard's staff officer had left him, Lee gave orders to our corps to march the next morning, the 15th, to Drury's Bluff. About sunrise, we broke camps and took the road, but there was a demonstration of the enemy's cavalry about Malvern Hill and we were halted to learn what it meant. About midday, the report came that the enemy had fallen back but our march was not resumed, and we later returned to our bivouacs. On the 16th, the 1st Corps headquarters, with pickets and fields divisions, were hurried across the pontoon bridge at Drury's Bluff and down to the Bermuda Hundreds lines, which had been held by Bushra Johnson's division, but had been abandoned the night of the 15th when Bregard had withdrawn it for the defense of Petersburg. Kershaw's division followed us only as far as Drury's Bluff, and was halted there. We reached the ground in time to drive off one of Butler's brigades which had come out to the railroad and begun to tear it up. We drove this brigade back very nearly into their original lines, and, on the next afternoon, the 17th, a charge of Pickett's division entirely regained our lines which had been abandoned by Bushra Johnson. During these three days, the 15th, 16th, and 17th, Bregard, while defending Petersburg, with great skill and tenacity, had repeatedly reported to Lee the arrival of Grant's army at Petersburg, and begged for reinforcements. Lee's replies were as follows, June 16, 10th.30 am I do not know the position of Grant's army and cannot strip the north bank of troops. June 17, 12th am until I can get more definite information of Grant's movements. I do not think it prudent to draw more troops to this side of the river. On this day, Grant's entire force being now on the field, his attacks were urged with increasing vigor, and at 6.40 p.m. Bregard telegraphed Lee as follows, the increasing number of the enemy in my front, an inadequacy of my force to defend the already too much extended lines, will compel me to fall back within a shorter one, which I will attempt tonight. This I shall hold as long as practicable, but, without reinforcements, I may have to evacuate the city very shortly. In that event I shall retire in the direction of Drury's Bluff, defending the crossing of Appomattox River and Swift Creek. After the receipt of this dispatch, Kershaw's division was ordered to proceed during the night to Bermuda Hundreds, and a little later the order was extended to continue the march to Petersburg. The fighting on Bregard's lines lasted until nearly midnight. But when it was over, and the transfer of his troops to their new line was fairly underway, he began to take more radical measures to convince Lee of the situation. He sent three of his staff, one after the other, within two hours, with details about the prisoners captured from different corps of the Federal Army, with the stories told by each of their marches since leaving Cold Harbor on the 12th. The first messenger was Bregard's aide, Col. Chisholm, who interviewed Lee, lying on the ground in his tent near Drury's Bluff, between 1 and 2 a.m. on the 18th. Lee seemed very placid and heard many messages, but still said he thought Bregard was mistaken in supposing that any large part of Grant's army had crossed the river. He said also that Gershaw's division was already under orders to Petersburg, and he promised to come over in the morning. Chiselm was soon followed by Colonel Alfred Roman, but he had to leave his messages, as Lee's staff would not disturb him again. About 3 a.m., Major Giles B. Cook arrived and insisted upon an interview. He brought further statements by prisoners which, laid before Lee, thoroughly satisfied him that Grant's army had now been across the James for over 48 hours. The following telegrams, which were immediately sent, will indicate his change of view. June 18, 3.30 AM Superintendent R. and P. R. Arkin trains run to Petersburg. If so, 
send all cars available to Rice's turnout. If they cannot run through, can any be sent from Petersburg to the point where the road is broken? It is important to get troops to Petersburg without delay. To Gen. Early, Lynchburg. Grant is in front of Petersburg. Will be opposed there. Strike as quick as you can. If circumstances authorize, carry out the original plan or move upon Petersburg without delay. At the same time, orders were sent Anderson for Fields Division and the Corps Headquarters and Artillery to follow Kershaw's division into Petersburg. Kershaw arrived there about 7.30 a.m., the rest of us about 9. We must now return to Smith's Column, which we saw start to Petersburg, about 16,000 strong, at daylight on the 15th, with about 8 miles to go, 2,500 of the command being cavalry, 3,700 of them colored troops. Brigade awaits them in the lines of Petersburg which encircle the city about two miles out, from the river above to the river below, a development of about ten miles. The entrenchments had no abatis or obstructions in front and consisted only of a small outside ditch and a parapet, with platforms and embrasures for guns at suitable intervals. As Brigade expected Hoke's division about dark, every moment of delay was valuable. To prolong it, he used the old device of sending forward a regiment of cavalry and a battery. These delayed the approach for about three hours, at the expense of a gun captured. The march was then resumed, and about 9 a.m. the head of the column came to the zone of felled forest in front of the entrenchments. Brigade, fortunately, had a good supply of guns and ammunition which he used freely in preventing the enemy from establishing his batteries or moving his troops within sight, and it was 1.30 p.m. when the column was deployed. Smith had still to make his reconnaissance, and this occupied him until 5 p.m. But it had been efficiently made, for he learned that our infantry was stretched out in a very thin line, and it led him to decide that his charge should be made, not with a column, but with clouds of skirmishers. Another hour was taken to form the troops, and at 6 p.m. all would have been ready, but it was now found that the chief of artillery had sent all the horses to water and it required an hour to get them back. Tall oaks from little acorns grow. By such small and accidental happenings does fate decide battles. Petersburg was lost and won by that hour. At 7 p.m., the guns returned and opened a severe fire, to which the Confederate guns did not reply, reserving their fire for the columns which they expected to see. These never appeared, but instead, the cloud of skirmishers overran the works and captured the guns still loaded with double canister and defended by only a skirmish line of infantry. Hink's colored division, which made the charge, lost 507 killed and wounded from the fire of the skirmishers. It captured four guns and 250 prisoners. Lines of battle followed, and by 9 p.m. occupied about one and a half miles of entrenchment from ridden number 7 to number 11, inclusive, counting from the river below, getting possession of 16 guns. Hancock's corps had arrived on the ground during the action, and, when it was over, at Smith's request it relieved his troops. Smith had been informed of the approach of reinforcements to both sides, and he thought it wiser to hold what he had, than to venture more and risk disaster. Kautz's cavalry had been kept beyond the entrenchments all day by Deering's cavalry and a few guns, which fired from the riddens in the vicinity of number 28. About 6 p.m., hearing no sounds of battle from Smith, Kautz withdrew, with a loss of 43 men, and went into bivouac. After the fighting began, Brigade had recognized that he would need every available man to defend the city and he ordered Johnson to leave only Grade's brigade in his lines, and to come to Petersburg with the rest of his division. Johnson brought about 3,500 men, which, with Hoke, gave Brigade in the morning an effective force of about 14,000 infantry. During the night he built a temporary line, throwing out the captured portion, while his efficient chief engineer, Col. D. B. Harris, 
laid out and commenced to better locate it permanent line at an average distance of a half mile in the rear dot on the 16th, Hancock was in command, and the 9th Corps arrived on the field, giving him about 48,000 effectives. He devoted the day to attacks upon each flank of the broken line and succeeded in capturing one raid, number 4, on Brigade's left, and 3, nose. 12, 13, and 14, on his right dot on the 17th, the fighting began at 3 a.m. and was continued until 11 p.m. The attack at 3 was conducted by Potter's division of the 9th Corps, and was a complete surprise. Extraordinary precautions had been adopted to make it so. No shot was fired. Canteens had been packed in knapsacks, and all orders were transmitted in whispers. The Confederates were so exhausted, by their incessant fighting by day and working by night, that they were sound asleep, with arms in their hands, and double canister in their guns. Only a single gunner was waked in time to pull a single lanyard before the enemy swept over and got possession of ridden number 16, with four guns and 600 prisoners. Nowhere else during the long day were they able to make any headway. The 5th Corps had now arrived and one division of the 6th. About dark in the afternoon, ridden number three, on the left, had been taken and held temporarily by Ledley's division of the 9th Corps. Grade's brigade, which had just come in from Bermuda hundreds, was put to charge them, and drove them out, capturing over 1,000 prisoners. After the fighting ceased, Col. Harris superintended the withdrawal of the troops from the temporary line to the new location which had been prepared in the last 48 hours. At 4 a.m. on the 18th, a general advance was made by the 2d, 5th, and 9th Corps, the 6th and 18th supporting in reserve. The ground in front of the points which had been assaulted was thickly strewn with the Federal dead, and the slight trenches, from which they had fought so long and desperately, were filled with the slain there had been no opportunity to bury or remove. A few deserters or prisoners were picked up, and from them he'd learned that Bregard's whole force had been but two divisions and Wise's brigade, now reduced by heavy losses, but trying to occupy a hastily constructed line or half mile, more or less, in the rear. This information was conveyed to all the corps commanders who were ordered to press forward vigorously and overwhelm our lines in their unfinished condition. No army could ask a more favorable chance to destroy its antagonist than was here presented. Their whole army was at hand, and the reinforcement of Longstreet's corps, even now coming to Brigade, was not over 12,000 men and was still about three to five hours away. The little which was accomplished during the whole day is striking evidence of the condition to which the Federal Army had now been reduced. Dot at first, much time was lost in driving in our pickets, and in efforts to arrange for simultaneous assaults by the different corps. Meade himself at last fixed upon twelve o'clock, and ordered each corps at that hour to assault with a strong column. By that time Kershaw's division had relieved Johnson's, taking its place in the trenches. Hoke, Wise, and none of the artillery could be relieved until after dark, without unwise exposure of the troops. Field's division took position in the trenches on Kershaw's left, but it did not become engaged. Humphreys states that about midday the 2d Corps made two assaults, both repulsed with severe loss. Later Meade again ordered, assaults by all the Corps with their whole force, and at all hazards, and as soon as possible. All the corps assaulted late in the afternoon, and at hours not widely apart, Bernie with all his disposable force, not from the Hare House. Supported by one of Gibbon's brigades, Barlow on Mott's left comma but were repulsed with considerable loss. Burnside found the task of driving the enemy, it was but a picket force, out of the railroad cut a formidable one, and, assaulting, established his corps within a hundred yards of the enemy's main line. Warren's assault was well made, some of Griffin's men being killed within twenty feet of the enemy's works, but it was no more successful than the others. His losses were very severe. On the right, Martindale advanced and gained some rifle pits, but did not assault the main line. On the Confederate side, the day was not considered a day of battle, but only of demonstrations and reconnaissance. 
none of our reinforcements were engaged. The only fighting done having been by Hook's division and Wise's brigade, who, under Brigade, had already borne the whole brunt of the four days and three nights. The official diary of Longstreet's Corps says of the day, we arrive in Petersburg and Kershaw relieves Bushra Johnson's division, field taking position on Kershaw's right. A feeble attack is made in the afternoon on Elliott's brigade. No official report is given of any brigade except her goods, which describes only skirmishing, and one attempted charge on our extreme left, which never got closer than 250 yards. It was necessary to wait until night before Brigade's artillery could receive its plaudit of well done. Good and faithful servants, and be relieved by the fresh battalions of Longstreet's corps. Of all the moonlight nights I can remember, I recall that Saturday night as, perhaps, the most brilliant and beautiful. The weather was exceedingly dry, the air perfectly calm, with an exhilarating electrical quality in it. The dust rose with every movement and hung in the air. The whole landscape was bathed and saturated in silver, and sounds were unusually distinct and seemed to be alive and to travel everywhere. It was not a night for sleep in the trenches. There was a great deal to be done at all points, to strengthen and improve them, and every man was personally interested in working at his immediate location. In spite of all pains, the drawing out of old guns and approach of new was attended with sounds which wandered far and with luminous clouds of dust gradually rising in the air. Then the enemy would know we were moving and there would come crashes of musketry at random and volleys of artillery from their lines. Then our infantry would imagine themselves attacked, and would respond in like fashion, and the fire would run along the parapet to right and left, and gradually subside for a while, to break out presently somewhere else. I was accompanied by Lieutenant Col. Branch, a Col. of artillery of Brigade's army, a very competent and gallant officer, unfortunately killed in 1869 by the falling of a bridge near Richmond. Grant did not renew his assaults on the 19th, but expressed himself satisfied that all had been done which was possible, and he now directed that the troops should be put under cover and have some rest. Humphreys writes, the positions gained by the several corps close against the enemy were entrenched, and the two opposing lines in this part of the ground remained substantially the same in position to the close of the war. In brief review, it must be said that Grant successfully deceived Lee as to his whereabouts for at least three days, and thus, at the most critical period of the war, saved himself from a second defeat, more bloody, more signal, and more undeniable than Cold Harbor. For, if Brigade alone, with only 14,000 men, was able to stop Grant's whole army even after being driven by surprise into temporary works, what would Lee and Bregard together have done from the strong original lines of Petersburg? Grant, personally, was at that period not abstemious, and that his troops knew of it, perhaps sometimes exaggerating facts in speaking of it, was known, even to the Confederates, from the stories of prisoners captured at Cold Harbor. Such a defeat in case of any disaster, with such rumors afloat, would have cast a baleful backlight over the campaign, even to Spotsylvania and the wilderness. He was now able to base a quasi claim to victory in establishing himself within the lines of Petersburg. But all the odium of repeated defeats would have been heaped upon his campaign, had it terminated with a final and bloody repulse. All this had been changed by his well planned and successfully conducted strategy. The position which he had secured was full of great possibilities, as yet not fully comprehended. But, already, the character of the operations contemplated, removed all risk of serious future catastrophe. However bold we might be, however desperately we might fight, we were sure in the end to be worn out. It was only a question of a few months, more or less. We were unable to see it at once. But there soon began to spring up a chain of permanent works the first of which were built upon our original lines captured by the skirmishers the first afternoon, and those works, impregnable to assault, finally decided our fate, when, on the next March 25th, we put them to the test dot of this period following the battles of Cold Harbor and Petersburg. 
the future historian may find something to say. By all the rules of statecraft, the time had now arrived to open negotiations for peace. There would no longer be any hope of final success, but there would still be much of blood, of treasure, and of political rights, which might be saved or lost. The time never came again when as favorable terms could have been made as now. For it was the hour of the lowest tide in federal hopes. It remains a fact, however, that for many months, even until the very capture of Richmond, both the Confederate Army and the people would have been very loath to recognize that our cause was hopeless. Lee's influence, had he advised it, could have secured acquiescence in surrender, but nothing else would. His confidence in his army, doubtless, for some months delayed his realization of the approaching end. Even when he foresaw it, his duty to his government as a soldier was paramount, and controlled his course to the very last dot and there is this to be said. In every war there are two issues contended for. First, is the political principle involved, which with us was the right of secession. The second is prestige or character as a people. Conceding our cause, did we defend it worthily, history and posterity being the judges? We lost the first issue, and the more utterly it was lost, the better it has proved to be, for ourselves, even more than for our adversaries. Without detracting from their merit, but displaying and even enhancing it, we have gained the second by a courage and constancy which could only be fully developed and exhibited under the extreme tests endured, and by the high types of men who became our leaders. Is not that end worthy of the extreme price paid for it, even to the last drop of blood shed at Appomattox? I am sure that to the army, any end but the last ditch would have seemed a breach of faith with the dead we had left upon every battlefield. The federal casualties for Petersburg and for the campaign are given as follows June 13 18, killed 1,298, wounded 7,474, missing 1,814, total 10,586. May 5th to June 18, killed 8,412, wounded 44,629, missing 9,609, total 62,750. No returns exist for Brigade's losses, but they have been estimated at killed 500, wounded 2,200, missing 2,000, total 4,700. The losses among the general officers were severe on both sides, being of Confederates, killed 8, wounded 15, captured 2, total 25, and of Federals, killed 6, wounded 8, captured 2, total 16.1 The archives of the State Department, when one day made public, will show how deeply the government was affected by the want of military success and to what resolutions the executive had in consequence come. One Romans Brigade, two, two hundred and twenty. Chaptix Xithmin Petersburg trenches. Wilson and Counts's cavalry raid. They're out on the 29th. Early's demonstration toward Washington. The mine at the Elliott salient. Extent of the tunnel and galleries. Its ventilation. Countermins. Plans for a federal charge to follow the explosion. Movements of Hancock. The explosion on the 30th. The crater. Failure of the federal assault. Our first days in the Petersburg trenches were exceedingly busy ones. From June 19th to 24, a daily entry in my notebook was severe sharpshooting and artillery practice without intermission day or night. Our whole time was spent in improving our lines and getting our batteries protected and with good communications. Never until in this campaign had the enemy used mortar fire in the field, but now Abbott's Reserve Artillery Regiment of 1,700 men brought into use 60 mortars ranging from 24 pr. Cohorns to 10 inch sea coast, which caused us great annoyance as we had to keep our trenches fully manned and had no protection against the dropping shells. Fortunately, I had ordered some mortars constructed in Richmond about two weeks before, and they began to arrive on June 24, and war at once brought into use. They were only 12-pounders, 
but will light and convenient, and at close ranges enabled us to hold our own, with less loss than might have been expected. The cannoneers in the batteries, and the infantry in the lines who were exposed to this mortar fire, managed to build little bomb roofs, and a labyrinth of deep and narrow trenches in rear of the lines. Abbott's siege train also included six 100 pounder, and 40 30 pr. rifles, besides their regular field artillery. Many of the heavy calibers were mounted on the permanent forts, erected in the outer line already referred to. These constituted a sort of entrenched citadel, consisting of isolated forts connected by infantry parapets with ditches and abattis, and impregnable to any assault. Here a small fraction of the army could securely hold its line for days, and continue to threaten Petersburg, leaving the rest free to extend lines on the south or to threaten Richmond on the north. Meanwhile, in front, their offensive system of trenches and riddens was pushed as close as possible to ours, and we were constantly menaced with assault, should we weaken our garrison. One point in our front, called Elliot's salient, was recognized as particularly weak. The edge of the deep valley of Poor Creek, approximately parallel to our general line of works, here approached within 133 yards of the salient, which was held by Pegram's battery, Elliot's brigade occupying the adjacent lines. Along the near edge of the valley, the enemy built strong rifle pits, with elaborate headlogs and loopholes, from which a constant fire was kept up upon our works. In the valley behind was ample room for an unlimited force, which could be collected and massed without our knowledge, and would have but 133 yards to advance under fire to reach our works. We soon managed to place obstructions in front of the parapet at this point and watched closely, confidently expecting that the enemy would here begin soon to make zigzag approaches as in a siege. Dot on June 22, Grant sent Wilson's and Coutts's divisions of cavalry upon a raid against the Lynchburg and Danville railroads. On the same day, the 2d and 6th Corps were stretched out to the left with the intent of reaching the Weldon RR, and perhaps even to the road to Lynchburg. Lee, advised of this movement, sent A. P. Hill with Wilcox's and Muon's division, supported by Johnson's, to meet it. With Wilcox's division, he obstructed the advance of the 6th Corps so effectively that it failed to reach even the Weldon Road, by at least a mile. With Muon's and Johnson's divisions, he passed through a gap carelessly left between the 2D Corps, which was swinging around to its left, and the 6th, which was advancing, and struck Barlow's division of the 2D in the rear. Barlow's and Gibbon's divisions were both badly defeated, losing four guns which were turned upon the fugitives, several colors and about 1,700 prisoners. Mott's division was also routed but retreated so precipitately as to lose few prisoners. Hill returned at night to his entrenchments, and the next morning the 2D Corps occupied the lines from which it had been driven and the 6th Corps formed on its left obliquely toward the Weldon Road. Wilson and Counts were followed in their aid by W. H. F. Lee's division of cavalry which, however, was unable to prevent the tearing up of the Lynchburg RR from near Petersburg to Burkeville, and of the Danville Road from Burkeville south to the Staunton River. Here the bridge was defended by local militia who were entrenched with artillery. The river was unfordable, and Lee, attacking in the rear, the Federals decided to rejoin Grant at Petersburg by a circuit to the east. Unfortunately for them. Hampton's and Fitzley's divisions had just returned from the pursuit of Sheridan's cavalry to Trevilian's station, where they had hit a drawn battle on June 11 and 12. These divisions, aided by W. H. F. Lee's, which had continued in the pursuit, and by two brigades of infantry under Moon, fell upon Wilson and Counts on the 29th at Reims station and routed them with the loss of 1,500 killed wounded, and captured, and all of their artillery, twelve guns, and their wagon train. They finally made their escape across the Blackwater, burning the bridge behind them, and thus cutting off pursuit by Hampton and Lee. They reached the James at Lighthouse Point on July 2. They had been absent ten days, had marched over three hundred miles, 
and torn up 60 miles of railroad. The tracks, however, were soon repaired and traffic restored by all the lines. By the Weldon Road, however, it soon became necessary to halt the trains short of Petersburg, and to wagon by a roundabout road into the town. Between July 6 and 9, Grant had found it necessary to send the three divisions of the 6th Corps to Washington to oppose Early and Breckenridge. These, whom we saw sent by Lee, from Cold Harbor, to check Hunter's advance upon Lynchburg, had reached Lynchburg before him. Hunter feared either to attack, or to retreat by the way he had come. After a pause of two days he started, on June 19, through W. Va. Via the Great Canal, the Ohio River, and the Baltimore and Ohio are at a Harper's Ferry. This left the valley open. Early at once moved down it to demonstrate against Washington. The only force available to oppose him was Wallace's command from Baltimore, with Ricketts's division of the 6th Corps, which was the first to arrive. Early had crossed the Potomac at Shepherdstown and moved through the passes of South Mountain. On July 9, he attacked and defeated Wallace on the Monocacy. The next day he moved upon Washington, Wallace being driven toward Baltimore. Never before, probably, had Washington been as bare of troops as when Early arrived before it on the afternoon of July 11. But there were regular garrisons of infantry and artillery at many of the permanent forts, comma, District of Columbia volunteers, regiments of veteran reserves, many miscellaneous detachments at the Camp of Instruction, and about 2,000 organized employees of the Quartermaster's Department, comma, in all over 20,000 men. These troops alone, without aid, could have defended the city indefinitely and forced early to undertake a siege. That night, there arrived the two remaining divisions of the 6th Corps, and 6,000 men of the 19th Corps, under Emory, from New Orleans. In the afternoon, Early had reconnoitred, and, in consultation with his officers, had ordered an assault in the morning. It is scarcely credible that he would have made more than a demonstration, for any real attack would have been but a bloody fuss. In the night he heard of the arrival of the troops and in the morning could see them. He did not attack and that night he withdrew, marching to Leesburg, where he recrossed the Potomac. Grant had intended, on Early's repulse, not only to bring back the 6th Corps to Petersburg, but also to bring down the 19th. Had he now carried out those intentions, it is likely that Lee would have brought down Early. It was Lee's policy, however, to fight for time and delay matters by division rather than to hasten them by concentration. So he left early in the valley, where his presence would be a constant menace and would neutralize more troops than his equivalent elsewhere. On June 30, I became convinced that the enemy were preparing to mine our position at the Elliott salient. At that point, incessant fire was kept up by their sharpshooters. While a few hundred yards to the right and left the fire had been gradually allowed to diminish and men might show themselves without being fired at. That indicated that some operation was going on, and for several days I had expected to see zigzag approaches started on the surface of the ground. When several days had passed and nothing appeared, I became satisfied that their activity was underground. On my way home, I was that day wounded by a sharpshooter and received a furlough of six weeks to visit my home in Georgia on my way to the cars next day, I was driven by Lee's headquarters, where I reported my belief about the mine. There happened to be present Mr. Lawley, the English correspondent of the London Times, who was much interested and asked how far it would be necessary to tunnel to get under our works. I answered about 500 feet. He stated that the longest military tunnel or gallery which had ever been run was at the siege of Delhi, and that it did not exceed 400 feet. That it was found impossible to ventilate for any greater distance. I replied that in the Federal Army were many pa. coal miners who could be relied on to ventilate mines any distance that might be necessary, and it would not do to rely upon military precedents. It proved that my suspicion was correct. It was June 30th when I guessed it. The gallery had been commenced on June 27th. 
it was undertaken, in opposition to the advice of all the military engineers at federal headquarters, by Lieutenant Cole. Pleasance of the 48th Pa. Regiment, a coal miner, who saw the opportunity which the situation offered. A gallery was successfully extended 511 feet, with two branch galleries at the end, to the right and left, each 37 feet long. These branch galleries were charged with gunpowder in eight parcels of 1,000 pounds each, connected by open troughs of powder to be fired by safety fuses coming through the tamping and along the gallery. His method of ventilation was very simple. When the tunnel had penetrated the hill far enough to need it, a close partition was built across it near the entrance with a close fitting door. Through the partition on the side of this door was passed the open end of a long square box or closed trough, which was built along on the floor of the tunnel, conveying the fresh outside air to the far end of the tunnel, where the men extending it were at work. To create a draft through this air box, a fireplace was excavated in the side of the tunnel, within the partition, and a chimney was pierced through the hill above it. A small fire in this chimney place, and the outside air would pass through the air box to the far end of the tunnel whence it would return and escape up the chimney, taking with it the foul air of the tunnel. This tunnel was finished July 17th, the galleries on the 23d, and the mine was charged and tamped on the 28th. Lee, on receipt of my message on July 1st, ordered our engineers to start countermines at the Elliott salient. Two shafts were, sunk about ten feet and listening galleries were run out from each. Unfortunately, the shafts were located on the right and left flanks of the battery, and the enemy's gallery passed at a depth of 20 feet under the apex, and was so silently built that our miners never knew of their proximity. Had they detected it, they would have hastened to explode what is called a camonflit, an undercharged or smothered mine, which does not disturb the surface, but caves in adjacent galleries. By July 10, our miners had done enough work, had it been done at the apex of the salient, to have heard the enemy, who would have been directly beneath them. Work was not only kept up, however, on the flanks, but at two other positions farther to the left, known as Colquitt's and Grace's salients, countermines were also begun, at Colquitt's on the 10th and at Grace's on the 19th. All four of our mines were constantly pushed until the 30th, when the explosion occurred the total length of our galleries being then about 375 feet. Of the two galleries on each side of the mine, one, which was unoccupied, was destroyed by the explosion. In the other, the miners were at work, but, though much shaken up, the galleries were not crushed and the miners climbed out and escaped. Meanwhile, in spite of predictions of failure, the mine had been constructed, and though we were known to suspect it, and our countermining operations could be heard, it was now determined to delay the explosion until preparations could be made to haul it followed by a grand charge, supported by the concentration of a great force, both of infantry and artillery. That it might be the more effective, Grant determined to combine strategy with main force, and first endeavor to draw a large part of our infantry to the north side of the James. At suitable points, he had already built signal towers overlooking our lines, and some of our most important roads, and now the artillery officers were directed to prepare specially to concentrate fire upon every gun in our lines which could be used for the defense of Elliot's salient. In obedience to these instructions, Humphrey's reports, heavy guns and mortars, 81 in all, and about the same number of field guns were prepared with abundant ammunition. At Deep Bottom, Butler maintained two pontoon bridges across the James, with part of the 10th Corps on the north side, under cover of his gunboats and ironclads. Of course, we had to maintain a moderate force in observation, which, under Gen. Connor, was located near Bailey's Greek. Grant, could cross both the Appomattox and the James and go from his lines around Petersburg to Deep Bottom by a march of twelve miles, all of it entirely concealed from our view. Lee could only send troops to meet him by a march of twenty miles. On the afternoon of July 26, 
Hancock with about 20,000 infantry and Sheridan with two divisions, about 6,000 cavalry, were started to deep bottom. It was expected that this force, aided by the 10th Corps, would surprise the Confederate Brigade, Connors, and would then make a dash toward Richmond. Sheridan was directed also to endeavor to cut the railroads north of Richmond. During the night, this force crossed the river, and, at dawn on the 27th, moved upon our lines and captured 420 PR. Barrots in an advanced position. It happened that Lee had noted activity of the enemy in that quarter. Wilcox's division was already at Drury's Bluff, and, on the 24th, it and Kershaw's division were sent to reinforce Connor. This force made such a show that Hancock, finding it there before him, did not deem it wise to assault their line. On their left, Kershaw even advanced against Sheridan's cavalry and forced it to retreat. It took a position behind a ridge, where it dismounted a considerable force armed with the Spencer magazine carbines. Kershaw unwisely attempted a charge and was quickly repulsed, losing 250 prisoners and two colors. On hearing of Hancock's crossing on the morning of the 27th, and that prisoners had been captured from the 2d, 10th, and 18th Corps, Lee immediately sent over W. H. F. Lee's division of cavalry and Heth's infantry of Hill's Corps. Later in the day, he arranged to have Field's division of infantry withdrawn from his trenches at dark, to follow during the night, and Fitz Lee's cavalry the next morning. President Davis was also advised, and on the 29th the local defense troops in Richmond were called out to the defense of the Richmond lines. These troops were never called out except in the gravest emergencies, which indicates the importance Lee attached to the demonstration. But it was only a demonstration designed to be abandoned, if it failed to make a surprise of our lines at deep bottom on the 27th. As this became fully apparent on the 28th, orders were issued from deep bottom to prepare the mine for explosion on the morning of the 30th. Orders were also given for the 2D Corps with a division of the 18th Corps and one of the 10th to return and take part in the assault. Sheridan's cavalry was also to return, and passing in rear of the army to take position on its left to threaten our extreme right and prevent our reinforcing the vicinity of the mine. The explosion might have been arranged for the afternoon of the 29th, but the morning of the 30th was chosen, as it permitted the placing of more heavy guns and mortars for the bombardment, which would follow the explosion, as well as preliminary arrangements, such as massing the troops removing parapets and abatis to make passages for the assaulting columns, and the posting of pioneers to remove our abatis and open passages for artillery through our lines. Depots of entrenching tools, with sandbags, gabions, fascines, etc., were established, that lodgments might be more quickly made, though the pioneers of all regiments were already well supplied with tools. Engineer officers were designated to accompany all columns, and even pontoon trains were at hand to bridge the Appomattox in pursuit of fugitives. Finally, Meade personally impressed on every corps commander the importance of celerity of movement. Briefly, no possible precaution was omitted to be carefully ordered, and the success of the Deep Bottom expedition, in drawing Lee's forces to that locality, had exceeded all expectations. On the morning of the 30th, Lee had left to hold the ten miles of lines about Petersburg but three divisions, Hoax, Johnson's, and Muon's, about 18,000 men, most of the rest of his army being twenty miles away. Hoax and Johnson held from the Appomattox on the left to a little beyond the mine. Muon held all beyond, one brigade being four miles to the right. The 2d, 5th, 9th, and parts of the 10th and 18th with two divisions of Sheridan's cavalry, sixteen divisions in all, near sixty thousand men, were concentrated to follow up the surprise to be given by the explosion under Johnson's division. That it should be the more complete, for two days no heavy guns or mortars had been fired, that the Confederates might believe that the Federals were preparing to retreat. Everything now seemed to be working exactly as Grant would have it and it is difficult to entirely explain how the attack came to fail so utterly. 
several causes cooperated which will be presently referred to, but among them was the same cause which, on May 12th, nullified the federal surprise at the bloody angle at Spotsylvania. Too many troops had been brought together, and they were in each other's way. On a smaller scale, in the assault of Fort Sanders at Knoxville, three Confederate brigades got mingled in the assault, which at once lost its vigor, though it did not retreat until after receiving severe punishment. The brigadier in command, on this occasion, ascribed his failure to the presence of the two other brigades who should have been upon his flanks. The assault was to be led by Ledley's division of the Ninth Corps, a selection made by Lot, and a very unfortunate one, as Ledley and Ferrero, who commanded the colored division, which was to follow Ledley, both took shelter in a bomb proof, where they remained during the entire action. The mine was ordered to be fired at 3.30 a.m., but the fuses had been spliced and when first fired, failed at the splice. After an hour, an officer and sergeant entered the tunnel and relighted the fuse. The explosion occurred at 4.40. As the sun rose about 4.50, the delay had been advantageous, as it gave daylight for the movements of the troops and for the artillery fire. The explosion made a crater 150 feet long, 97 feet wide, and 30 feet deep, the contents being hurled so high in the air that the foremost ranks of the assaulting columns, 150 yards away, shrank back in disorder in fear of the falling earth. The bulk of the earth, however, fell immediately around the crater mingled with the debris of two guns, 22 cannoneers, and perhaps 250 infantry, nine companies of the 19th and 22 DSC, which had been carried up in the air. Quite a number of these who fell safely were dug out and rescued alive by the assaulting column. Some, not yet aroused, were lost, covered up in the bomb roofs of the adjacent trenches by the falling earth. This formed a high embankment as it wore, all around the crater, with one enormous clod, the size of a small cabin, perched about the middle of the inside rim, which remained a landmark for weeks. A high interior line, called a trench cavalier, had been built across the gorge of the salient enclosing a triangular space, and the left center of this space about coincided with the center of the explosion. The parapets were partially destroyed and largely buried by the falling earth. Into this crater, the leading division literally swarmed, until it was packed about as full as it could hold, and what could not get in there, crowded into the adjacent trenches, which the falling earth had caused to be vacated for a short distance on each flank. But, considering the surprise, the novelty of the occasion and the terrific cannonade by 150 guns and mortars which was opened immediately, the coolness and self-possession of the entire brigade was remarkable, and to it is to be attributed the success of the defense. This was conducted principally by Col. McMaster of the 17th SC, Gen. Elliot having been soon severely wounded. The effect of the artillery cannonade was more a moral effect than a physical one, for the smoke so obscured the view that the fire was largely at random, at least for one or two hours during which it was in fullest force. The effort was at once made to collect a small force in the trenches upon each flank, and one in an entrenchment occupying a slight depression which ran parallel to our line of battle some 250 yards in rear of it, the effort being to confine the enemy to the crater and the lines immediately adjoining. The multiplicity of the deep and narrow trenches, and the bomb proofs in the rear of our lines doubtless contributed to our success in doing this on the flanks, but there was also decided lack of vigor and enterprise on the part of the enemy, which permitted us to form barricades, which were successfully defended to the last dot meanwhile the reinforcements to the storming column, instead of spreading to the flanks, massed outside of our lines in rear of the storming column, which had made no further advance, but had filled the crater and all the captured lines. Several efforts were made to advance from time to time, but the first were feeble, and could be checked by the remnants of the brigade under McMaster, until two regiments of Wise's brigade and two of Ransom's were brought up from the left. With their aid, the situation was made safe and held until about 10 a.m., when Muon arrived at the head of three brigades of his corps, 
drawn from the lines on our right. A regiment of hooks from the left also came up later. In the meantime, a few of our guns had found themselves able to fire with great effect upon the enemy massed in front of our lines. The left gun in the next salient to the right, occupied by Davidson's battery, was in an embrasure which flanked the Pegram salient, but was not open to any gun on the enemy's line. This gun did fearful execution, being scarcely 400 yards distant. It was fired by Major Jibs commanding the battalion, for perhaps 40 rounds, until he was badly wounded, after which it was served by Col. Huger and Haskell, Winthrop, and Mason of my staff, and later by some of Wise's infantry. A hot fire was turned upon it, but it was well protected and could never be kept silent when the enemy showed himself. 500 yards to the left was a four gun battery under Captain Wright of Coates Battalion, in a depression behind our line, and masked from the enemy by some trees. But it had a flanking fear on the left of Pegram's salient and across all the approaches and a number of infantry of Wise's brigade could also add their fire. Wright's fire was rapid, incessant, and accurate, causing great loss. The Federal artillery made vain efforts to locate him with their mortar shells which tore up the ground all around but could never hit him or silence him. Besides these, a half dozen or more of Cohorn mortars, under Col. Haskell, from two or three different ravines in the rear, threw shell aimed at the crater. And, finally, 600 yards directly in rear of the mine was the sunken Jerusalem plank road, in which I had placed Haskell's battalion of 16 guns about the 20th of June, and he had been kept there ever since without showing a gun or throwing up any earth which would disclose his position. He had suffered some loss from random bullets coming over the parapets at the salient 500 yards in front, but it was borne rather than disclose the location. This morning, on one occasion, a charge was attempted by the colored division, part of which was brought out of the crater and started toward the plank road. Then Haskell's guns showed themselves and opened fire. The charge was quickly driven back with severe loss among its white officers. A single private, with his musket at his support arms, made the charge, running all the way to the guns and jumping into the sunken road between them, where he was felled with a rammer staff. Meanwhile, our guns across the Appomattox on the Federal right, and from our left near the river, had kept up a reply to the Federal cannonade to prevent their concentration opposite the mine. Lee and Brigade had early come to the field, which they surveyed from the windows of the G House, where Johnson made headquarters, on the Jerusalem Plank Road, near Haskell's guns. Hill had gone to bring up his troops. On the arrival of Muon, he at once prepared to attack, and had formed Wisich's brigade, when a renewed attempt to advance was made from the enemy's lines on our left of the crater. He at once met this by a countercharge of Wisages with a portion of Elliot's which drove the enemy back and which caused the retreat from the rear of their lines of many who had been sheltered within them. These suffered severely by our fire from the flanks as they crossed the open spaces behind, under fire from the guns upon both flanks and infantry as well. This retreat under such severe fire was seen in the Federal lines, just in time to put a stop to an attack upon our right flank about to be made by Ayres's division of Warren's corps, which had been ordered to capture the one-gun battery on our right, as they called the one at which Jibs had been wounded. One there was very little infantry supporting this gun, or able to reach it, without exposure. Ayres's attack would probably have been successful. He was about to go forward, when Meade directed all offensive operations to cease. Wright's brigade arriving about half past eleven, Muon made a second attack which was repulsed with the aid of the Federal artillery bearing upon the ground. Between 1 and 2 p.m., Sanders's brigade having arrived, and also the 61st N.C. from Hoke, a combined movement upon both flanks of the crater was organized. Muon attacked on the left, with Sanders's brigade, the 61st N.C. and the 17th S.C. Johnson attacked on the right with the 23 D.S.C. and the remaining five companies of the 22 D. All that could be promptly collected on that flank. This attack was easily successful. 
Muon has stated that the number of prisoners taken in the crater was 1,101, including two brigade commanders, Bartlett and Marshall. The tabular statement of the medical department gives the federal casualties of the day as killed, 419, wounded, 1,679, missing, 1910, total, 4,008. Elliott's brigade reported the loss by the explosion as colon including these, Johnson reports the casualties in his division, Elliott, Wise, Ransom, Gracie, as follows colon killed, 165, wounded, 415, missing, 369, total, 938. There are no returns for Muons and Hoax divisions. Hoax division was composed of courses, Klingmans, Fultons, Haggards, and Colquitt's brigades, and Muons had only three brigades on the field, Weisiger's, Wrights, and Sanders's. Of these eight brigades, only Weisiger's had serious losses, but there are no reports except for Colquitt's, who, like the rest of Hoax division, held a portion of the line not attacked. His casualties were four killed and twenty-seven wounded. The total Confederate loss is given in the tabular statement of the medical department as, 400 killed, 600 wounded, and 200 missing, which is perhaps between 200 and 300 too small. The military court censured Gens, Burnside, Ledley, Ferrero, Wilcox, and Col. Bliss, commanding a brigade. They also expressed their opinion that explicit orders should have been given assigning one officer to the command of all the troops intended to engage in the assault when the commanding general was not present in person to witness the operations. There is nothing in the reports to explain this. Grant sent a dispatch to Halleck at 10 a.m., saying that he was just from the front, and about that time Humphreys reports that Meade, with Grant's concurrence, ordered the cessation of all offensive movements. One Humphreys calls this a two-gun battery. There were two embrasures and two guns, but only one used. The other did not bear where desired chapter the fall of 1864 the situation in August. Hood appointed to succeed Johnston. Evacuation of Atlanta. Capture of Mobile. Re-election of Lincoln. Battle of Franklin. Sherman's March. Fort Fisher. Conference at Fortress Monroe. Fort Stedman. Movements of Grant Five Forks, Fort Whitworth and Fort Gregg. Evacuation of Petersburg. Appomattox. Correspondence between Lee and Grant. Conversations with Lee. The meeting at Appomattox. The surrender. Visit to Washington. Conversations with Mr. Washburn. Return home. Record of the Army of Northern Virginia. Gen. Humphreys writes of the situation in August, man after the fiasco of the mine, as follows colon 1. Between this time and the month of March, 1865, several movements of the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James were made to the right and to the left, which resulted in the extension of our line of entrenchments in both directions and caused a corresponding extension of the Confederate entrenchments on our left, and their occupation in stronger force of their entrenchments on the north bank of the James. By this process their lines finally became so thinly manned, when the last movement to our left was made in March, 1865, as to be vulnerable at one or two points, where some of the obstructions in their front had been in a great measure destroyed by the exigencies of the winter. In other words, attacks upon our lines were now abandoned for a succession of feints, first upon one flank and them upon the other, by which our lines were extended at both ends to the point of breaking. This point is reached in eight months at one or two places, where the Confederates had been tempted by the severity of the winter to burn the abatis in front of their breastworks. We will not attempt to follow either these efforts of the enemy, or these aggressive counter movements of which there was no lack, though all were attended with much hard fighting. Besides the heavy casualties of these incessant affairs, which followed each other at short intervals from August 1st to November 1st, there was daily sharpshooting and much mortar and artillery practice, which helped swell the totals. 
Confederate reports are entirely lacking, but losses were fully as heavy in proportion to the numbers engaged, as were the Federal losses, for on several occasions Lee was the aggressor and lost heavily. On 1, October 7, on the Derby Town Road, Field's division was sent to charge two brigades in breastworks, which proved to be armed with the Spencer magazine guns. He was quickly repulsed with severe loss, which included Gregg of Texas killed, and Bratton of SC wounded. The total federal casualties for this period, August 1st to December 31st, are given as, killed, 2,172, wounded, 11,138, missing, 11,311, total, 24,621. The corresponding Confederate losses were probably between 12,000 and 14,000. It will afford a better view of the situation as a whole to glance at those events referred to by Swinton, where he says, had not success elsewhere come to brighten the horizon, it would have been difficult to raise new forces to recruit the Army of the Potomac. The first and most important of the events resulting in success elsewhere was President Davis relieving Joseph E. Johnston of the command of the army opposing Sherman at Atlanta. And appointing Hood to succeed him. This step was taken with great reluctance, and under great popular and political pressure brought by Guff. Brown and Sen. Hill of Georgia who claimed that Johnston intended to surrender Atlanta without giving battle. After many reiterations of such charges, Davis was at length led to give a promise to relieve Johnston if, on being asked for some assurance of his intention to fight, he failed to give it. Gen. Bragg was sent to interview him, and after spending two days with him, wired, he has not sought my advice, and it was not volunteered. I cannot learn that he has any more plan in the future than he has had in the past. Davis then wired to Johnston a direct inquiry, as follows, I wish to hear from you as to present situation, and your plan of operations, so specifically as will enable me to anticipate events. This was sent July 16, and Johnston replied the same day. As the enemy has double our number, we must be on the defensive. My plan of operations must, therefore, depend upon that of the enemy. It is mainly to watch for an opportunity to fight to advantage. We are trying to put Atlanta into condition to be held for a day or two by the Georgia militia, that army movements may be freer and wider. This reply was certainly not specific, and was considered evasive. It will be remembered that, in April, 1862, the relations between the President and Johnston had been strained to the verge of breaking by the General's reticence as to his plans, and avoidance of interviews, even by galloping to the front on seeing the President approach near the field of Seven Pines. There a crisis was avoided by Johnston's wound and loss of the command of the army. Now, a very similar issue had arisen, and with it the old and bitter feelings on each side. On the 17th of Gen. Cooper wired Johnson, I am directed by the Secretary of War to inform you that as you have failed to arrest the advance of the enemy to the vicinity of Atlanta, and express no confidence that you can defeat or repel him, you are hereby relieved from the command of the Army and Department of the Tennessee, which you will immediately turn over to Gen. Hood. To this Johnston replied that the order had been received and obeyed, and added, as to the alleged cause of my removal I assert that Sherman's army is much stronger, compared with that of Tennessee, than Grant's compared with that of Northern Va. Yet the enemy has been compelled to advance much more slowly to the vicinity of Atlanta than to that of Richmond and Petersburg, and penetrated much deeper into Va, than into Georgia confident language by a military commander is not usually regarded as evidence of competence. It is vain to speculate on what might have happened had Johnston been left in command. Had Lee been commander-in-chief, he would not have been relieved, as was indicated by his restoring Johnston to command on his taking that position in February. But it is a fact that Johnston had never fought but one aggressive battle, the Battle of Seven Pines, which was phenomenally mismanaged. On the 20th and 21st, Hood attacked Sherman, but was defeated and after a month of minor operations was finally, 
on September 1st, compelled to evacuate Atlanta. Meanwhile, a naval expedition, sent under Farragut against Mobile, had captured the forts commanding the harbor of that city on August 23rd. These two events, the capture of Mobile and Atlanta, following each other within a few days, came at perhaps the period of the greatest political depression of the administration. On August 23rd, Mr. Lincoln had written on a slip of paper, this morning, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected. Then it will be my duty to so cooperate with the president-elect, as to save the union between the election and the inauguration, as he will have secured his election on such grounds that he cannot possibly save it afterward. This paper he folded and had the cabinet put their names on its back. The victories came like an interposition of providence, and proved to be the final turning of the balance in the federal favor. The Democratic Party had nominated McClellan on a peace platform, mistaking the general discontent and depression, for a desire for peace at any price. McClellan himself had repudiated the platform, but, as victory now seemed inclining to the federal banners, all opposition to the administration died out. At the election in November, Mr. Lincoln received 212 electoral votes and McClellan but 21. The attacks which Hood had made upon Sherman on the 20th and 22d had both been judiciously planned and had stood excellent chances of success. The failure in both cases was from want of strict compliance with orders on the part of one of his corps commanders, Gen. Hardy. To trace it further would bring it home to himself for failure to supervise the execution of important orders, a sort of failure from which even the most eminent commanders have never been exempt. Another and striking example of it attended Hood's next campaign, this time involving practically a death blow to his army. Having maneuvered to draw Sherman out of entrenchments at Atlanta by moving upon his communications, he succeeded in drawing him as far north as Dalton and then crossed into Alabama at Gadsden, where he arrived October 20. Here he had hoped to deliver battle, but Sherman declined to follow, and returned to Atlanta, making preparations for the march to Savannah, upon which he set out November 15. In this event, Hood's orders from the president were to follow Sherman and hang upon his rear. But, with the approval of Brigard, who had been placed in command of the department, Hood decided, instead, to advance upon Nashville, where Thomas commanded, with an inferior force under Schofield, holding the country to the south. Prez. Davis had not imagined that any demonstration Hood could possibly make upon Nashville would be seriously regarded by Grant. The result, however, proved that it was thought to threaten Key, and it was considered of such grave importance that Grant had threatened to relieve Thomas for delay in attacking Hood. Grant was actually on his way to Nashville perhaps to do this when Thomas won his victory. So much in explanation of Hood's campaign. The issue at stake was now lost by the non-compliance with orders of Gen. Cheatham, commanding one of Hood's corps. Schofield had taken position on the north side of Duck River, opposing Hood's crossing. Hood loft Lee's court to demonstrate against Schofield while he threw a pontoon bridge across the river three miles above and crossed Cheatham's and Stewart's Corps which marched to Spring Hill on the Franklin Pike, twelve miles in Schofield's rear, arriving about 3 p.m. This place was held by the 2D Division of the 4th Corps, about 4,000 strong, Hood's force was about 18,000 infantry. Hood took Cheatham with Cleburne, a division commander, within sight of the pike along which the enemy could now be seen retreating at double quick, with wagons, in a trot, and gave explicit orders for an immediate attack and occupation of the pike. Similar orders, too, were given to Stuart's corps, and when Hood found later that nothing was being done, he sent more messages by staff officers, which also failed of effect. The head of Schofield's infantry arrived about nine o'clock and passed unmolested except by some random picket shots to which they made no reply. Both Confederate divisions had bivouacked within gunshot of the pike, but no effort was made to occupy it or to cross it. Undoubtedly, here Hood should have ridden to the front and led the troops into action himself. In his book, he calls the opportunity the best move in my career as a soldier. A few days after, 
Cheatham frankly admitted his delinquency. It was rumored that both he and Jen Stewart had that evening absented themselves from their divisions. Both had been often distinguished for gallantry, and had now overlooked it, believing it had been a lesson not to be forgotten. Nevertheless, it proved the death blow to Hood's army. On the next day, Schofield took a strong position at Franklin for the protection of his wagon trains, resting both flanks on the Harpeth River across a concave bend. His entrenched main line was but a mile in length. It was well protected with the Battis, and, 280 yards in front, an entire division, Wagner's of the Fourth Corps, held an advanced line, with its flanks drawn back nearly to the main line, and also well protected by a Battis. His infantry, about 23,000, was a little more than Hood's and was ample to man both lines, and to hold a strong reserve in a well sheltered position close in the rear. One of his infantry brigades, casements, was armed with magazine breech loaders. The ground in front was mostly level and open pasture land, and batteries across the Harpeth could fire upon the approaches. To assault was a terrible proposition to troops who, during Johnston's long retreat, had been trained to avoid charging breastworks. But Hood saw no alternative, since he had lost the one opportunity of the campaign at Spring Hill the night before. For Schofield was now within a day's march of Nashville. He ordered the attack, and for the credit of his army it must be said that officers and men responded valiantly, and went down to defeat in a blaze of glory. Over 10% of the force engaged were killed outright on the field, over 20% were carried to hospitals with severe wounds, and as many more suffered less severe wounds or were captured. The loss of general officers was unparalleled on either side in any action of the war. Cleburne, Gist, Adams, Strull, and Granberty were killed, Brown, Carter, Manigault, Qualls, Cockerell, and Scott were wounded, and Gordon was captured. Fifty-three regimental commanders were killed, wounded, or captured. The result might have been different, but for three handicaps, one. Hood, most unwisely, did not precede his charge with a severe cannonade because the village of Franklin was but a half mile in rear of his line. The enemy's position was quite crowded, and all his lines were subject to enfilade. It would have severely shaken the enemy, and with little danger to non-combatants, which they could not avoid. 2. The action was not begun until 4 p.m. The sun set at 4.50 p.m. and darkness prevented Hood from getting in two of Lee's divisions. There was no moon. 3. The presence on the field of casements brigade with magazine breech loaders. It was said by a correspondent that never before had men been killed so fast as they were during this charge by the fire of this brigade. The action was hand to hand all along the enemy's main line. It was carried for quite a space, at one point, but was restored by a charge of the reserve. At some points men were dragged across the parapets and captured. The battle continued with violence until 9 p.m. and firing was kept up until 3 a.m., when the enemy withdrew from the field, leaving his dead and wounded. Schofield's losses were, killed, 189, wounded, 1,033, missing, 1,104, total 2,326. Hood left 1750 dead on the field and 3,800 in hospitals. The slightly wounded and prisoners were about 2,000. His losses in the Battle of Franklin made it impossible for Hood to attack at Nashville, but he hoped to fortify and threaten until he was attacked, and then to gain a victory. What a vain hope! Efforts were being made to bring troops from Texas across the Mississippi, which also, of course, proved vain they never even started. His force was now reduced to about 18,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry, with which he took position before Nashville on December 2. Here he entrenched himself and awaited Thomas's attack, which the latter delayed until December 15. By this date he had accumulated a force of over 53,000 men. With these he attacked on the 15th, but with little success and with severe losses at points where he assailed Hood's entrenchments. On the 15th, the Federals renewed their assaults and during the morning were again repulsed. 
about 3 p.m., they massed a large force under cover behind a hill about Hood's left center, and under cover of a heavy fire of artillery made a gallant charge and carried Hood's line, which, seeing the disaster, broke in all directions, and all efforts to rally it failed. During the night, Hood withdrew, losing 54 guns and 4,500 prisoners. There was no return made of his casualties, but he reported them as very small. Thomas reported, killed, 387, wounded, 2,562, missing, 112, total, 3,061. Hood made good his retreat to Duplo, Miss, where his army rested for reorganization on January 10, 1865. In the spring, it was transferred to NC, where it served under A.P. Stewart and, about 7,000 strong, was included in Johnston's surrender. The Battle of Franklin had proved its death blow. Besides the loss of Atlanta and the destruction of Hood's army, there remains a third sequence of the change of commanders which deserves notice among the successes elsewhere, preparing the ground for Grant when he again became able to inaugurate a campaign. This was the unopposed march of Sherman from Atlanta to Savannah between November 15 and December 25, with the capture of Savannah on the latter date. It was preceded by the deliberate burning of every house in Atlanta. Not a single one was spared, not even a church. This was excused on the ground that war is hell. It depends somewhat upon the warrior. The conduct of Lee's army in Pa presents a pleasing contrast. It had been hoped that the few troops which could be gathered in Georgia, aided by the militia of the state, and by thirteen brigades of Confederate cavalry under Wheeler, might effectively harass and delay such a march, but all such expectations proved utterly vain. Though little was said in the press at the time, and our public speakers belittled the achievement, there is no question that the moral effect of this march, upon the country at large, both at the North and the South and also upon foreign nations, was greater than would have been the most decided victory. Already it cast the ominous shadow of Sherman's advance up the coast in the coming spring. In this connection, the now began demonstrations against Wilmington, which was the last port of the Confederacy holding out opportunities to blockade runners. These came in under the protection of Fort Fisher at the mouth of the river 20 miles below the city. The fort was a formidable one, mounting 44 guns, and had a garrison of 1,400 men under coal. Lamb. A military and naval expedition set out against it on December 13, 1864, under Gen. Butler and Adam. Porter in a fleet of 50 war vessels and 100 transports carrying 6,500 infantry. The fleet was the largest ever assembled under the federal flag, and it had been specially intended by Grant that the infantry force should be commanded by Gen. Weitzel. It was never contemplated that Butler should even accompany it. In the expressive language of modern slang he had not only butted in, and had taken the command from Weitzel, but had devised a new mode of attack upon Fort Fisher. This was to be a disguised blockade runner loaded with 215 tons of gunpowder to be run at night close to Fort Fisher and exploded. It was supposed that this would put the whole fort order combat. Gen. Dillafield chief engineer, submitted to the War Department a report on destructive effects of explosions of gunpowder in open air, indicating their very limited range. Butler was notoriously a military charlatan, who had been forced upon Grant as commander of the Army of the James by political considerations. During all the summer campaign, he knew and felt his importance, and had been able even successfully to bully Grant himself who was already under sharp criticism for his terrible losses in battle, and for the rumors in the army of his intemperance. Early in July, after some preliminary correspondence, indicating a doubt how Butler would relish any interference with himself, Halleck issued an order assigning the troops under him to the command of W.F. Smith, and sending Butler to Fortress Monroe. On receipt of this order, he said to his staff, who were near, gentlemen, this order will be revoked tomorrow. The next day, clad in full uniform, he called at Grant's headquarters, where he found Mr. Dana, a secretary of war. 
General James H. Wilson, in a memoir on the life and services of W. F. Smith, gives the following account of the interview. Dana describes Butler as entering the general's presence with a flushed face and a haughty air, holding out the order relieving him from command in the field, and asking, Gen. Grant, did you issue this order? To which Grant, in a hesitating manner, replied, No, not in that form. Dana, perceiving at this point that the subject under discussion was likely to be unpleasant, if not stormy, at once took his leave but the impression made upon his mind by what he saw while present was that Butler had in some measure cowed his commanding officer. What further took place neither he nor Mr. Dana has ever said. Butler's book, however, contains what purports to be a full account of the interview, but it is to be observed that it signally fails to recite any circumstance of an overbearing nature. Not only was the order promptly revoked by Special Orders No. 62, July 19, but Butler's command on the field was extended to include the newly arrived 19th Corps, and this disposition of command was still in force when Butler butted into the Fort Fisher expedition, taking his powder boat with him, regardless of Dillerfield's discussion of the value of powder boats. The boat was towed into position by Commander Ind of the Navy who reported placing it within 300 yards of the northeast salient of Fort Fisher, which bore west-southwest a half-west about midnight of December 23, 1864. It was fired by several lines of Gomez fuse running through the mass of powder and ignited by several devices arranged to act an hour and a half after the ship was deserted. The explosion occurred at 2 a.m., and was supposed by the garrison of the fort to be the accidental explosion of a federal gunboat. Not the slightest damage was done to the fort, whose garrison remained in ignorance of Butler's plans until published afterward. On the 24th and 25th, the fort was subjected to a terrific bombardment at the rate of 40 to 50 shells per minute for hours at a time, until the fleet had practically exhausted its ammunition. It had not silenced the fort nor materially damaged it, which, being reported by the land forces who had been put ashore, they re embarked without assaulting, on the night of the 26th, and the next day the expedition returned to Fortress Monroe. The casualties in the fort from the fire of the ships were 61, and a greater number were suffered in the fleet from the 662 shots fired by the fort. Another and a still larger expedition was soon gotten together and dispatched against Fort Fisher, but, though his own campaign was still in abeyance, the political situation was now so improved by the successes elsewhere that Grant was no longer afraid to exercise his authority, and on January 4, he wrote to Halleck demanding Butler's official head. With a celerity indicative of the pleasure with which both Halleck and Lincoln complied with the request, it was presented to him. On January 7, in General Orders No. 1, by direction of the President, Major Gen. Butler was relieved from command and ordered to repair to Lowell, Mass. On January 5, a new expedition, under the command of Porter and Gen. Terry, set sail carrying about 9,500 infantry and a heavy siege train. It arrived before Fort Fisher and opened fire on January 13, in even greater force than on the previous occasion. A land force of about 7,000 infantry was at hand for its defense. Mr. Davis sent Bragg to command it, who made no effort to prevent the enemy's landing. It might have been difficult to prevent him but to make no effort brought complaint and discouragement. The bombardment was, on this occasion, kept up without intermission day or night, and, instead of being general, was concentrated upon the land defenses. On the afternoon of the second day, the palisades and guns of those defenses being destroyed and a breach opened, two assaults were made about 3 p.m., one by Ames's division of the 23d Corps about 4,500 strong, and won by 2,000 sailors and marines from the fleet under Captain Brees. The latter assaulted the breach, but were repulsed with severe loss. The infantry, passing around and through the palisades, made a lodgment between the traverses, and after seven hours fighting possessed the fort. When Bragg took command of the land forces, Whiting, who had commanded the whole post before, took command of the fort. He was mortally, 
and Col. Lamb desperately, wounded in the defense. The loss of the infantry assaulting column was 110 killed, 536 wounded. During the winter, the Confederate lines about Petersburg had been constantly extended at both ends, it has been already explained how. The troops were extended with them until it was about 37 miles by the shortest routes from our extreme left on White Oak Swamp below Richmond on the north side, to our extreme right below Petersburg. Lee's force at this time was about 50,000 and Grant's about 124,000. Humphreys gives the following brief statement of the Confederate condition, the winter of 64-65 was one of unusual severity, making the picket duty in front of the entrenchments very severe. It was especially so to the Confederate troops with their threadbare, insufficient clothing and meager food. Meat they had but little of, and their subsistence department was actually importing it from abroad. Of coffee or tea or sugar, they had none except in their hospitals. It is stated that in a secret session of the Confederate Congress the condition of the Confederacy as to subsistence was declared to be colon that there was not meat enough in the Southern Confederacy for the armies it had in the field, comma, that there was not in va either meat or bread enough for the armies within her limits, comma, that the supply of bread for those armies to be obtained from other places depended absolutely upon keeping open the railroad connections of the South, that the meat must be obtained from abroad through a seaport, that the transportation was not now adequate, from whatever cause, to meet the necessary demands of the service. The condition of the deserters who constantly came into our lines during the winter appeared to prove that there was no exaggeration in this statement. In addition to the scarcity of provisions, there was also threatened a deficiency of percussion caps. The supply for the campaign of 1864 had been maintained only by cutting up the copper stills of the country, but they were now exhausted and there was no more copper in sight. Col. Taylor, in four years with Lee writes that during the last 30 days before Petersburg, the loss to the army by desertion averaged a hundred men a day. The condition of affairs throughout the South at that period was truly deplorable. Hundreds of letters addressed to soldiers were intercepted and sent to army headquarters, in which mothers, wives, and sisters told of their inability to respond to the appeals of hungry children for bread, or to provide proper care and remedies for the sick and in the name of all that was dear appealed to the men to come home and rescue them from the ills which they suffered and the starvation which threatened them. Surely never was devotion to one's country and to one's duty more sorely tested than was the case with the soldiers of Lee's army during the last year of the war. Early in February, there occurred the last of the many affairs on our right flank. Grant had found that we were still hauling supplies from the Weldon RR and had sent Gregg's cavalry to destroy it, and tear it up for forty miles south, and the 2D and 5th Corps were sent across Hatcher's Run to guard their ear. Lee, hearing of the Federals outside of their entrenchments, sent three divisions under Muon, Evans, and Pegram to attack them. There was sharp fighting for two days without material success on either side. The Federal losses were 1,474 and probably the Confederate were 1,000. Among them, unfortunately, was Gen. Begram, whose loss was universally deplored. Col. Taylor, under date of December. 4. Has noted the loss of another brilliant and popular young officer who had been a classmate of Pegram's at West Point in 1854 as follows, Gen. Gracie, who showed such tact in getting Gen. Lee to descend from a dangerous position, was killed near the lines a day or so ago. He was an excellent officer, had passed through many hard-fought battles, escaped numberless dangers, and was finally killed while quietly viewing the enemy from a point where no one dreamed of danger. Col. Taylor, in a letter, describes the incident referred to as follows. Gen. Lee was making an inspection along the line occupied by Gen. Gracie's troops, the fire of the enemy's sharpshooters was uncomfortably accurate along there and the orders were against needless exposure. To get a good view Gen. Lee mounted the parapet or stepped out in front of the works. Of course all who saw it realized his danger, 
but who was to direct his attention to it. Jen. Gracie at once stepped to his side. The minis whistled viciously. Jen. Lee, oblivious to his own danger, quickly realized Jen. Grades and immediately removed from the point of danger. That is all but it showed tact on the part of the latter. One I have already said that the fall of 1864 was the period of the war when the Confederate authorities might have made peace with greatest advantage to their people. Had they then offered a return to the Union, they might have secured liberal compensation for their slaves and generally more liberal terms financially and politically than at any other period of the contest. What these concessions might have been was suggested in the conference held at Fortress Monroe on January 30, between Messrs. Lincoln and Seward, and the commissioners sent by Mr. Davis, Messrs. Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell. After this conference adjourned, without coming to any agreement, there were rumors that Mr. Lincoln had offered to pay the South $400 million in bonds as compensation for the slaves, if the South would return to the Union. This was denied by some of Mr. Davis's cabinet, and the discussion brought out informal statements which Mr. Lincoln had made in the conversation which had taken place. One was, take a sheet of paper and let me write at the top Union and you may fill in the rest to suit yourselves. To this Mr. Stevens had to reply that the power to write that word was the single power which had been denied the commission. Next, Mr. Lincoln said that he had always felt that slavery having had the sanction of the government as a whole, it was unfair that the whole financial loss of its abolition should be thrown upon the South, that he had always felt ready to vote bonds to compensate her for this loss and that he had heard as much as $400 million suggested for this purpose. There was no formal proposition made, for the conference never reached that stage, but it is well known that until the day of his death, Mr. Lincoln cherished a desire to see the South compensated for the loss of her slaves, and that on February 5th, immediately after the failure of the Fortress Monroe Conference, he submitted to his cabinet a proposition to offer the South $400 million in 6% bonds in payment for peace with the abolition of slavery. His cabinet unanimously disapproved it, to his surprise and chagrin, whereon he dropped the matter, saying sadly, you are all opposed to me. One few cabinet secrets were better kept than this, Nillet says. But the diary of Sec. Wells refers to it as follows. The president had matured a scheme which he hoped would be useful in promoting peace. It was a proposition for paying the expense of the war for 200 days, or $400 million, to the rebel states to be for the extinguishment of slavery, or for such purpose as the states were disposed. This in a few words was the scheme. It did not meet with favor, but was dropped. Early in March. Sherman's army moved into NC where it was confronted by General Joseph E. Johnston, recalled by the Confederate Congress to command the army composed of the garrisons of Savannah and Charleston, and the remnants of the Army of Hood which had been brought over from Duplo, Miss. It was plain that Lee would soon be forced to abandon Richmond and Petersburg, and take advantage of his interior lines to unite with Johnston, and endeavor to crush Sherman before he could unite with Grant. Before undertaking this, which was felt to be an almost impossible task, however, he determined upon one last effort to break up Grant in his immediate front, in spite of all of his fortifications. He selected for his point of attack Fort Stedman, about a mile from the Appomattox River on Grant's right, and assigned Gordon to command the assault which was to be made March 25. A surprise was relied on to secure Fort Stedman. Three columns of 100 men each, with local guides, were to seize what Gordon took to be three redoubts commanding Stedman on each side, a division was to follow them, and, through the gap thus made, the lines were to be swept in both directions and a force of cavalry was to ride and destroy the pontoon bridges across the Appomattox, and to raid City Point. Taking advantage of an order allowing deserters to come in with their arms, several pickets were captured. The trench guard rushed, the phrase and abatis cut quickly by a strong pioneer party, and Fort Stedman was assaulted and occupied with two adjacent batteries. But the three redoubts were found to be only some old open lines at commanding points now unoccupied. 
Federal infantry presently came in force and killed or captured all of the three columns sent under a misapprehension very likely to occur where earthworks have to be guessed at from imperfect observation. Fields Division, which had been ordered over by rail from the north side, was delayed by the breaking down of the train. The column which had taken Fort Stedman was caught like rats in a trap. Humphreys writes, the crossfire of artillery and infantry on the space between the lines prevented the enemy from escaping and reinforcements from coming to them. Many were killed and wounded trying to get back to their own lines. 1949 prisoners, including 71 officers and nine stand of colors, fell into Gen. Park's hands. His loss was 494 killed and wounded, and 523 missing, a total of 1,017. While this fighting was going on, the other Federal Corps were ordered to feel the lines in their fronts, it being hoped they might find some weak spots from which men had been drawn for Gordon's attack. Much sharp fighting resulted at many points the total casualties for the day reaching 2,000 for the Federals and 4,000 for the Confederates. These attacks, however, everywhere failed entirely of their purpose except at a single point, on the lines of the 6th Corps, about 9 miles to our right from the point of Gordon's attack. Here, opposite a fort called Fort Fisher, our abatis had been weakened to get in firewood from the front, and here the enemy were able to make a lodgment within our entrenched picket line. When Grant's general assault was made at 4 a.m., April 2nd, this was the spot, and the only one, where at first it was successful. Humphreys states that it was, through openings made by the enemy for his convenience of access to the front, Gen. Wright told me that this was the weakest part of all the line he saw, and the only point where it could have been carried. His loss in killed and wounded was 1,100, all of which occurred in the space of 15 minutes. Apprehensive now that Lee might abandon Petersburg and Richmond at any moment, Grant determined to delay no longer, talking the initiative in moving around his right flank. His effective force, by his latest returns, was 101,000 infantry, 9,000 artillery, 14,700 cavalry, total, 124,700, with 369 guns. Lee's forces by his latest return, February 28, were 46,000 infantry, 5,000 artillery, and 6,000 cavalry, total 57,000, from which 3,000 should be deducted for desertions in March. In N.C., Sherman was about Goldsboro with about 100,000 against which Johnston in front of Greensboro had, perhaps, 25,000. There was really no need that Grant should have hurried himself, for, though by all the maxims of strategy, Lee should now unite with Johnston and both attack Sherman, his deficiencies in transportation were so great that no such movement was practicable. On March 27, Sheridan with two divisions of his excellent cavalry with their magazine carbines had rejoined the army and Grant began to transfer his forces to his extreme left. A single division only, Divins of the 24th Corps, was left north of the James. Two divisions of the 25th Corps under Weitzel held the Bermuda Hundreds lines. All the rest of the infantry, about 90,000 muskets and the whole of the cavalry, thoroughly organized and abundantly equipped with transportation for rapid motion on March 28 only awaited Grant's word to launch themselves upon Lee's communications. On this occasion, Grant narrowly avoided one mistake of previous campaigns made, not only by himself in May, 1864, but by Hooker in May, 1863, and by Lee in June, 1863. He kept his cavalry moving and acting with his infantry instead of sending it off on a raid having suspended on the 29th orders of the previous day to move against the railroads. It is noticeable, too, that Grant, on this occasion, concentrated practically his entire force in the attack upon our right, whereas, in the fall, he had never attacked upon one flank without some demonstration, at least, upon the other dot on the 30th, Wilcox's division on the north, and Hoth's on the south.
of Hatcher's run had sharp affairs with the approaching Federals, whom they went out to meet in some cases, but were finally driven back within their lines. The Federal losses for the day were 1780. There are no returns for hours. Meanwhile, Lee was bringing up Pickett's and Johnson's divisions of infantry, about 6,600 men, and two of Lee's divisions of cavalry, about 5,760 men, for an expedition against Sheridan. They attacked him on the 31st, and drove him back in much confusion nearly to Dinwiddie. Ch. Knight ended the fighting, with Pickett so far in advance that he would have been cut off by Warren's corps, during the night, had he waited until morning. But he fell back, and took position in the morning at Five Forks, four miles from our right at Burgess Mills. Here he made the fatal mistake of halting and proceeding to entrench as well as the time and the scarcity of entrenching tools would permit. He was four miles away from where other troops could help him or they could be helped by him. He should never have stopped until he had connected with our right flank. Longstreet writes, the position was not of Pickett's choosing but of his orders, and from his orders he assumed that he would be reinforced. As it was, in the morning, April 1st, Sheridan, reinforced now by the Fifth Corps, some 15,000 men, followed, and massing a force of cavalry on Pickett's right, with the 5th Corps he turned his left flank and routed him, capturing, as stated by Warren, 3,244 men, 11 colors, and 4 guns, with a loss of only 634 men. The Federal Gen, Winthrop, was killed, and on the Confederate side Col. Pegram, a brother of the Gen. Pegram killed February 6, and highly distinguished as an artist. This battle was fought between 4 and 6 in the afternoon, and Humphreys notices a peculiar phenomenon of acoustic shadows, such as has been spoken of before in telling of other battles. He writes, A singular circumstance connected with this battle is the fact that Gen. Pickett was, all of this time and until near the close of the action, on the north side of Hatcher's Run where he had heard no sound of the engagement, nor had he received any information concerning it. The distance was but little over a mile, and Fitzley and Pickett were in company. Neither were on the field until the action was decided. Although this action was a complete success, after it was over Warren was removed from the command of the Fifth Corps by Sheridan, under charges of which Warren was afterward fully acquitted by a court of inquiry. When Grant heard at 9 p.m. of Sheridan's success, he was assured that he must now have Lee's long lines stretched to near the breaking strain, and that the time had come when he could renew his assaults, suspended since the occasion of the mine. With his usual promptness, he ordered the 2D Corps, which was near him, south of Hatcher's Run, to feel our works in its front at once. The other corps, stretching back to Petersburg, were ordered to cannonade our lines during the night, and, at his favorite hour of 4 a.m., to assault all the soft spots, of which, for two or three days, each corps commander had been ordered to make a study. The midnight demonstration by the 2D Corps waked a heavy fire of musketry and artillery, but produced no other results. The assault of the 6th Corps at dawn, however, under right, was made at the point where our abattis had been weakened, and the enemy had made a lodgment, on March 25th. As before mentioned, here their assault was entirely successful, after incurring a loss of 1,100 men. They then turned to the left and swept the Confederate line to its extremity. At the crossing of the Jerusalem Plank Road, Park got possession of an advanced line, with 12 guns and 800 prisoners but he failed to carry our main line in the rear, and the fighting was kept up all day. At all other points, the morning assaults were repulsed. After capturing all the works to the south and west, the enemy now turned toward Petersburg, where two isolated works, Forts Gregg and Whitworth, about 300 yards apart, stood about 1,000 yards in front of our main line of entrenchments. The rear of Fort Gregg was closed with a palisade, and its stitch was generally impassable. On the right flank, however, a line to connect with Whitworth had been started, and here the unfinished ditch and parapet gave a narrow access to the parapet of Gregg. It was by this route that the enemy finally reached it. 
it was defended by two guns of the Washington artillery under Lieutenant McElroy, and Lieutenant Cole. Duncan, with the 12th and 16th miss, two 14 men in all Fort Whitworth was open at the gorge and was held by three guns of the Washington artillery in the 19th and 48th miss. Until the final charge was being made upon Fort Gregg, when, by Lee's order, the garrison was withdrawn. The defense of Fort Gregg was notable, as was also the attack. The Federal forces were evidently feeling the inspiration of success and the Confederates the desperation of defeat. Several attacks by Foster's division, of the 24th Corps, were repulsed. The last, aided by two brigades of Turner's division, while the 3D Brigade advanced upon Whitworth, swarmed over the parapet of Gregg and captured, inside the two guns with two colors. Of the garrison, 55 were killed, 129 were wounded, and only 30 were found uninjured of the 214. Gibbon's loss was 122 killed, 592 wounded, total, 714. Lee and Longstreet, from the main line of entrenchments, witnessed the gallant defense of Fort Gregg and its final fall. A. P. Hill, aroused by the terrific cannonade and musketry at daylight and riding to join his troops, had been killed by some stragglers of the 6th Corps, which, as has been told, had carried our lines and penetrated far inside of them. When Lee, on the night of April 1st, had heard of the disaster to picket at Five Forks, he had wired for Longstreet with Field's division. This left only Kershaw's division and the local troops to hold Richmond, but we Eitzel's force had already been so reduced that no aggressive idea was left him. Had he known of the withdrawal of Field's division, he might have been tempted to make an effort to take the city. On Longstreet's arrival in Petersburg, his troops were hurried to the entrenchments, whence they saw the gallant defense made by Fort Gregg which had been done under the assurance that Long Street is coming. Hold for two hours and all will be well. When these saw the forts captured, they expected nothing else but that the heavy blue columns and long lines would now move to crush them. But the lesson of Fort Gregg had not been thrown away. Grant recognized that Lee must retreat during the night, and that from his own position he would have the advantage in the start and he preferred to order things prepared for the march westward in the morning. Lee had already advised Mr. Davis of the necessity of abandoning the lines that night, and, having noted Grant's pause after the capture of Fort Gregg, now, about 3 p.m., he issued the formal orders for the evacuation in time to have the troops begin to move at dark. My headquarters had been on the Richmond side for some months and my duty included the command of Drury's and Chaffin's bluffs, and the defense of the river. It happened that on April 2nd, I had prepared several torpedoes to be placed in the river that night, and early in the morning I went down into the swamp and was detained until late in the afternoon, when the orders of evacuation reached me. Part of my command was to cross the river at Drury's bluff and part at Richmond. After giving necessary instructions, I rode into Richmond and took my post at the bridge to see my batteries go by. Many accounts have been given of the scenes in Richmond that night, and I will not refer to them. The freight depot of the Danville Road was close by the bridge, and I walked into it and saw large quantities of provisions and goods which had evidently run the blockade at Wilmington. I treated my horse to an English bridle and a felt saddle blanket, and I hung to a ring on my saddle a magnificent side of English bacon, which proved a great acquisition during the next few days. These provisions were intended for Lee's army, and had been sent to Amelia C. 2. From Danville, the train being ordered to come on to Richmond to take off the personnel and property of the government. Unfortunately, the officer in charge of it misunderstood his orders and came on without unloading at Amelia. Near my station in the street, a cellar door opened in the sidewalk and while I waited for my batteries a solitary Irish woman brought many bales of blankets from the freight depot in a wheelbarrow and tumbled them into the cellar. Many fires were burning in the city, and a canal boat in flames came floating under the bridge at which I stood. I could not see by what agency, but it was soon dragged away. 
the explosions of our little fleet of gunboats under Admiral Semmes at Drury's Bluff were plainly heard and the terrific explosion of the arsenal in Richmond. About sunrise, my last battalion passed and I followed, taking a farewell look at the city from the Manchester side. The whole river front appeared to be in flames. Its formal surrender was made to Weitzel at 8.15 a.m. We marched 24 miles that day and bivouacked at night in some tall pine woods near Tomahawk Church. I had barely gotten supper when I was ordered to join two engineers being sent to find a wagon route for our guns and trains to an overhead railroad bridge across the Appomattox River. We traveled all night in mud and darkness, waking up residents to ask directions. But we finally got the whole column safely across the railroad bridge and went into camp near sundown about three miles from Amelia C. H. The next morning we passed through the village, where we should have gotten rations, but they did not meet us. They had gone on to Richmond and been destroyed there, as has been told. Here a few of the best equipped battalions of artillery were selected to accompany the troops, while all the excess was turned over to Walker. Chief of the 3D Corps Artillery, to take on a direct road to Lynchburg. About 1 p.m., with Lee and Long Street at the head of the column, we took the road for Jetusville, where it was reported that Sheridan was across our path and Lee intended to attack him. We were not long in coming to where our skirmish line was already engaged, and a long conference took place between the generals and W. H. F. Lee in command of the cavalry. It appeared that the 2D and 6th Corps were in front of us, but might be passed in the night by a flank march. We countermarched a short distance, and then turning to the right, we marched all night, passing Amelia Springs, and arrived at daylight at Rice's turnout, six miles west of Burkesville. One here I was ordered to select a line of battle and take position to resist attack, and here we waited for the remainder of the army to come up and pass us but we waited in vain. While the 2D Corps had closely pressed the rear of the column all day, the cavalry and the 6th Corps had struck its flank under Ulat Sailors Creek. Besides Gershaw's division, this force comprised no veteran soldiers, but the employees of the departments under Custy Slee, the Marines and sailors of our little fleet under Admiral Tucker, and the heavy artillerists of Drury's and Chaffin's Bluffs, under Col. Crutchfield and Major Stiles. This force, though largely composed of men who had never before been under fire, surprised the enemy with an unexpected display of courage, such as had already been shown at Fort Stedman and Fort Gregg, and would still with flashes illuminate our last days. It formed line of battle on the edge of a pine wood, in full view of two lines of battle in open ground across a little stream. It had no artillery to make reply and it lay still while other Federal infantry was marched around them, and submitted to an accurate and deliberate cannonade for twenty minutes, followed quickly by a charge of the two lines. Not a gun was fired until the enemy approached within one hundred yards, showing handkerchiefs as an invitation to the men to surrender. Then two volleys broke both of their lines, and the excited Confederates charged in pursuit of the fleeing enemy, but were soon driven back by the fire of the guns. A second charge of the Federals soon followed, in which the two lines mingled in one promiscuous and prolonged melee with clubbed muskets and bayonets, as if bent upon exterminating each other individually. General Custy Slee in his official report thus describes the ending, finding that my command was entirely surrounded, to prevent useless sacrifice of life. The firing was stopped by some of my officers aided by some of the enemies, and the officers and men were taken as prisoners of war. One toward noon, the enemy began to appear in our front at Trice's turnout, and made demonstrations, but were easily held off by the artillery. Meanwhile, Lee had become very anxious over the non-arrival of Anderson's command, the remnants of Pickett's and Johnson's divisions, and at last rode to the rear to investigate. He did not return until near sundown and with him came fuller news of the battle at Sailors Creek in which Anderson was also involved. Our loss had been about 8,000 men, with six generals, Ewell, Gershaw, Custis Lee, Dubose, Hunton, and Corse, 
all captured. One notable affair had taken place on this date, between a small force under Gen. Reed, sent ahead by Ord to burn the high bridge on the Lynchburg Road, and Deering's and Ross's cavalry. The expedition consisted of two regiments of infantry and about 80 cavalry. They had gotten within a mile of the bridge, when our cavalry, in much larger force, attacked them. Humphreys writes, a most gallant fight ensued in which Gen. Reed, Col. Washburn, and three other cavalry officers were killed. After heavy loss the rest of the force surrendered. Gen. Deering, Col. Boston, and Major Thompson of Ross's command were among the killed. About sundown, the enemy at Trices showed a disposition to advance, and Lee soon gave orders to resume our retreat. In the morning we might have gone on toward Danville, but now we turned to the right and took the road to Lynchburg. I remember the night as one peculiarly uncomfortable. The road was crowded with disorganized men and deep in mud. We were moving all night and scarcely made six miles. About sunrise, we got to Farmville and crossed the river on a bridge to the north side of the Appomattox, and here we received a small supply of rations. Here we found Jen. Lee. While we were getting breakfast, he sent for me and, taking out his map, showed me that the enemy had taken a highway bridge across the Appomattox near the high bridge, were crossing on it, and would come in upon our road about three miles ahead. He directed me to send artillery there to cover our passage and, meanwhile, to take personal charge of the two bridges at Farmville, the railroad and the highway prepare them for burning, see that they were not fired too soon, so as to cut off our own men, nor so late that the enemy might save them. While he explained, my eyes ran over the map and I saw another road to Lynchburg than the one we were taking. This other kept the south side of the river and was the straighter of the two, our road joining it near Appomattox C. H. I pointed this out, and he asked if I could find someone whom he might question. I had seen at a house nearby an intelligent man whom I brought up and who confirmed the map. The Federals would have the shortest road to Appomattox Station, a common point a little beyond Appomattox CH saying there would be time enough to look after that, the general folded up his map and I went to look after the bridges. As the enemy were already in sight, I set fire to the railroad bridge at once, and, having well prepared the highway bridge, I left my aid. Lieutenant Mason, to fire it on a signal from me. It was also successfully burned. In the end of an era by John S. Wise, he has described an interview occurring between his father, Jen. Wise, and Jen. Lee at Farmville at this time, which I quote, we found Jen. Lee on the rear portico of the house I have mentioned. He had washed his face in a tin basin and stood drying his board with a coarse towel as we approached. Jen. Lee, exclaimed my father, my poor brave men are lying on yonder hill more dead than alive. For more than a week they have been fighting day and night, without food, and, by God, sir, they shall not move another step until somebody gives them something to eat. Come in, General, said Jen. Lee soothingly. They deserve something to eat and shall have it, and meanwhile you shall share my breakfast. He disarmed everything like defiance by his kindness. Jen. Lee inquired what he thought of the situation. Situation? said the bold old man. There is no situation. Nothing remains, Jen. Lee, but to put your poor men on your poor mules and send them home in time for the spring ploughing. This army is hopelessly whipped, and is fast becoming demoralized. These men have already endured more than I believed flesh and blood could stand, and I say to you, sir, emphatically, that to prolong the struggle is murder, and the blood of every man who is killed from this time forth is on your head, Jen. Lee. This last expression seemed to cause Jen. Lee great pain. With a gesture of remonstrance, and oven of impatience, he protested. Oh, General, do not talk so wildly. My burdens are heavy enough. What would the country think of me, if I did what you suggest? Country B.D.D., was the quick reply. 
there is no country. There has been no country, general, for a year or more. You are the country to those men. They have fought for you. They have shivered through a long winter for you. Without pay or clothes or care of any sort their devotion to you and faith in you have been the only things that have held this army together. If you demand the sacrifice, there are still left thousands of us who will die for you. You know the game is desperate beyond redemption, and that, if you so announce, no man, or government, or people will gainsay your decision. That is why I repeat that the blood of any man killed hereafter is on your head. Jen. Lee stood for some time at an open window looking out at the throng now surging by upon the roads and in the fields, and made no response. Well might Lee say, my burdens are heavy enough. Jen. Wise had in no way exaggerated them. Poag's battalion of artillery had gone ahead to the intersecting road Lee had mentioned, and Muon's division, now assigned to our corps, supported by Poag's guns, took a good position and began to fortify. They held the position all day, being charged in the afternoon, repulsing the enemy and charging in turn. They captured the colors of the 5th NH and regained one of our guns which had been overrun by numbers. The enemy, Miles's division, reported a loss for the day of 571. The march of our column was continued under the protection of Muon's division, with but one slight interruption. Crook's division of cavalry forded the river on our left and moved toward our train. Gregg's brigade, in the lead, was charged by Mumford and Rosser, and Gregg and a bunch of prisoners were captured on which the rest of the division was withdrawn. Our march was now kept up all night and the next day until sundown. I rode off from the road, after midnight, with my staff and found a fence corner where we could rest a while without having our horses stolen as we slept, for I had now had but one night's rest out of six. After sundown on the seventh, Muon, still holding the road against the 2D Corps under Humphreys, asked a flag of truce to enable him to remove the wounded, left in front of his line when he charged and captured the colors of the 5th NH when the reply came, granting the truce for an hour, it brought also a letter from Grant to Lee, as follows, April 7, 1865. General, the result of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel that it is so and regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood, by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the Confederate Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. U. S. Grant, Lieutenant Gen. Lee, at that moment, happened to be near Muon's lines, and within an hour the following reply was delivered to General Seth Williams, the bearer, April 7, 1865. General, I have received your note of this date. Though not entertaining the opinion you express on the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia, I reciprocate your desire to avoid useless effusion of blood, and therefore, before considering your proposition, ask the terms you will offer on condition of its surrender. Ah. E. Lee. Gen. The next day, the 8th, was the first quiet day of our retreat. The 2D Corps followed us up closely, but there was no collision. All the rest of the Federal Army had taken the more direct road which I had seen on Lee's map, and was marching to get ahead of us at a Pimadox CH during the day I rode for a while with Jen. Pendleton, our chief of artillery. Ho told me that some of the leading generals had conferred, and decided that it would be well to represent to Lee that, in their opinion, the cause was now hopeless in order that he might surrender and allow the odium of making the first proposition to be placed upon them. But it was thought that Longstreet was the man to make the proposition to Lee. Longstreet had not been consulted, and Pendleton had undertaken to broach the matter to him, and had done so. Longstreet had indignantly rejected the proposition, saying that his duty was to help hold up Lee's hands, not to beat them down that his corps could still whip twice its number and as long as that was the case he would never be the one to suggest a surrender. On this, Pendleton himself had made bold to make the suggestion to Lee. From his report of the conversation, he had met a decided snub, and was plainly embarrassed in telling of it. 
Li had answered very coldly, there are too many men here to talk of laying down their arms without fighting. Evidently Li preferred to himself take the whole responsibility of surrender, as he had always taken that of his battles, whatever their issue, entirely alone. Sometime in the afternoon he received Grant's reply to his inquiry as to the terms proposed. It was as follows, Farmville, April 8, 1865. General, your note of last evening in reply to mine of same date, asking the condition on which I will accept the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, is received. In reply I would say that peace being my great desire, there is but one condition I would insist upon, namely, that the men and officers surrendered shall be disqualified from taking up arms again against the government of the United States until properly exchanged. I will meet you, on will designate officers to meet any officers you may name for the same purpose at any point agreeable to you for the purpose of arranging definitely the terms upon which the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia will be received. U. S. Grant, Lieutenant Gen. Lee received this late in the afternoon of the 8th. It was answered from the roadside and delivered to Humphreys after sundown for transmission to Grant. Lee had but recently been appointed commander-in-chief of all the Confederate armies, and he now delays the surrender of his own army in order that the negotiation may include that of all the Confederate forces under his command. In accomplishing this he might reasonably hope to secure best possible terms, as it would bring instant peace everywhere. His letter was as follows, April 8, 1865. General, I received at a late hour your note of today. In mine of yesterday I did not intend to propose the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, but to ask the terms of your proposition. To be frank, I do not think the emergency has arisen to call for the surrender of this army, but, as the restoration of peace should be the object of all, I desire to know whether your proposals would lead to that end. I cannot therefore meet you with a view to surrender the Army of Northern Virginia, but as far as your proposal may affect the Confederate States forces under my command, and tend to the restoration of peace, I should be pleased to meet you at 10 a.m. tomorrow on the old stage road to Richmond between the picket lines of the two armies. Ah! E. Lee, Gen. This letter was received by Grant at Kurtzville, a roadside village on the road Lee had travelled, about midnight. It was not answered until in the morning, as Grant did not intend to accept Lee's invitation to meet him at 10 a.m. Grant had doubtless had an early interview in his mind when he sent his second letter, and was probably accompanying the 2D Corps, that he might be conveniently near. But he had been recently cautioned from Washington about making or discussing any political terms, and, as Lee's letter seemed to involve a chance of such discussions, he apparently decided to make the proposed meeting impossible by at once leaving that road and riding across to the road being travelled by Auden Sheridan. Before starting, however, he replied to Lee from Kurtzville, as follows, April 9, 1865. General, your note of yesterday is received. I have no authority to treat on the subject of peace. The meeting proposed for 10 a.m. today could lead to no good. I will state, however, General, that 1 a.m. equally anxious for peace with yourself, and the whole North entertains the same feeling. The terms upon which peace can be had are well understood. By the South laying down their arms they will hasten that most desirable event, save thousands of human lives and hundreds of millions of property not yet destroyed. Seriously hoping that all our difficulties may be settled without the loss of another life, I subscribe myself, etc. U.S. Grant, Lt. Gen. Meanwhile, during the afternoon, we had approached a Pomodox C. H., two miles beyond which was the junction of our road with the one on which Sheridan and Ord were now approaching, and already the advanced guards of the two forces were in collision. Lee arranged during the evening with Gordon and Fitz Lee who had the advance, that they should make a vigorous attack at dawn and endeavour to clear the road. This was done, and, in evidence of it, a battery of twelve pr. Napoleons was presently sent in to me, having been captured by a cavalry charge of Robert's brigade. Though this evidenced good spirit on the part of our men, our advance made no progress, 
and the increased fire told of large forces already in our front. Lee was up at an early hour and sent Col. Venable to Gordon to inquire how he progressed. Gordon's answer was, tell Jen. Lee I have fought my core to a frazzle, and I fear I can do nothing unless I am heavily supported by Longstreet's corps. When Lee received this message, he exclaimed, then there is nothing left me but to go and see Jen. Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. Venable writes, convulsed with passionate grief, many were the wild words which we spoke as we stood around him. Said one, oh, General. What will history say of the surrender of the army in the field? He replied, yes, I know they will say hard things of us. They will not understand how we were overwhelmed by numbers. But that is not the question, Colonel. The question is, is it right to surrender this army? If it is right, then I will take all the responsibility. Meanwhile, the march of the army had come to a halt in front, while, for a time, the rear closed slowly up. I had bivouacked near the road, and soon after sunrise I came upon Lee with his staff by the roadside, at the top of a hill. The general called me to him, and taking his seat upon a felled oak, peeled off its bark, and referring to the map we had looked at together on the seventh, he said colon one, well, we have come to the junction, and they seem to be here ahead of us. What have we got to do today? I had been somewhat prepared by my talk with Pendleton, had formulated a plan of my own, and was glad to have a chance to present it. My command having been north of the James had had no share in the fighting about Petersburg, and but little in the retreat. They had now begun to hear of a surrender, and would hint their sentiments in loud voices when I rode by. We don't want to surrender any ammunition. We've been saving ammunition all this war. Help we were not saving it for a surrender. I told the general of this and said that if he saw fit to try and cut our way out, my command would do as well as they had ever done. He answered, I have left only two divisions, Fields and Muons, sufficiently organized to be relied upon. All the rest have been broken and rooted and can do little good. Those divisions are now scarcely four thousand apiece, and that is far too little to meet the force now in front of us. This was just the opportunity wished, and I hastened to lay my plan before him. I said, then we have only choice of two courses. Either to surrender, or to take to the woods and bushes, with orders, either to rally on Johnston, or perhaps better, on the governors of the respective states. If we surrender this army, it is the end of the Confederacy. I think our best course would be to order each man to go to the governor of his own state with his arms. What would you hope to accomplish by that? said he. In the first place, said I, to stand the chances. If we surrender this army, every other army will have to follow suit. All will go like a row of bricks, and if the rumors of help from France have any foundation, the news of our surrender will put an end to them. But the one thing which may be possible in our present situation is to get some sort of terms. None of our armies are likely to be able to get them, and that is why we should try with the different states. Already it has been said that Vance can make terms for NC, and Joe Brown for Georgia let the governor of each state make some sort of a show of force and then surrender on terms which may save us from trials for treason and confiscations. As I talked, it all looked to me so reasonable that I hoped he was convinced, for he listened in silence. So I went on more confidently, but, General, apart from all that, if all fails and there is no hope, the men who have fought under you for four years have got the right this morning to ask one favor of you. We know that you do not care for military glory. But we are proud of the record of this army. We want to leave it untarnished to our children. It is a clear record so far and now is about to be closed. A little blood more or less now makes no difference, and we have the right to ask of you to spare us the mortification of having you ask Grant for terms and have him answer that he has no terms to offer. That it is U.S., unconditional surrender. That was his reply to Buckner at Fort Donelson, and to Pemberton at Vicksburg, and that is what is threatened us. General, spare us the mortification of asking terms and getting that reply. 
he heard it all so quietly, and it was all so true, it seemed to me, and so undeniable, that I felt sure that I had him convinced. His first words were, if I should take your advice, how many men do you suppose would get away? Two thirds of us, I answered. We would be like rabbits and partridges in the bushes, and they could not scatter to follow us. He said, I have not over fifteen thousand muskets left. Two thirds of them divided among the states, even if all could be collected, would be too small a force to accomplish anything. All could not be collected. Their homes have been overrun, and many would go to look after their families. Then, General, you and I as Christian men have no right to consider only how this would affect us. We must consider its effect on the country as a whole. Already it is demoralized by the four years of war. If I took your advice, the men would be without rations and under no control of officers. They would be compelled to rob and steal in order to live. They would become mere bands of marauders, and the enemy's cavalry would pursue them and over on many wide sections they may never have occasion to visit. We would bring on a state of affairs it would take the country years to recover from. And, as for myself, you young fellows might go to bushwhacking, but the only dignified course for me would be, to go to Jen. Grant and surrender myself and take the consequences of my acts. He paused for only a moment and then went on. But I can tell you one thing for your comfort. Grant will not demand an unconditional surrender. He will give us as good terms as this army has the right to demand, and I am going to meet him in the rear at 10 a.m. and surrender the army on the condition of not fighting again until exchanged. I had not a single word to say in reply. He had answered my suggestion from a plane so far above it that I was ashamed of having made it. With several friends, I had planned to make an escape on seeing a flag of truce, but that idea was at once abandoned by all of them on hearing my report. At this time the negotiations had been definitely broken off by Lee's second letter. The meeting which this proposed had been declined by Grant in a letter now on its way to Lee, but not yet received. He had told me Grant's terms as if he knew them but later he felt some uneasiness lest Grant might not feel bound by his offer after it had once been declined. Longstreet, in Manassas to Upper Maddox, mentions his apprehensions on this subject, but states that he, from personal acquaintance with Grant, felt able to assure Lee that there would be no humiliating demands, and the event justified that assurance. About 8.30 o'clock Lee, in a full suit of new uniform, with sword and sash and an embroidered belt, boots, and gold spurs, rode to the rear, hoping soon to meet Grant and to be able to make the surrender. Instead, he learned of Grant's change of route and was handed Grant's letter, dated that morning, and declining the interview. He at once wrote a reply as follows, and asked to have it sent to overtake Grant on his long ride. April 9, 1865. General. I received your note of this morning on the picket line whither I had come to meet you, and ascertain definitely what terms were embraced in your proposal of yesterday with reference to the surrender of this army. I now ask an interview in accordance with the offer contained in your letter of yesterday for that purpose. Ah! E. Lee, General. While this last message was being prepared, a messenger riding like the wind dashed around the curve, and seeing Lee, and having but one arm, with difficulty stopped his horse nearly one hundred yards beyond. All recognized the rider, Colonel John Haskell of Longstreet's artillery, and, as his horse was checked, Lee went to meet him, exclaiming, What is it? What is it? And then, without waiting for a reply, Oh, why did you do it? You have killed your beautiful horse. One Haskell explained that Fitz Lee had sent in a report that he had found road by which the army could escape, and that Longstreet had ordered him to overtake Lee, before he could send a note to Grant, and to kill his horse to do it. Longstreet, in his book, says that Haskell's arrival was too late, that the note had gone. But Humphreys's narrative shows that Col. Whittier, who took the note, witnessed Haskell's arrival before the note was finished. Lee, however, had not credited the report, 
and a later messenger soon came to say that the report was a mistake. When Field's division had been halted by the flag of truce, Humphreys's corps was within a half mile, and under his orders it soon appeared to be making preparation for a further advance. Field, meanwhile, went to entrenching. Grant had instructed Humphreys not to let the correspondence delay his movements. In Longstreet's front, Gordon had all the morning been engaged with Sheridan, and firing, both of musketry and artillery, was still in progress. Lee had at first neglected to give authority to ask for a truce, but later sent it to Gordon, who sent Major Sims of Longstreet's staff to request one. Sims met Custer, who had himself conducted to Gordon and demanded the immediate and unconditional surrender of the army, which Gordon refused. Custer said, Sheridan directs me to say to you, General, if there is any hesitation about your surrender, that he has you surrounded and can annihilate your command in an hour. Gordon replied, There is a flag between Lee and Grant for the purpose of surrender, and if Gen. Sheridan decides to continue the fighting in the face of the flag of truce, the responsibility for the bloodshed will be his and not mine. On this, Gordon says, Custer rode off with Major Hunter of Gordon's staff, asking to be guided to Longstreet's position. Finding Longstreet, he made the same demand for immediate and unconditional surrender. I have told of this scene elsewhere one more at length, but did not know until the recent publication of Gordon's book that it was Custer's second attempt that morning to secure surrender of the army to himself. Longstreet rebuffed him, however, very roughly, far more so than appears in Longstreet's account of the interview. Meanwhile, in our ear, more serious trouble threatened. The 2D Corps, closely followed by the 6th, began to advance. Lee, who was still awaiting between the lines Grant's reply to his letter, which had over 15 miles to go and did not reach Grant until 11.50 a.m., sent by his staff officers two earnest verbal requests to Humphreys not to press upon him, as negotiations were going on for a surrender. Humphreys, under his orders, felt unable to comply, although the second request was very urgent. He sent word to Lee, who was in full sight on the road, within 100 yards of the head of the 2D Corps that he must withdraw at once. Lee then withdrew, and the 2D Corps continued to advance, and deployed in front of Field's entrenchments, and the 6th Corps also deployed, on the right of the 2D, ready to assault. At the critical moment when this assault was about to begin, it was suspended by the opportune arrival on the ground of Meade. Meade had read Lee's letter to Grant of that morning, and he took the responsibility of sending Lee a letter granting a truce of one hour, in view of the negotiations for a surrender. This letter was delivered at Field's lines, and, Humphreys says, was received by Lee between 11 and 12 o'clock. This truce may have been prolonged, for it must have been as late as 1 p.m. before the message sent by Babcock from the front, to be presently told of, could have been started. Meanwhile, during the morning, and before the first flag of truce was sent, Longstreet had directed me to form the line of battle on which all of our available force could be rallied for a last stand. I got up all the organized infantry and artillery in the column, and took up a fairly good position behind the north fork of the Appomattox River. To our left the enemy was still extending his lines, and some of my battery commanders were anxious to expend on them some of the ammunition they had hauled so far, for the firing had not yet ceased. But I knew that Lee would not approve an unnecessary shot, and not one was fired from our line. One when the truce in our rear was for the time arranged, Lee returned to our front and stopped in an apple orchard a hundred yards or so in advance of our line where I had some fence rails piled under a tree to make him a seat. One here Long Street joined him, and they again discussed the chances of Grant's making some humiliating demands. Humphreys's refusal to recognize Lee's presence between the lines as constituting a truce, while awaiting the reply to Lee's proposal to surrender on Grant's terms and the reluctantly allowed single hour of truce as the alternative of instant battle, naturally made them, perhaps, suspicious. Few in either army yet knew of the liberality with which Grant was prepared to treat us. 
The general temper had been illustrated in the fight at Sailor's Creek by the Chaffin's Bluff Battalion, under Stiles, who tried to insist upon fighting to the last ditch. Even Lee and Longstreet, under the present circumstances, could not feel confidence in their hope that he might not demand unconditional surrender. So as they sat together under the apple tree awaiting the coming of Grant's messenger to summon Lee to the conference, silence gradually fell between them. The conversation dropped to broken sentences, and there were occasional long silences between them. The last thing said was by Longstreet to Lee, as Grant's messenger was seen approaching. It was, General, unless he offers us honorable terms, come back and let us fight it out. Grant's messenger was Col. Babcock of his staff, who had ridden ahead for eight miles with the reply to Lee's last note less formal than the previous correspondence had been, and using for the first time the customary terms of courtesy, it conveyed assurance that no unpleasant surprises were to be expected. It read colon by a section under command of Lieutenant Wright of Clutter's battery. The battery was one of McIntosh's battalion of the 3D Corps and was commanded by Lieutenant McIntosh, a brother of Col. McIntosh. April 9, 1865. Gen. R. E. Lee, commanding CSA, your note of this date is but this moment, 11.50 a.m., received. In consequence of my having passed from the Richmond and Lynchburg Road to the Farmville and Lynchburg Road I am at this writing about four miles west of Walker's Church and will push forward for the purpose of meeting you. Notice sent to me on this road where you wish the interview to take place will meet me. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, U. S. Grant, Lieutenant Gen. After reading this note Lee said that he would ride forward to meet Gen. Grant, but that he was apprehensive lest hostilities might begin in the rear on the termination of Meade's truce. Babcock accordingly wrote requesting Meade to maintain the truce until orders from Grant could be received. To save time this was taken at once through our lines by Col. For sight of Sheridan's staff, who was accompanied by Col. Taylor, Lee's adjutant. The meeting, by strange coincidence, took place in the house of Major Wilmer McLean, who had owned the farm on Bull Run on which had occurred the first collision between the two armies at Blackburn's Ford on July 18, 1861, and who also owned the farm and house used for similar purposes today, as told in the account of that battle. Lee was accompanied to the meeting only by Col. Marshall, his military secretary, and a single courier, who held their horses during the two or three hours consumed. A quiet dignity characterized Lee's bearing throughout the scene, and on the part of all federal officers present there an evident desire to show only the friendliest feelings. The formal proceedings were limited to an exchange of notes, Grant's note being as follows, Upper Maddox C. H. V. April 9, 1865. General, in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th instant, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia on the following terms, to wit, rolls of all officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer to be designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate. The officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged and each company or regimental command assign a like parole for the men of their commands. The arms, artillery, and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officers appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the side arms of the officers nor the private horses or baggage. This done each officer and man will be allowed to return to his home, not to be disturbed by United States authority so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. U. S. Grant, Lieutenant Gen. Gen. R. E. Lee. This was accepted by Lee in the following note, Headquarters Army of Northern VA, April 9, 1865. General. I received your note of this date containing the terms of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia as proposed by you. As they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter of the 8th, 
they are accepted, I will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry the stipulation into effect. R. E. Lee, Gen. Lt. Gen. U. S. Grant. Some conversation had accompanied the preparation of the letters in which Lee, had explained that our cavalry had been required to furnish their own horses, and it was very desirable that they might be allowed to retain, them, that the men might plant crops for the summer. Having been in public service they were legally captured property, but Grant cordially yielded the title, not making it part of his terms, but instructions were given all quartermasters to allow all claims of horses as private property without question. Gen. Lee expressed much pleasure at this concession, saying to Grant, this will have the best possible effect. It will be very gratifying and will do much toward the conciliation of our people. Grant's commissary was also ordered to immediately deliver to Lee 25,000 rations. The conference then terminated, and Lee rode back to his camp. As he was seen approaching the artillery commands were formed by the roadside with instructions to uncover in silence as he passed, but the line of battle which had been maintained all day, seeing the movement of the cannoneers, broke their ranks and overwhelmed all with a great crowd, wrought to a high pitch of emotional affection for its beloved leader of the cause now forever lost. With alternate cheers and tears they flocked around him so that his progress was obstructed and he presently stopped and made a few remarks to the men, after which he was allowed to pass on to his camp. He told the men that in making the surrender he had made the best terms possible for them, and advised all to go to their homes, plant crops, repair the ravages of the war, and show themselves as good citizens as they had been good soldiers. This was but the second address which he ever made. On his way to Richmond at the beginning of the war, as his train passed Gordonsville, he was called upon for a speech and responded briefly, advising his hearers not to lounge about stations, but to be putting their affairs in order for a long and bloody war, which was sure to strain all their resources to support it. The firing of salutes was soon begun in the federal camps and the playing of bands, but Grant requested that all such demonstrations be suppressed which was quickly done. Without any further mention of the subject it was assumed as a matter of course, by Grant, that our paroles would protect everyone who surrendered from political prosecutions, and he had it so arranged that each one was furnished with an official copy of Gen. Orders No. 43, issued from the headquarters of the 24th Corps, which had a printing press along. It read as follows by agreement between the officers appointed by Generals Lee and Grant to carry out the stipulations of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, the evidence that an officer or enlisted man is a paroled prisoner of war is the fact of his possessing a printed certificate, certifying to the fact, dated at Appomattox C. H., April 10, 1865, and signed by his commanding officer or the staff officer of the same. All guards, patrols, officers, and soldiers of the United States forces will respect such certificates, allow free passage to the holders thereof, and observe, in good faith, the provisions of the surrender that the holders shall remain unmolested in every respect. By command of Major Gen. Gibbon, Edward Mole, Lieutenant Cole, and A. A. G. Our paroles had printed across the ends paroled prisoners pass in some ornamental work between top and bottom lines, the paper being about three inches by eight. Mine read, Brig. Gen. E. P. Alexander, Chief of Artillery, 1st Corps A.N.V. of Georgia, a paroled prisoner of the Army of Northern Virginia, has permission to go to his home and there remain undisturbed with four private horses. W. N. Pendleton, Brig. Gen. and Chief of Artillery. After the assassination of Lincoln, there came a wave of bloodthirsty resentment over the administration, which found victims both among the innocent and the guilty. Powerful influences sought to involve Lee and others among his officers in the destruction they planned. They sought to read into the terms given by Grant a single word military that the immunity promised might read that paroled prisoners should not be disturbed by you. S. 
military authority so long as they obeyed the laws in force where they resided. Then they hoped that the hanging might begin. Gen. Lee was already indicted for treason by a grand jury summoned in Norfolk, early in June, 1865. Grant immediately notified President Johnson that no man protected by his parole could be interfered with, and this effectually stopped all such proceedings. The report of our ordnance officers on the morning of the 9th had shown only 7,892 organized infantry with 75 rounds of ammunition and 63 guns with an average of 93 rounds. The infantry were directed to march out and stack their arms and retire. The federal officers then took possession. I was directed to form all the guns and caissons in single column along the road, that the federal officers might then conduct it to their camps. The artillery horses had already been out of rations for some days. The federal officers had reported their own supplies of forage exhausted. With a heart full of sympathy for the poor brutes, I formed the column on Tuesday, April 11, and left them standing in the road which they filled for about a mile. The next morning I bade goodbye to Upper Maddox, and as I rode off from the scene I saw the mournful column of artillery still standing in the road unattended, but with many of its poor horses now down in the mud and unable to use. Grant had left Upper Maddox on the 10th, after a call of courtesy on Gen. Lee, in which he had suggested that Lee might serve the cause of peace by a visit to N.C., where he might see President Davis and Gen. Johnston. But Lee felt that the surrender had made him but a private citizen and without authority, and he naturally avoided even the appearance of wishing to interfere, and declined to go. At that time, Brazil was going to war with Paraguay, and, fearing that I might find difficulty in getting employment as a civilian and being already so far on my way, I determined, before returning to Georgia, to go to Washington, d. c and interview the Brazilian minister as to the chances of a position in the Brazilian army. So from a permadox I started on April 12th for Washington, sending my horses to Georgia, by friends, and joining a mixed party of Federals and Confederates riding to Burkesville, where we could take a train. The party had an escort of cavalry, and included Honorable E.B. Washburnville, well known as the special friend of Jen. Grant and Confederate Major Gen. Wilcox of Alabama in the course of the ride Wilcox and I had a conversation with Mr. Washburn, which impressed us both deeply at the time, and which, I am sure, I can even now repeat without material variation. In common with all of Grant's army, the officers and soldiers of our escort and company treated the paroled Confederates with a marked kindness which indicated a universal desire to replace our former hostility with special friendship. All federal privates would salute our uniforms, horsemen and teamsters would give us the roads, and in all conversations with officers or men special care would be evident to avoid painful topics. At one time, when the three mentioned were riding together, Mr. Washburn asked us, What, in your opinion, will now be the course of your other armies? Will they seek to prolong the war, or will the surrender of Lee be accepted as ending it? We both answered that we had no doubt of the latter course being followed by the remaining armies, nearly as fast as the news could reach them. And we then said to him, the question will not be what are we going to do, Mr. Washburn, but what is Mr. Lincoln going to do? Well, gentlemen, said he, let me tell you something. When the news came that Richmond had fallen, and that Grant's army was in a position to intercept Lee's retreat. I went up to the White House to congratulate Mr. Lincoln, and I had the opportunity to have a talk with him on this very topic. Of course, it would not be proper for me to violate Mr. Lincoln's confidence by disclosing any details of his plans for restoring the Union, but I am going to make you a prophecy. His plan will not only astonish the South, but it will astonish Europe and foreign nations as well. And I will make you a prediction. Within a year Mr. Lincoln will be as popular with you of the South as he is now with the North. As soon as we were alone together, we compared notes as to what Washburn could have meant. In view of our poverty it could only have meant that in some way the South would receive money. In view of the lack of any other plausible excuse for paying it to us, 
and of the arguments used by him at the Fortress Monroe Conference why the South should be compensated for the emancipation of the Negro, I have ever since felt convinced that Lincoln, in that interview with Washburn, recurred to his well-known wish to do that act of justice to the South, and that Washburn believed that he would now be able to accomplish it with the prestige which success in the war would bring and with the spread of the good feeling already inspired in the army by Grant's act of generosity. Unfortunately, and without fault of her own, the work of an assassin, only three days later, changed everything, converting into gall the very milk of human kindness in every breast, and blasting the South with a whirlwind of resentment, the effects of which will not disappear for generations. But one of its first effects was one for which I will ever remain grateful. It made it utterly impossible for me to go to Brazil. I called on the Brazilian minister in Washington on the 18th, while the president's body was lying in state in the White House, and the streets swarmed with angry crowds ready to mob anyone known to be a Confederate. His Excellency kindly advised me to give up all ideas of Brazil, and to take myself out of Washington City with the least possible delay. This I was fortunately able to do with one narrow escape from a detective, who saw something suspicious in my $500 Confederate boots and blue soldier's overcoat dyed black. But I was able to elude him, and take a train to New York whence I sailed to Port Royal, S.C. thence via Savannah and through the country ravaged by Sherman, with many delays and difficulties, I made my way to my boyhood's home at Washington, Georgia where my wife and family were. This place was now on the only route of travel possible between the eastern states of the Confederacy and the Gulf states. Through it passed, not only President Davis with his family, but the whole Confederate government, which here disbanded, and beyond this point became fugitives, and also the entire debris of all the eastern armies whose homes lay west of the Savannah River. I, therefore, anticipated that I would here meet Mr. Davis, and would be able to give him more news than had reached him by the land route he had travelled, on which there were but few and disjointed pieces of railroad in operation, and no through telegraph lines nor mail service. So not only was I full to overflowing with important information, but in my talk with Jen. Lee on the morning of the surrender I had gotten to appreciate the spirit of dignified submission in which he was meeting what had befallen him and was advising the same course to all. As I recalled what he had said about my proposition to disperse the army in the woods and bushes, that the only dignified course open to him would be to go and surrender himself to Jen. Grant and take the consequences of his actions, I felt a passionate longing to repeat that conversation to Mr. Davis, and to beg him to take advantage of the opportunity opened to him by the government's offer of a reward of $100,000 for his capture as concerned in the assassination of Lincoln. It seemed to me to offer the only dignified escape from his perilous and impossible position as a fugitive, that, with the example of Lee's approval of such a course before him, he would welcome the opportunity to go to the nearest federal officer and surrender himself and demand a trial on the charge of complicity in the assassination. But it was not to be. I am not sure whether or not the news of the rewards being offered for his apprehension ever reached Mr. Davis, before his capture on May 10 in southwestern Georgia. I had lost 24 hours in leaving Savannah by my horse shying at a dead mule by the roadside, and breaking my buggy and that loss brought me to Washington, Georgia, on May 5th. Mr. Davis had left Washington on May 4th with a small escort of friends, planning to make his way across the Mississippi and to carry on the war with forces to be raised there. It was the disappointment of my life, even though in later years and after the death of Mr. Davis, Mrs. Davis has assured me that nothing could have ever induced him to thus abandon the cause of the Confederacy. But he would have seen before him the parting of the ways, and down the road of dignified submission even to injustice, wrong, and robbery, as we still conceive it, he would have seen the figure of Lee preceding him and calling upon all to follow. Who knows but what he might have been moved to do so? The federal casualties in the closing operations from March 29th to April 9th are shown in the following table colon the Confederate casualties, of course, can never be accurately known. In killed and wounded they were probably about the same as the federal losses, 
but the captured or missing would be much greater. The following table gives the total numbers of officers and enlisted men paroled on April 9th colon Gen. Humphreys states that of the troops surrendered only about 8,000 had arms. The miscellaneous detachments included the remnants of the naval and heavy artillery battalions, provost guards, departmental employees, and some odds and ends of troops. I cannot bring my narrative to a close without a brief summary of the record made by the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia in the two years, nine months, and nine days during which it was under the command of General Robert E. Leo, from June 1, 1862, to April 9, 1865. In this brief period of a thousand days, with inferior numbers, poorly equipped and but badly supplied with food and clothing, it fought seven great campaigns, against six picked generals of the enemy, as follows colon 1 st against McClellan before Richmond. 2 d against Pope before Washington. 3 d against McClellan in Maryland. 4 th against Burnside before Fredericksburg. 5 th against Hooker on the Rappahannock. 6 th against Meade in Pennsylvania. 7 th against Grant before Richmond. This last campaign endured for 11 months, during which the guns were scarcely silent a single day. Lee's army at its greatest numbered less than 85,000 men. It put order combat more than 262,000 Federals within the period mentioned. The following figures are from the official archives, in the War Record Office in Washington, showing the Federal numbers killed, wounded, and missing in each campaign, with a deduction of 2,000 from the first for the casualties occurring before June 1, 1862. These figures include nothing for Longstreet's Corps at Chickamauga and Knoxville, it having been detached from Lee from September 1, 1863, to April 30, 1864. They would add many thousands to this list of casualties could they be included. Briefly it may be said that Lee, in a fight to a finish against heavy odds, prolonged the struggle for a thousand days, and put out of action, in the meantime, more than three of the enemy for every man in his own army at its maximum of strength. Scarcely in the history of Napoleon's twenty years in power can the record of such fighting as this be paralleled. The number of the enemy placed order combat, in the Grant campaign alone are said to double the losses inflicted upon his opponents by the Duke of Wellington in all his battles in India, Spain, and at Waterloo. No modern European war has approached this for carnage. One even in the recent conflict between Russia and Japan, where the armies were of immense size and the weapons of peculiar power, one is almost amazed after reading the popular accounts to find the killed and wounded among the Japanese in the siege of Port Arthur largely exceeded by those of Grant in his last campaign. Bravery in battle is the religion of Japan, and the whole nation is a religious unit. It is encouraging to realize that the loyalty to his flag and country of the Anglo-Saxon has shown itself capable of enduring equal tests of devotion. It would be strange indeed if in critically reviewing the details of Lee's rapidly conducted campaigns we found no instances of grave errors of judgment when brought to the test of being viewed in retrospect. We do find them, and have not hesitated to note and to criticize them as frankly and freely as he himself would have done had he lived to write his own memoirs. No more intimate idea can be gained of his personal character than can be had from the study of his attitude upon such occasions. Knowing how quickly and clearly he must have recognized mistakes after making them, and how keenly he must have felt them, one can appreciate the greatness of mind with which he always assumed the entire responsibility either frankly saying to his men, as at Gettysburg, it is all my fault, or, as at the crossing of the James, passing over whatever had happened in silence, without any attempt to impute blame elsewhere, or any apology, excuse, or even a spoken regret. This was equally the case when the fault was altogether that of others, as his official reports amply testify. The same mental poise which inspired the unparalleled audacity of his campaigns gave him the strength to bear, and to bear alone and unflinching, even through the closing scenes of the surrender, the burden of his great responsibility. Surely there never lived a man who could more truly say, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. 1 Virginia Campaign, p. 
267.1 Gen. Gracie was killed Doc. 3 by a shrapnel shot from Battery Morton which killed also two others with him. He had just received a furlough to visit his wife and child in Richmond but had missed his train. One told by Nile and Hay, X, 187.1 During this night's march a widespread and long continued panic was started by a large black stallion carrying a fence rail swinging to his bridle and running away along the roads on which the troops were marching. The first false alarm started the troops to firing on each other and this spread and was kept up a long time. Among the valuable officers killed in it by his own men was Major Smith, who commanded our Drury's Bluff Batteries. One Col. Crutchfield, who was Jackson's chief of artillery, and lost a leg at Chancellorsville, was killed in this action. A graphic and detailed account of it is given in Styles' Four Years Under Mass Robert. One I still cherish a rectangle of that Confederate photographic map linen mounted, labeled S. Side James River, and with Lee's autograph upon it. He had carried it in his breast pocket for months, and when he finally rode to meet Grant, Venable took it to burn. I cut off and preserved the outside fold with his label and signature. One Haskell's horse was well known in the army for its beauty and speed. It had been led all the way from Richmond on the retreat with a view to making an escape in case of a surrender, which intent had now just been abandoned, as already told. The horse recovered and was said a federal officer for a handsome sum in gold. One century, April, 1903 times one the last cannon shot was fired from Gordon's lines under orders to cease firing, conveyed by Major W. W. Parker of Hughes Battalion. It was fired one within two days this tree was out down for mementos and relies and the roots stuck up. This was begun by the Confederate soldiers and finished by the Federals. One Grant's casualties were subdivided as follows the losses of the Japanese in the Port Arthur campaign, in killed and wounded only, excluding losses from sickness, as given by their chief medical officer, were 65,000. Corroborative data from various sources confirm the figure. Losses of the Russians have not been published.